Members, the Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional owners of the lands we represent, and we pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special presence upon this parliament now assembled, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper all our consultations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Western Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day, day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Are there any petitions? Uh, papers for tabling. Giving notices of motion. Well, I might just do a very special acknowledgement of Rory in my gallery. Welcome this morning. I, and uh, we'll move to a brief ministerial statement. Uh, Madam Speaker. The Minister for Heritage. Madam Speaker, I rise today to address the House to announce the inclusion of a place in the State Register of Heritage Places to recognise the significance of the Princess Margaret Hospital for children. Hidden behind tall palm trees, people may not have noticed the small cream weatherboard building near the corner of Hay and Thomas Streets in Subiaco on the former Princess Margaret Hospital site. But this modest building is more than 110 years old and is a rare survivor of the earliest phase of development of Perth's first children's hospital. And today it has been included in the State Heritage Register. Constructed in 1909, this modest Federation bungalow style building was the original outpatient's facility for the hospital and included consulting rooms for doctors and nurses and an emergency operating theatre for minor surgeries. It was originally meant to be a temporary measure while the rest of the hospital was built, but it went on to serve as the headquarters for the hospital's women's auxiliary, as the first psychiatric clinic in the state, and then finally as a multi-faith centre, providing a place for people to go to for prayer and spiritual reflection. Constructed a few years after the outpatients building in 1913, overlooking the corner of Roberts Road and Thomas Street's Subiaco, Godfrey House was built as accommodation for the chief medical officer at the Children's Hospital. The final detailing and ornate style of the building is an indication of the status given to the role of the chief medical officer in the past. After community consultation last year, the Heritage Council of Western Australia recommended that the existing state register entry for Godfrey House be amended to also include the outpatient's building and that the entire place be renamed Princess Margaret Hospital for Children, former Subiaco. Princess Margaret Hospital was one of the world's leading paediatric facilities of its time, providing care and comfort to thousands of Western Australians and a career path for many nurses, doctors, researchers and specialist health professionals. The inclusion of these two buildings in the State Heritage Register provides an important historical connection to the early years of the hospital's operations and the health care offered to the children of Western Australia. Both buildings will be protected and interpreted in the government's redevelopment of the Subi East Precinct. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> the Minister for Creative Services. Madam Speaker, I rise to inform the House of the recent opening of the Bindi Bindi Mental Health Unit at Bandy Up Women's Prison. The McGowan Government has invested $2.4 million into the new dedicated unit as part of the WA Recovery Plan. The 29-bed unit will provide mental health assessment, treatment and rehabilitation for women prisoners from across the state. The prevalence of mental illness in our prisons presents a significant challenge and makes Corrective Services one of the biggest mental health providers in the state. 
The Bindi Bindi Mental Health Unit will accommodate and treat prisoners with a mental illness using clinical care alongside trauma-informed and recovery-focused approaches. It comprises 23 subacute beds for prisoners whose mental health needs cannot be safely managed in mainstream units, and six beds for women's who, women who are acutely unwell. The government provided an additional $4.7 million in funding for staff training and furnishings for the unit. The name Bindi Bindi, the Noongar word for butterfly, represents the vision of the unit to transform women to optimal health and help them lead successful and purposeful lives in the community when released. The opening of the Bindi Bindi, Bindi, Bindi unit follows the successful establishment of Wandu Rehabilitation Prison, the state's first dedicated alcohol and other drugs rehabilitation prison for women. Bindi Bindi will help improve the mental health of prisoners in a non-threatening environment, aiding their rehabilitation and making the prisons and the community safer places. On behalf of the McGowan government, I wish the staff and prisoners at Bindi Bindi the very best. The Minister for Mines and Petroleum. Madam Speaker, I rise today to inform the House that last week in Kalgoorlie, at the Diggers and Dealers Mining Forum, I announced that the McGowan government will increase the exploration incentive scheme by $2.5 million a year from $10 million to $12.5 million. The scheme offers up to a 50 per cent refund for innovative exploration drilling projects. This increase in EIS funding will further incentivise exploration investment in Western Australia, whereby in 2020 alone almost $2 billion was invested in the state's mineral fields, according to the ABS. Western Australia's mineral potential continues to be recognised, with the ABS noting that about two-thirds of the total capital invested in exploration in Australia during 2020 went into West Australian projects. As part of the WA recovery plan, the EIS received a one-off funding of $5 million in 2021, which temporarily increased the EIS budget from $10 million to $15 million. <coughs> For the past two EIS rounds, the Department of Mines, Industry Regulation and Safety has received a significantly higher number of applications. The Tropicana, Gruer and Bellevue Gold discoveries are examples of previous EIS successes, and while interest in gold exploration in Western Australia remains strong, exploration for battery minerals essential to a cleaner, greener uh, world has noticeably increased. A recent independent study covering the first 10 years of the EIS reiterated the robust economic benefits of the EIS, with every dollar invested resulting in a $31 return. Despite COVID-19, the mining industry, which employs 140,000 West Australian workers, has demonstrated its resilience in maintaining its role as the major contributor to Western Australia's economy. This additional funding to $12.5 million a year could help find the next big resource discovery, which in turn leads to new mines and new jobs for West Australians. The old adage is that the more you drill, the more you find, and the McGowan government will certainly support industry through in initiatives such as the EIS in their endeavours of discovering the next generation of mines that will sustain and create jobs in our state. The Minister for Child Protection. Madam Speaker, I have the great pleasure to update the House on a record-breaking milestone for the Working with Children Check scheme. The Working with Children Check is a compulsory screening strategy for people engaged in certain paid or unpaid work with children. It aims to increase the safety of children in our community by helping to prevent people who have a criminal history that indicates that they may harm a child from gain, gaining employment in child-related work. When the scheme went live, a total of 9,374 applications were lodged for the 2005-06 financial year. Each year, the uptake has grown. In 2020-21, the Department of Communities focused on broadening its community outreach to educate the general public and organisations on the importance of working with children check requirements and their compliance obligations. This included targeted education through workshops, key industry bodies and relevant government departments, as well as a social and digital media campaign. The department also undertook 
targeted proactive audit where self-assessment forms were sent to organisations to complete a questionnaire for evaluation. These proactive measures identified and responded to organisational non-compliance, further adding to the protection of children. The increased focus on outreach and education has resulted in a record-breaking year of working with children checks. For the 2020-21 financial year, the unit received 145,878 working with children check applications. I commend the Working with Children screening unit for their efforts in safeguarding children. Working with children checks are one way that a government and community, as a government and a community, we can keep children safe. Alone, they cannot keep children safe, but they are a vital part of our armoury. Madam Speaker. The Minister for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. I rise to inform the House about important prevention work underway to break the cycle of family and domestic violence. Violence against anyone is unacceptable. We need to promote equal and respectful relationships as the norm. Teaching young people about healthy and positive relationships is the best way to prevent violence before it starts. To do this, we introduced the Respectful Relationships Teaching Support Program in schools in 2019. This program provides professional learning, resources and support to schools to implement a whole-of-school approach to respectful relationships education. This approach recognises that school communities can play a part in teaching young people how to recognise and challenge violence against women, reinforcing the message that violence is never OK. The program is delivered by the Department of Communities in partnership with the Department of Education and Starrick Services. With the commencement of Term 3 last week, another 12 schools are participating in the program, mostly in the regions, bringing the total to 33 schools engaging in the program. The McGowan Government has committed another $1.4 million to expand this program into 12 schools in 2022. We are also commencing work to implement this program in sporting organisations in recognition of the role these organisations can play in fostering respectful relationships. This is part of a $7 million boost to prevention initiatives in the area of family and domestic violence. Efforts at this level will have a significant impact on reducing the rates of family and domestic violence because it gives us a chance to stop the violence before it starts. The best relationships, no matter where these happen and at which stage of life, are respectful ones. The Minister for the Environment. I'm pleased to update the House on the State Government's Humpback Whale Swim Tour trial in Ningaloo Marine Park. The population of humpback whales that migrate along Western Australia's coast every year is one of the largest in the world and a wonderful natural phenomenon. Humpback whales generally migrate past the Exmouth and Coral Bay coastline between July and October. There is a unique opportunity on the Ningaloo coast to experience a close interaction with these magnificent animals on a humpback whale swim tour. Humpback whale swim tours have been trialled in Ningaloo Marine Park since 2016 and operators licensed by the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. Almost 10,000 swimmers have had this experience since 2016. The operators involved are also licensed to conduct in-water interactions with whale sharks, with visitors also getting the chance to spot other marine life, including marine turtles turtles, dolphins, dugongs, rays and sharks. Over 25,000 visitors have taken the opportunity to swim with whale sharks on the Ningaloo coast this year. This successful tourism program has been a DBCA partnership with commercial tour operators. Operators are required to adhere to licence conditions that aim to minimise risk to swimmers while avoiding negative impacts on humpback whales. On the basis that the trial demonstrates no evidence of negative impacts on humpback whales nor significant risks to public safety, the State Government has planned to transition the tours to a licensed industry by 2024, with licences being allocated through a competitive process. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to see the success and continuation of this trial that showcases the unique opportunities available to visitors on the Ningaloo coast. Swimming with these incredible animals is a bucket list experience. In WA, the Ningaloo coast is the only play place where these tours are offered, where they can be undertaken with DBCA licensed operators under safe and environmentally appropriate conditions. Now is the perfect time to wander out yonder and support tourism businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, yeah. The 
Minister for Emergency Services. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take the opportunity to update the House on the exciting new website and app that was introduced by the McGowan government last year to help all West Australians plan for bushfires. My Bushfire Plan is a mobile responsive website and an Australian first companion app designed and built right here in Western Australia. It provides members of our community with one place to prepare, print, share and update their bushfire plan anytime from any device. This means it is easily accessible if a bushfire threatens and they need to act. Our sum over summer, my bushfire plan was supported by a hard-hitting new advertising campaign, How Fireproof Is Your Plan, that ran on television, radio, print, online, outdoor and in social media. Our state is more than 90% bushfire prone, yet only about one in 10 Western Australians have a bushfire plan. The new campaign urged people to rethink their personal risk and plan what they will do if a bushfire strikes. Uh, the campaign depicted real-life bushfire scenarios and the consequences people face when their bushfire plan isn't comprehensive enough. I'm pleased to be able to inform the House of the great success of the campaign, the website and the app. We achieved many of our objectives, including a 28 per cent increase in the number of people who wrote a bushfire plan after seeing the campaign. There was also a 20 per cent increase in the number of people who spoke to their family or housemates about their bushfire plans. We saw more than 17,300 downloads of the app, with 12,786 plans created. Interestingly, about 92 per cent of these plans were to leave early rather than stay and defend. My colleague, the member for Swan Hills, will be pleased to know that the suburb where the most plans were created through the app was Allenbrook, with 102, very closely followed by Valdivis, with 97. Mm. And the member for Warren Blackwood will be interested to know that the country town where the most plans were created was Margaret River, with 78. I can also report to the Premier that there have been seven plans created in Rockingham and nine in East Rockingham. We all know the importance of having a bushfire plan. The introduction of this new website and app has made it easier than ever before to create a plan. And I'd urge all members to encourage their community to visit mybushfireplan.wa.gov.au and make a plan ahead of the next bushfire season. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any grievances? The member for Collie Preston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My grievance is to the Minister for Energy. Minister, as you know, I'm the newly elected member for Collie Preston, re replacing, <laughs> replacing the Honourable Mick Murray, who fought very hard for the people of Collie Preston over his 20 years in Parliament. And as you also know, my husband works for Synergy at Muja Power Station. He got an adult traineeship with Western Power through a program supported by the then Gallup government. He'd previously been working a three-in-one roster at Telstra, installing satellite radio telephones in remote Aboriginal communities. But with a young daughter, we sought to find a job that meant he was home every night. We made the conscious decision not to work in the FIFO industry. And when the opportunity came for the traineeship in Collie, we moved to Collie in 2006. That move gave us the life we wanted in a town that has given us more than I will ever be able to return. This life was single-handedly threatened by the Liberal Party in February this year. The Liberal Party's energy policy was a surprise move in the thick of the 2021 election campaign. It even caught the Liberal candidate for Collie Preston by surprise. Waking up to the news that the Liberal Party had a plan to essentially close our town by 2025, I was devastated. Mick Murray was fuming, and that's putting it politely. <laughs> and in an experience I will never forget, we called a town meeting at the Collie Miners Institute with about an hour's notice. Hundreds of local workers, their families, local business owners and union members all came to show their disgust for the Liberal Party and their plan to shut down Collie almost overnight with no thought for the people. The human cost of those of us who live and work there. Collie has a proud history of powering the state, starting with underground coal mining in 1898 and moving to open cut mining in 1994 
The miners and power workers have made an immeasurable contribution to the development of the state of Western Australia. Sadly, the names of 64 men are commemorated on a wall in the Miners Memorial Park. These men gave their lives in the coal mines as the ultimate sacrifice to the people of Western Australia. Many of their deaths occurred hundreds of metres underground, employed to mine the coal that powered the state over the last 124 years. The most recent of these deaths, tragically, was in 2018. Modern day Collie has excellent schools, hospitals, sporting facilities and a thriving community. This sense of community is no more obvious than in my own street in Collie. It's a dichotomy of Collie and represents the dependence almost everyone who lives there has on the coal industry. I'm lucky enough to say I honestly live in the best street in Australia. We have a corporate bowls team. In summer we do Sunday sessions and we take turns to host them. Nibbles and a few drinks on Friday nights, invites to each other's kids' birthday parties. And Frank fires up the pizza oven so we can watch the eagles in his shed. Jason and I and our kids live at number 14. As I said, Jason's a coal-fired power station operator, a highly technical and skilled role. His job will be one of the first affected as we transition to a life beyond coal. His skills aren't easily transferred to other roles. I've had the pleasure of teaching many of the kids that live in my street. Next door is Candace and Frank and their young children. Candace was born and raised in Collie and is a teacher at the local school. Schools are funded based on the number of enrolments. If the numbers of enrolments drop, so too do the number of teachers required. As we transition, if families choose to leave Collie, jobs for people like Candace will also be under threat. Next to Candace and Frank is Trish and Stocker and their teenage kids. Trish is a nurse at the local medical clinic and Stocker works at Blue Waters Power Station. He's a boilermaker welder and their oldest child will graduate from high school at the end of this year. Further up the road is Neralee and Paul. Paul's an electrician who contracts work to Premier Coal, one of the two coal mines. As the coal industry changes, so too will his business. Across the street lives Chappie, an electrical instrumentation technical officer. He works at Synergy, Muja Power Station. He's a legend, he'll love me saying that, and heavily involved in volunteering in the community. He's been a fixture at Mustangs Hockey Club for years and is now incredibly involved in the emerging mountain biking scene. Tanil and Daniel, next to Chappie, have a young and growing family. They were both born and raised in Collie and are looking forward to raising their own family here. Daniel works at the power station, Collie Power Station, as an electrician, and Tanil works for the local credit union. The credit union employs many women in admin and banking roles, but the numbers of people working there is dependent on the amount of people who bank with them. If people choose to move away from Collie, their money goes with them, which impacts on the services and the local economy. It's important to note that approximately 1,200 people are directly employed in the coal and power industries. There's also a significant amount of indirect employment here too. In fact, it's incredibly important to note that any closure of mines or power stations in Collie will reverberate across the entire southwest, including people in my electorate, people who live in Eton, Australind, Donnybrook and surrounds. It also affects the electorates of Vass, Murray Wellington, Bunbury, Mandra and Dawesville. Many people who live in the, these areas work in Collie or are employed in businesses who service the coal and power industries. What's key to the future of the South West and especially the people of Collie Preston is a just transition, not an ill thought out Liberal Party energy policy. What we need is a sensible plan for Collie and I acknowledge here the work done so far by the McGowan Labor Government, the Honourable Mick Murray, local workers, industry and unions. So, Minister, can you please explain to me what the government is doing to secure Collie's future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Speaker, look, uh, thank you very much, Member, for this uh, grievance. And I want to acknowledge your deep connection to the Collie community and congratulate you on such a stunning victory where you had a massive swing towards Labor. Nobody thought that uh, uh, Collie and the community could love anybody more than Mick Murray, but you've proved them wrong. You've demonstrated that actually 
the community holds you even in high regard than Mick. And the next time Mick sees me, he's probably going to, uh, you know, treat me badly for having said that. <laughs> but the, the stats never lie. For over 130 years, the people of Collie have been powering our state uh, through its mines and power stations. And all the economic development over that 130 years is to be thanked for the people of Collie. And I, when I've been to Collie as, uh, in both my role as a shadow minister before the change of government and my role in a minister in the McGowan government, I've always made the point that the, that, you know, the, Labor, the people of Collie have been good to the Labor Party and the Labor Party is determined to be good for the people of Collie. So when the Premier and I personally, with Mick Murray, personally went and met with the power station workers when we had made the decision for the coal closure at Muja C. Firstly, we were brave enough to go and attend in person. And of course, I was, I was very familiar with so many of the guys there because I'd been down to Collie frequently, at, at both in opposition as a minister. And it's interesting, I do contrast that with our political opponents that made their announcement so very far away from the workforce that was being impacted. And we started, we, we established with the unions and the workforce, <coughs> excuse me, the Just Transition Plan. And as the guys always say, it can't be just a transition plan, it has to be a just transition plan. And um, we are very pleased at the level of engagement with the workforce in the, uh, the College Just Transition Plan, where each uh, worker has been provided with one-on-one uh, -on -one support to work out what they're going to do as the transition takes place. Synergy employees have been engaged to enough identify their preferred long-term tra transitional pathway. The future operating model uh, post-closures of Unit 5 and 6 has been co-created with the Synergy employees and their union representatives. Synergy employees that have chosen to vol voluntarily leave Synergy have been identified and had their redundancies confirmed, and services are being provided to Synergy workers choosing to stay beyond the unit closures regarding their long-term transitional pathways. And as I've emphasised personally to the workforce, we do need them to help us uh, in this transition. Uh, further, we've, uh, following close in engagement with the, uh, the unions and the members down there, uh, Synergy is now requiring uh, embedded contractors to uh, participate in the just transition planning uh, and to give equal opportunity to embedded contract contractors uh, to have that same support in their career transition. Uh, there's normally about 80 to 90 embedded contractors on site. Um, that's not including uh, during outages, but uh, in the normal run of business, and those permitted embedded contract contractors now have options of developing their own personal transition plans. Um, and that's a, a, it really is now seen nationally as a model and we're very pleased to engage with our businesses in other coal communities on the way forward. But that's not the only thing that we're doing. We're also making an uh, unprecedented investment in the coal community to diversify the economy. And so, for example, we've put $10 million into the adventure bike trails around Collie. Now, some people before we made that investment didn't fully understand the benefits, but I know from talking to you and to others in Collie how that has really changed the nature of the Collie uh, 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 tourism offering, and there's been a huge uh, in, uh, in, incoming of, of tourists for those facilities. $13.4 million for the Cooling Up Emergency Services Centre, uh, including the Incident Control Centre, Emergency Driver Training School and Regional Fleet Maintenance. There's one and a half million for the dollars for the Mural Trail uh, project, which uh, has seen Wellington Dam's huge 360 metres by 34 metre uh, wall being uh, the canvas for the mural. And of course, despite the rumours, it wasn't actually a, a, a giant nude of Mick Murray uh, that was uh, installed on the on the wall, which was one was. Uh, the thought, in, uh, original thought we might do there. A, sorry, yeah, the Premier's thought, that's right, yeah, a Michelangelo style uh, rendering of, of uh, Mick Murray. <coughs> There's also $4.5 million for tourism readiness projects in Collie, $2.5 million for the frontline fire and rescue equipment uh, to establish an emergency vehicle manufacturing facility in Collie, 
and $300,000, and I like this one in particular, um, to move Demers Regional Licensing Processing Centre to Collie. Now, I make two points about that. Firstly, we insourced work that had previously been outsourced, creating permanent public service jobs to replace uh, insecure working arrangements. We saved money because doing it as direct employees means it was done at a lower cost and because it was a new function we were able to put it in Collie and we created 10 full-time employees down there. I've been to the centre twice, once on the opening and uh, on my last visit as well and it's really good. I, um, I think it's uh, nine out of the ten workers actually live in Collie. Only one person comes from Busselton. Uh, and uh, overwhelming majority of people work there are women who would have had uh, you know, less opportunity for employment in the past. So we're also uh, going on to, uh, to work um, on a range of other opportunities down there in the private sector, including um, uh, medical grade collagen, uh, uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, waste recycling and of course uh, graphite hub as part of our battery industry strategy. But this contrasts with our political opponents who don't understand the electricity system. They made an announcement that would have devastated Western Australia and it would have devastated Collie. They had no detail, no plan and they even said that they wouldn't even have to worry about uh, paying for the coal, for the coal mines in Collie. Just no understanding anything to do with Collie and no wonder the community rejected them so strongly. The member for Wanneroo. Thank you Madam uh, Speaker. I rise to grieve to the Minister for Transport this morning about a very critical piece of infrastructure that is required in my electorate of Wanneroo and that of course relates to the much needed upgrades to Flynn Drive in Yirrabuck and I thank her for taking my grievance. Before I begin, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the Minister again for the full delivery of my key in, uh, transport infrastructure election commitments of 2017, and that of course relates to the two interchanges at Ocean Reef Road, Wanneroo Road and Joondalup Drive, Wanneroo Road. These completed projects have truly transformed the way residents in my electorate and other sections of the northern suburbs uh, more broadly travel. These projects have busted congestion and significantly improved safety for motorists in the suburbs that make up my electorate. I can't highlight enough, Minister, how on a daily basis I get feedback of how well these two interchanges are working and the significant time that is being saved day in, day out by the motorists. It's quite incredible. Um, importantly, though, it's two pieces of key infrastructure that will actually uh, future-proof those intersections for the long term. As we see more development in East Wanneroo, we won't have to get um, the shovels out again to modify that intersection. That intersection, that Joondalup Drive intersection, will serve us well for the next 30, and year, uh, 30 or more years beyond. But of course, my work and your work is never done, and I turn you now to my key election commitment that I adv advocated for prior to 2021. And that is for urgent and important upgrades to Flynn Drive. I'm very happy that the McGowan government committed $20 million to upgrade Flynn Drive. Flynn Drive is the access road for the Nearabup Industrial Park in my electorate um, that connects to the east uh, with the urban areas. And I know other members of parliament, including the member for Burns Beach, the member for Butler, and also the member for Joondalup are very keen to get this upgrade happening so that we can actually um, activate further this important industrial area and key employment hub. Um, Minister, you well know the importance of the Nearabup Industrial Park. You visited there on many occasions. This government values and importantly is investing in Nearabup Industrial Park as the key industrial hub and employment hub not only for the suburbs and residents in my electorate of Wanneroo, but like I mentioned, for residents living all over the northern suburbs. Um, in fact, when it's complete, the Nirabup industrial area is expected to be one of the biggest industrial estates in Perth and ultimately will generate up to 20,000 new jobs. We already see a presence by various state agencies. There's the brand new Main Roads Metropolitan Maintenance Depot 
in the Irrabup Industrial Estate. It's been strategically located there to service the northern suburbs and key roads, including the Mitchell Freeway and Tonkin Highway. And of course, we have the police department present there um, with the North Regional Operations Group stationed in Nirabup Industrial Park to service the northern suburbs. And I was very delighted that we are showing our commitment to further developing the industrial park with my $20 million election commitment for the Nirabup Automation and Robotics Precinct. Um, I've recently been briefed by Development WA and plans are progressing well for the construction of this key infrastructure at the Nirabup Industrial Park um, that will offer common use facilities to support research and training um, operations for a variety of industries right here, right there in Nirabup. It's an exciting project, uh, as is the general uptake in the Nirabup Industrial Park for businesses. Um, I've also spoken with Development WA and they're saying um, people are seeking, uh, a variety of businesses and industries are seeking to locate there. Uh, things are looking very good for Nirabak. Um, the park is growing and it's pivotal to this, of course, that we get Flynn Drive, uh, Flynn Drive upgraded as fast as possible. It is currently much used um, by particularly my residents in Bankshire Grove, um, Wanneroo, Ashby Tapping to access near above Industrial Park. And not only do residents um, uh, and uh, employers use it, but it's also a road that is very heavily used by heavy trucks and it urgently needs upgrades to be able to um, do a much better job. It's unsafe at the moment and if we're going to really um, realise the potential of this industrial park, we must make sure that those Flynn Drive upgrades that we made a commitment to are delivered as fast as possible. Um, Minister, I thank you again for the unprecedented transport investment in the northern suburbs, whether it's the rail to Yantship, Mitchell Freeway extension to Romeo Road, um, Marmion Road upgrades, the amount of transport infrastructure um, that is happening in the northern su suburbs is truly transformational. My residents, the business businesses, the various agencies that have set up home in Nirabup Industrial Park are keen to get works for Flynn Drive underway. As I've outlined to you, it is also critically important to us to continue to draw out new industries and businesses into Nirabup Industrial Park and that will come with the upgrades to the much needed Flynn Drive accessed into that park. Thank you, Minister. The Minister for Transport. Thank you, and I thank the member for Wanneroo for that grievance. And of course, her continued advocacy for her constituents through Wanneroo. Um, and I would like to highlight just some of the achievements that we've been able to deliver together. Um, in the first term, three significant commitments delivered. That was the Wanneroo Road duplication project, the two overpasses at Ocean Reef and Joondalup, which um, we worked very well together to ensure that as part of those projects, not only did we build the new interchanges, but we also um, fixed some of the long-standing issues surrounding um, those, those um, intersections. Some improvements to some local road access and um, new traffic lights and a new roundabout, as I recall, in the vicinity. So we've been able to not only deliver on our major commitments, but work with the local member and the council, and I acknowledge um, Tracy Roberts too, for her advocacy and her proactive position that she's taken on behalf of her community in relation to securing funding for these projects. So we worked very hard, um, and as I said, with the local member, dealing with some of the local issues, local um, access issues, to deliver a wider benefit to those projects. And that has continued. So as part, for example, of our extension of the freeway to Romeo Road, the local member um, advocated in particular about improvements along Wanneroo Road um, in the vicinity, in particular about how we can ensure there's a dual carriageway all the way through and improve some very uh, dangerous intersections on Wanneroo Road. Through her advocacy, we've been able to work with a contractor 
um, over the past year and have them as, in a sense, priced options, and then we're able to include them in the final project. So, again, a strong work by um, Member for Wanneroo and all the members in the area, but the Member for Wanneroo in highlighting some of the additional work that's required to deliver the maximum benefit of projects like the um, uh, freeway extension. So not only are we extending the freeway, and we continue to extend that freeway, but Wanneroo Road is also now, in a sense, transformed and will transform all the way up, um, in a sense, to uh, Flynn Drive, to the area we're talking about, or the proximity of. So working very, very hard, the member for Wanneroo, as, as I said, and that's been the most pleasing aspect, is not only to concentrate on the projects we're delivering, but all the other local be benefits we can also deliver. More generally, too, can I just also mention um, we've worked with the City of Wanneroo, and I'll, I'll acknowledge the team there, um, who, again, work really well with our agency, to be honest, in particular when it comes to the engineering and construction side, working together, identify opportunities and, in a sense, work together to implement the best outcomes possible. Marmion, um, Marmion Ave was another example where we worked very well together, a project, I think, managed by the City of Wanneroo, which we contributed the majority or nearly all the funding. Um, and as a result, again, working in particular with local communities on some of the sensitive issues of where the roundabouts should be placed and some of those local access issues, and again, quite a cooperative approach. So again, I thank everyone in the City of Wanneroo's engineering and delivery team, because they, they, they are quite good to deal with and um, actually do work really well with our agencies in getting the best outcome. So there is a lot of work that we're undertaking. Of course, um, I've talked about the freeway extension, but I also want to talk about uh, the the, um, the railway too, up to Yanship, which is just another project we're delivering. Um, and that, again, working with <coughs> the member uh, for Butler also about some of the local issues, but generally how we can deliver the maximum say, benefits. But of course, another big project, and this is the Flynn Drive project. And this is, again, the member for Wanneroo for the election highlighted. And if you do go up to that area, you just see the increasing traffic. And I think the Bell Tower Times always mentions all the, these new suburbs with new names that no one's ever heard of. But um, when, you, uh, when you're in there, those areas quite a lot, you can actually know exactly what's happening in those outer suburbs. And in particular, if it's the Ellenbrook Corridor, down in Baldivis, the Anship Corridor, the new suburbs that have been created, the activity that generates. And of course, the commitment to the Nirabup Industrial um, uh, it, the Nirabup Estate, in particular through Development WA, about creating jobs and local opportunities in that area. So, um, so the minute member for Wanneroo highlighted the increasing traffic along Flynn um, Drive, in particular, and as a result, we committed $20 million in the election to support the City of Wanneroo's um, aspirations to upgrade um, Flynn Drive um, through that area. So in November 2020, uh, the City of Wanneroo allocated $250,000 to undertake design works for the ultimate dual carriageway from Wanneroo Road to Old Yanship Road. This was, again, the City being proactive, uh, getting the planning done, should there be any funds. And it was a great, um, I suppose, commitment from us to commit $20 million to support the City of Wanneroo for this project. Now, of course, the city, the state government, and in particular, this side of politics has supported um, local governments, in particular in growth areas, where you've got rural roads really now becoming major east-west or north-south north, south sort of um, connectors. Um, member for Darling Range is here, and again, we made a commitment of $18 million to the Shire of Serpentine Jaradal for road improvements to local government roads, but acknowledging again, through Byford and Surrounds, um, local, gov local roads transform over time to be major distributor roads. So we've, um, state governments offered the $20 million. Um, we've written to the council saying it's 40, 40, 20, 40% 40 when there's uh, 
expenditure incurred, when the commitment's made, 40 per cent when it's incurred and 20 per cent on completion. So we've offered the money. We understand that the city has met and accepted uh, the fact that they'll be receiving the $20 million. And the upgrades will include improvements to the single carriageway and alignment between Traveston Vista to Tranquil Drive, upgrades to the dual carriageway from Tranquil to Pinjar, and upgrades to the rural grade section of Flynn Drive between Pinjar Road and Old Yanship Road. So, I again, didn't get enough time to talk about the Flynn Drive, but it's an excellent commitment, and thank you very much, Member for and Roo. <laughs> the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm grieving today to Minister uh, for uh, Minister Booty, representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, uh, and in rising to grieve, I acknowledge the presence uh, today of uh, members of the Magumba Outback Club and community, uh, in uh, the President Pauline Bantock and, uh, and Bob Harridge in the uh, Speaker's Gallery today. Magumba is a small community in the Shire of Victoria Plains, 120 kilometres north of Perth. Uh, about 45 kilometres north of Bindoon and 57, 47 kilometres south of Mora. And my grievance concerns Mugumba Reserve 8588, bounded by the Bindoon Mora Road to the west and the Mugumba Yarrawinda Road to the south within the Mugumba town site. Under the Land Administration Act 1997, the Mugumba Reserve has been designated a reserve for use as recreation racecourse and hall site. It is home to multiple established facilities, including the Mugumba Hall the Mugumba Oval Library Post Office, the Mugumba Refuse Site, the Public Barbecue Emergency Water Supply Sandpipe and 24-hour rest area, including public toilets. The reserve is Mugumba's only public open space. The 56 hectare Mugumba Reserve is the only land designated for recreation in the Mugumba area, and since the 1890s it's been continuously used for sporting and horse-related events the latter including horse racing, gymkhanas and rodeos. Newspaper articles dating back to 1901 and 1903 detail football and cricket matches at this oval, and a further newspaper article in 1919 references the annual Mugumba horse races. There is a long tradition associated with horse events. Mugumba Sports Committee hosts an annual gymkhana and sports meeting during the 1950s and 60s, which included horse and athletic events. The Mugumba Reserve should not be, or this particular Mugumba Reserve should not be confused with the Moore River Mission, otherwise referred to as the Moore River Native Settlement, which is located 10.5 kilometres to the west and referred to in the book Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence and the subsequent movie of the Rabbit Proof Fence. In recognition of the long history of sporting events in Mugumba, the Mugumba Outback Club Incorporated was formed in 2011 with the organisation of local social and sporting activities being one of the club's objectives. Their New Year's Rodeo is well uh, known and well supported. Held annually since 2013, the Mugumba New Year's Eve Rodeo attracts 2,500 people e every year, and the club has in the past hosted a monthly junior rodeo during the winter season. The 2013 rodeo went ahead with an, oval, with an arena on the oval, but it was clear that a dedicated arena adjacent to the Oval was needed, and after getting approval for a clearing permit and consulting with the local Ewood Group, in 2014 the Mugumba Outback Club upgraded the new arena surface with 50 truckloads of sand. Discussions with the local Ewood Group in 2014 saw the two groups reach an agreement regarding the alignment of a fence that would define the established recreational area, and both groups were involved with erecting the fence. With each rodeo, the Mugumba Outback Club had to hire and install an arena, a costly and time-consuming process that involves a team of 20 volunteers moving heavy panels to form the rodeo ring, chutes and pens. This arena is erected in what are established parts of the grounds, adjacent to the hall, oval, toilet and 24-hour rest facilities and other improvements that have been put in place for local ratepayers and the travelling public. The group's objective was to build a permanent arena, and they realised their fundraising goal to this end, and a permanent arena was purchased, though it has never been erected. The Gumber Reserve is now recognised as an Aboriginal site under the Aboriginal Heritage Act of 1972. With a desire to install a permanent arena rather than hire temporary panels, and thus complement the established community facilities at the site, the Gumber Outback Club submitted a clearing permit and Section 18.2 request on 17 June 2020 under the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972. 
with the knowledge that main roads were considering a road realignment that would re reduce the area uh, of the Mugumba Reserve, it was felt that the fence would need to be realigned to preserve the recreation area. In hindsight, Mugumba Outback Club would have preferred to focus on the arena installation and disregard the clearing permit. Personally, I'm not suggesting any clearing be allowed at this point on the reserve. The section 1618 request was considered by the then Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, the Honourable Ben White, and consent was declined on 21st of December 2020, with the following explanation in part. The traditional owners do not agree with any further impacts to the Aboriginal site, which is of importance, special and historic, historical significance. The Mugumba Outback Club remains willing to engage in respectful discussions with the re regional corporations to be established as part of the South West Native Title Agreement. However, while those regional Noongar corporations are yet to be established, the negotiation is not possible. Further clarification was sought from the Minister by the Mugumba Outback Club in the correspondence dated 26 of May 2021 from the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. The Honourable Stephen Dawson reads, I recognise the importance of the road area to the local community, as the previous Minister for Aboriginal Affairs did, and encourage you to continue working towards an outcome that allows the project to go ahead with the support of the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council and the Ewood traditional owners. The Minister also stated that the recognition of Mugumba Reserve under the Act does not impact on the ongoing use of the amenities currently existing within the reserve. I seek the Minister's concurrence that the Mugumba Outback Club can continue to use the temporary arena and host the Mugumba New Year's Rodeo this December, as has been the case since 2013. This represents a continuing use of the facilities at the Mugumba Reserve as a community sporting venue. Again, I stress there is no need at this point to clear native vegetation at the reserve. Minister, it is imperative that the Mugumba Outback Club are giving certainty now as to the use of the established arena uh, for uh, use uh, of the, uh, the established area for the arena uh, for the planned 2021 rodeo. I think you'll appreciate that logistically a rodeo like this takes a good deal of uh, preparation uh, and will take a, a degree of time. And I thank you for taking my grievance today. Madam Speaker. The Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for his grievance to, uh, to myself, representing the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. So I do have a prepared statement, but I will add some other comments and also acknowledge your guests in the gallery from the uh, Magumba Outback Club. Welcome to Parliament. I, I hope that we can find some resolution to this, whether uh, in the short term and also going forward. So, on behalf of the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, I, I do uh, make these comments and I do add a comment at the end as a Minister for Lands as well. So, uh, the Minister obviously is aware of the heritage significance of the uh, site to the U traditional owners as well as the social significance to the Mugumba community, including the Mugumba Outback Club. It is important to acknowledge up front that this land has a high cultural importance and significance to the U people. The importance to the local non-Aboriginal group should also be recognised, particularly in terms of the social amenity and specifically the various rodeos that have occurred on the site. And as you've also mentioned, the, uh, the New Year's Eve rodeo and the numbers that are attending this rodeo attest to its popularity. You did mention about we shouldn't confuse this with the Mugumba Mission or the uh, the old Moore River settlement, um, and, and that's uh, that's a good point to make. Um, in a previous life, as the uh, as a solicitor of the Aboriginal Legal Service, working on stolen generation matters, I all, I had a, a very strong um, interest in the history of that um, mission and settlement. You also mentioned about the uh, about the cultural heritage significance, the Aboriginal co uh, cultural heritage significance of the reserve. And I can advise, uh, as you have mentioned, that on the 11th of August 2020, the Aboriginal Cultural Material Committee determined that the Mugumba Reserve 8588 is an Aboriginal site under Section 5 of the Aborig Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972. And the Shire of Victoria Plains and the Mugumba Outback Club submitted a Section 18 notice to the Aboriginal Cultural Material Committee in June last year to restore permanent Rodeo Arena and clear the vegetation. And as you mentioned uh, uh, in your uh, grievance, on the 21st of December 2020, the former Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, the Honourable uh, Ben White, advised the, Shire, advised the Shire and the Outback Club that he had decided to decline the consent to the Section 18 notice, given the opposition of the Ute traditional owners. 
Now, the, minister, the current Minister of Aboriginal Affairs acknowledges the importance of the Rodeo to the local community and urged them to continue to engage with the Ute traditional owners. He wrote in similar terms to the traditional owners. And then in March 2021, the Registrar of Aboriginal Sites met with the Secretary of the Outback Club, Pauline Badock, about future possibilities of the Rodeo and use of other amenities. I, know, I also note that Ms Badock is also the Shire President. The Registrar took the opportunity to, divide, to advise Ms Badock that approval is only required for works that create new or greater impacts to the Aboriginal site and that existing infrastructure and use is not affected. The Registrar encouraged the Shire and Outback Club to re-engage with the U traditional owners about how they could together manage and minimise potential impacts for the proposed Rodeo Arena installation, as well as other unmanaged uses of the reserve. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs has requested that the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage uh, communicate with the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council in relation to both the use of the temporary arena for the upcoming New Year's Eve Rodeo, as well as longer term use. Representatives of the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council, uh, which represent the Ute people, and uh, they probably are in the best position to liaison with the traditional owners about bringing the parties together to discuss a way forward for the Rodeo to continue. Uh, I am advised that uh, SWALS, the, the, the Land Council, is meeting tomorrow, Friday, with the Outback Club. Uh, a meeting will then be arranged with, uh, between the Outback Club and the U traditional owners. The Registrar has recently had further conversation with Ms Badock about the Section 18 notice and how the footprint of the land covered by the notice can be reduced to minimise impact to the site. And I note that the member is not suggesting that the clearing of the allowed reserve. Uh, the Minister wants to reiterate that uh, he's well aware of the importance of the site to the new traditional owners and he urges the Magumba community to understand the values of the land to the traditional owners and keep working with them. He continues to encourage both parties to engage in a meaningful conversation with a view to achieving an outcome that both respects the cultural significance of the site and allow the local community to hold the 2021 Rodeo. And as a Minister for Lands, I'm happy to work with the Ude and Begumba, uh, Ude, uh, traditional owners in the Mugumba Outback Club to, to get an agreement. However, if this can't be achieved, I request that the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage to work with parties to try and find an alternative site so that we can see the Rodeo go ahead on the New Year's Eve this year. Thank you. Uh, Bill's notices of motion. Speaker. Minister for Finance. Madam Speaker, I move that a bill for an act to amend the Taxation Administration Act 2003 and the First Home Owner Grant Act 2000 be introduced and read a first time, and I present a copy of the bill and a explanatory memorandum. Question is, the bill be read a first time. Those in favour? Those to the contrary? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Taxation Administration Act 2003 and the First Home Owner Grant Act 2000. Madam Speaker, Minister. I move that the bill now be read a second time. The bill seeks to amend the Taxation Administration Act 2003 and the First Home Owner Grant Act 2000 to allow the Treasurer to declare tax or grant relief measures considered necessary to relieve the financial or economic impacts of a declared emergency. When the government announced the payroll tax relief measures for small businesses in response to the COVID-19 pandemic last year, the measures could not be administered until new legislation was passed. As a result of delivering that urgent legislation, it was identified that emergency tax relief powers, similar to those introduced in Victoria at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, would provide a flexible mechanism for the government to urgently respond to emergencies. The amendments to the Taxation Administration Act will allow the Treasurer, in consultation with the Minister for Finance, to declare tax relief measures considered necessary to provide relief from the financial or economic impacts of a declared emergency. A tax relief measure means a waiver of tax, a reduction in the tax rate, an exemption, an exemption from tax or a deferral of the due date for lodging payroll tax returns. After a tax declaration is made, the Commission of State Revenue can administer the measures as part of the state's tax laws without passing legislation. 
This means that the Commissioner's administration and enforcement powers will apply, <coughs> including information gathering powers to investigate claims for tax relief and statutory objections and review rights for taxpayers who disagree, disagree with how tax relief measures have been applied. The amendments include safeguards to ensure declarations can only be used in limited circumstances. Tax relief measures can only be declared in connection with a state of emergency or an emergency situation declared under the Emergency Management Act 2005 or a public health state of emergency declared under the Public Health Act 2016. The Treasurer's declaration must specify which emergency the relief measures relate to, describe each tax relief measure and the period for which they will apply, and specify the person to whom the measures apply. The declaration can contain relief measures for a period that occurred before the emergency was declared or before the tax relief declaration came into effect. However, relief me measures cannot be declared for an emergency more than 12 months after the emergency has ended. The measures also cannot be declared for a period longer than two years. This is on the basis that longer term relief measures should be supported by specific legislation. A tax relief declaration is subsidiary legislation and must be published in the Government Gazette and can be amended, amended by publishing a further instrument in the, in the Gazette. This may include where changes are required to a tax relief measure to facilitate its proper administration or to prevent it being misused or improperly applied. Corresponding amendments are made to the First Home Owner Grant Act to allow the Treasurer to declare an increase to the grant or cap, um, cap amount to alleviate the financial or economic impacts of a declared emergency. Unlike a tax relief measure, a grant relief measure can only, cannot apply to in a ret retrospective period that has ended before the emergency was declared. Passing this bill will quick, quickly will ensure the government can provide further COVID-19 relief as it considers necessary or tax or grant relief in response to any other emergencies in our state. The associated explanatory memorandum contains further details of the amendments. I commend the bill to the House. The question is that the oh, uh, member for Rye. Um, Madam Acton Speaker, I move debate be adjourned. The question is that the um, debate be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Let's say no. I believe the ayes have it. Orders of the day. Government business. Order of the day number one. Family court amendment bill 2021. Second reading. Adjourned debate. Member for Belmont, and Thank you're you, continuing Madam your uh, observations. <laughs> uh, I wish to continue my contribution to this very important legislation uh, that we that I began yesterday, uh, and it's in relation to the Family Court Bill of 2021. And uh, I'd just like to reiterate some of the, mo the um, comments that I made yesterday because I do feel that this is really crucial legislation because any measure that seeks to improve assistance for victims of family and domestic violence is absolutely of uh, paramount importance in our society because every single day our newspapers are littered terribly with examples of violence and abuse uh, that is um, directed towards mostly women. Um, and I'd just like to remind the Chamber of the example that I drew upon yesterday, which was uh, that that we saw in the news only about seven days ago, where there were a number of private uh, Catholic schools involved in an incident whereby uh, multiple boys from a private Catholic school sexually assaulted uh, girls from uh, a private Catholic school, uh, Catholic girls' school, at a combined school event. So these teenage girls were subject to uh, this sexual assault, which will no doubt leave a terrible and indelible imprint on their on their lives. In fact, and will vastly uh, impact. Uh, their view of themselves and have a, uh, a terrible consequence and will no doubt be uh, probably a major trauma for them to have to deal with. And so I actually think that this incident uh, really does speak to the need for us as, uh, as a community, but certainly for us as a government, 
to continue to drive the conversation uh, around consent. Because clearly, and sadly, in 2021, we have teenage boys who clearly do not understand that concept. So it's inc incredibly important, and I did note this yesterday and would like to note again the really important work of uh, Minister McGurk around uh, protective, um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, uh, respectful relationships, which is a program that we've introduced in primary, in some of our primary schools, state primary schools, to teach young children uh, about the importance of respectful relationships, so that we can actually and hopefully intervene so that we don't see these instances occur that we saw seven days ago uh, to these teenage girls. So I would like to say that the work that she's doing in this, this space is fantastic, but I really do hope uh, that our government will continue to support such programs because there is clearly such a dire need to not only include such programs at a primary school level, but also at a high school level. And I hope that the Catholic education system will uh, look at this example and say, enough's enough. We need to be serious about teaching our boys, in particular, about consent and respect when it comes to uh, how they deal with sexual relationships. Because I do think that that is clearly going to be an indication of future act, uh, actions and activities. So if it's not stopped at that age and addressed, then what's that going to lead to down the track? It's very, very troubling. But there's also, I'd just like to uh, reiterate, there's also no uh, indication that uh, violence towards women in a family and domestic violence sense is abating uh, in our community. In fact, again, there is daily evidence that uh, that this is continuing to be incredibly prevalent, whereby one woman a week is uh, killed at the hands of an intimate partner. And this was unfortunately brought to our attention in a tragic example uh, by way of uh, Rakia, and I, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name correctly here, Rakia Hadari, um, who was brutally murdered by her husband of only two months, Muhammad Ali Halimi. He slit her throat twice with a kitchen knife before leaving her to bleed out to death in the kitchen whilst he called her brother. And I quote from a t um, WA Today article of the 29th of July this year where he said to um, this poor woman's uh, brother, come get your sister's dead body, quote unquote. So this absolutely speaks to the need for us as a government to <clears throat> pardon me, use every single possible lever that is available to us as a state government to try to, uh, on one hand, with the, the example that I drew upon of the, uh, the example with the school, uh, the school boys, we need to make sure that we are gearing up our children to be able to recognise what is appropriate behaviour and certainly try to combat that absolutely abhorrent behaviour where there's sexual assault. So we need to address attitudinally uh, how our children, in a, still in a high school situation, uh, view consent so that we can try to uh, address these behaviours before they actually uh, snowball into more terrible behaviours as, as grown adults. But it also points to the fact that there's so much work to be done at the other extreme of this, which I've just talked about in terms of you know, where we're seeing women die still at the hands of, of their partners. We need to make sure that there is every safety mechanism in place to protect these women. And that is why, although I was disappointed that we weren't able to uh, see the transition of this bill through to the um, Legislative Council in our last parliament. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk on this bill today and to see that we are dealing with it uh, at, uh, presently. This bill, of course, as I said yesterday, uh, builds on the Commonwealth legislation, which was passed back in December of 2018. And in essence, the, this, the legislation uh, that I refer to bans the use of cross the direct cross-examination of victims uh, by their abuser in a family and domestic violence situation. Uh, 
the practice of direct cross-examination of victims by the perpetrator is so clearly unacceptable. It would no doubt be an incredibly com confrontational experience for them. And given that it is one in six women that are the victim of physical or sexual violence from an intimate partner, I think we have to recognise that this is entirely a gendered issue. And I do understand and appreciate that um, that men can sometimes be victims of uh, domestic violence, but the overwhelming majority of cases, it is women who are the victims here. As victims, women do come to the courts um, seeking protection and seeking assistance. But the fact that they can then uh, face cross-examination and direct questioning by their abuser is really, uh, I think, opening, it up, opening them up to the prospect of being re-traumatised by their experience all over again, and it would be incredibly upsetting for them. But in addition to this distress and re-traumatising, there's actually uh, evidence that victims, when they are being cross-examined by their abuser, can be more inclined to unnecessarily expedite the whole process and the proceedings just to simply limit their exposure to their abuser. Uh, Acting Speaker, may I ask extension for an extension? Judge. Thank you. Um, so, in their haste, however, this can actually uh, lead to them settling matters around the property carving up and also parenting arrangements that can actually be detrimental to their welfare and wellbeing, but also that of their children. And it can also lead to, obviously, preferential treatment as the uh, converse of that to the perpetrator. So by allowing the perpetrator to cross-examine the victim, it actually has the real potential to affect the victim's testimony and the result of the overall trial. This has been witnessed by experts, this, uh, uh, this haste uh, to and sort of premature, uh, I suppose, desire for the victim to want to settle matters, which leads to the, uh, the unfavourable outcome for the victim. This has actually been witnessed by many experts in the field for a really long time, and it's actually been one of the causal factors which has brought uh, forward the need for this bill that's been brought to the attorney's attention and also through the, um, the Commonwealth legislation as well. Because we also have to remember that what we're talking about is in a family court situation. And so, of course, those that are impacted are not only the victims being uh, the female in most cases, but also children. So children obviously are incredibly vulnerable, but particularly in a situation where there's violence involved, their safety is ultimately going to potentially be at risk. So the removal of this prospect of the cross-examination, um, I think, is really important because it, what it can ultimately mean is that um, it means that women or the victims have the capacity to respond to um, cross-examination questions, which is an important part, of course, of any court proceedings, they're able to do that in a fashion that isn't um, uh, done in haste. So obviously that uh, is going to lead hopefully to better outcomes, more fair and just outcomes, and hopefully it means that where there is cases of family and domestic violence, of course, that less children are exposed to risk, and uh, that's obviously going to be a better outcome, not only for the, for the woman but also for the children. Ensuring a fair outcome is reached in any court is clearly something that we would strive to do no matter what. The cross-examination process, as I've mentioned, is really an integral part of having evidence tested uh, in a proceeding and allowing the court to make evidence-based findings. That's, of course, critically important. But putting an end um, to victims being cross-examined by perpetrators will actually improve this process and for their ability to give clear and cogent responses um, so that uh, the, the evidence can be assessed in, such, um, such a, in, in a better way. Furthermore, the cross-examination of perpetrators by legal practitioners will ensure evidence is appropriately tested and obviously then going to be more reliable. And this in turn will enable judicial officers to make more informed decisions and judgments. And I would like to just take the opportunity, if I could, again, to um, read out from um, 
an article uh, in 2015 uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and it was by a woman called Eleanor. Her name was actually altered for the purposes of the reporting. Uh, Eleanor experience, uh, talks about her experience in uh, the family court system, and it really speaks to the necessity of the, the changes that we're looking to make here today. So I'd just like to quote the article itself. So I begin quote. A week after Eleanor's former partner was ordered not to come within 200 metres of her by a magistrate's court, she faced him in a family court dispute over the custody of their children. It was then she learned that he had dismissed his lawyer, which meant he could question her directly about her parenting of their ch children in the witness stand. And then this is a quote directly from Eleanor in this article. That day I wanted to end my life. I just wanted the trauma to end. I couldn't believe they'd allow him to do it. It was like they'd given him permission to have power over me again. Eleanor, who fled their home with her children, said he had raped her twice and beaten her in front of their daughter. She began to hyperventilate. He could have asked me the colour of the sky. There was a point where I could not understand the words coming out of his mouth, she said. Her partner had initially argued for sole custody and was ultimately awarded weekly visits with their children. After the trial ended, he moved six hours away from them and now rarely sees them in person. She believes the exercise was another form of abuse. Years later, she testified against him in a criminal case from another room. This time, she said she was able to think clearly about her responses to his lawyer's questions because she was not forced to look at his face or listen to his voice. I actually, sorry, that's the end of the quote of the article. Um, I actually tried to imagine what it would have been like for Eleanor to go through a cross-examination of her former partner. And I obviously can't imagine what that trauma would be like because I haven't experienced that myself. But without a doubt, I can only assume that it would have been nothing short of horrific. So it's really, I think it's quite clear, um, if it wasn't already before reading, hearing from Eleanor's personal experience, it's very clear that this is going to be a really important mechanism to protect victims in a family and domestic violence court hearing proceedings. Um, but I would like to actually note um, victims such as Eleanor uh, have incredible strength to have even been able to go through that in the first instance. That would have taken uh, a lot of strength and um, again like I would like to acknowledge the, the work of the Attorney General in, in bringing forward this legislation. And I actually feel that it's um, in part to do with um, Eleanor's advocacy and other victims who have come forward to express how difficult those experiences have been, that it led and contributed to the federal government's decision to um, enact this legislation back in 2018. I know I personally was really inspired reading Eleanor's experience. At the time, um, Eleanor said, and I'm, I'm just quoting again from that uh, article in the Sydney Morning Herald, and I quote her directly, this is going to give hope to parents that they're going to have a level playing field, no further victim not further victimised by being in a situation where the perpetrator has full and complete power over them. In, in October 2016, the Council of Australian Government's National Summit on Reducing Violence Against Women and Children recommended that a ban should be put in place on the personal cross-examination of victims by perpetrators of family violence in a family law proceeding. And as I mentioned in 2018, uh, that was uh, enacted at a, by the federal parliament um, to make sure that that actually didn't happen um, uh, in federal courts. Now, um, given the time uh, restrictions, I just um, I think I will just indicate. Um, I think many of the speakers before me have gone through a number of the other provisions of the Act, but I think uh, it's fair to say that by Amending the legislation, if we only look at 
the, the banning of uh, the cross-examination of the perpetrator against the victim, that in and of itself is very powerful and I think will be very effective in achieving uh, greater protection of victims but also ensuring that there are vastly improved outcomes for those victims uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of evidence to speak to the fact that um, they are moving through these trial proceedings in haste simply to um, end uh, the distress of having to be cross-examined by the perpetrator um, being their abuser. So I think um, that's really the point I wanted to make, is that this legislation is very important, um, and if we just speak on that alone, I think that, that um, it's clear that what we're doing here is of great importance and I think will be very beneficial. And I must say that I'm um, always incredibly proud of being uh, part of the McGowan Labor government because it's very clear through the work of the Attorney General and um, Minister McGurk, the Minister for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence, that we are taking uh, real steps to protect women and make, uh, wherever possible, wherever the levers are available to us, making it um, easier for women who are victims of family and domestic violence to get the protection that they need. So um, I guess I just would like to um, end by congratulating the attorney and thanking him for bringing this um, very important bill to the House, and I wish to commend it to the House. Thank you. Members, the bill is... Uh um, questions the bill be read for a second time. Member for Riverton. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. I rise to commend the Family Court Amendment Bill to the House. Most of the Family Court disputes are due to domestic violence. On my recent conversation with the senior sergeant who covers my electorate, the Cannington Police Station, I was looking at the crime rates in my electorate and I was told, looking at the five-year average, the crime rate has actually come down by 25%. But when you take a deep dive into the numbers and look carefully, the domestic violence numbers have increased in the current year compared to the other crimes. What we need to take into consideration is there is a huge underreporting of domestic violence. I recently had a conversation with the Minister for Mental Health in support of an organization called Multicultural Futures. These people, they've been in the industry for 20 years, and they go for breakfast, particularly in the Cal community, and talk about domestic violence and offer them help by means of reporting. It's a very horrible situation to see someone who's been a victim in domestic violence, Madam Acting Speaker. I have seen patients in situations where they don't even have their shoes on because they haven't had the time to do that. They have escaped from a grave situation to save their lives in the fear of being killed. They haven't got the next pair of clothes to change. They haven't got a single dollar in their hands when they come out. I take this opportunity to thank the Zonta House situated in my electorate doing a great job in supporting such victims and rehabilitating them, getting back into their lives. This amendment is mainly about cross-examination and preventing the perpetrator from cross-examining the victim. In a broad understanding, how does domestic violence happen? It is not a one-off incident. It is a repeated cycle which happens. What happens in that cycle? There are four elements in the cycle. First, there is tension. Then there is the incident. Then there is the reconciliation and calm. The cycle keeps repeating. What happens in tension? There is fear. There is frustration. There is anger. It keeps building, the tension keeps building, and then the incident happens. The incident can be a verbal abuse, emotional abuse, or physical abuse, which can be quite dangerous. Now, after that incident, there is a reconciliation process. What the perpetrator tries to do is put the blame on the victim. Find excuses for that incident to have happened. 
And this cycle moves on to the calm period, what we call the honeymoon period, where the victim believes everything is settled. But it's a matter of time where the cycle starts again. With repeated cycles, eventually the victim realizes you cannot put up with this anymore. That is when various support organizations intervene and help these victims to come out. Now, Madam Acting Speaker, this victim who has undergone the cycle various times and had a severe emotional abuse, how do you think this victim is going to feel to be cross-examined by the perpetrator himself or herself? So this amendment clearly is towards changing that particular aspect of the perpetrator not being allowed to cross-examine the victim. What is the purpose of the cross-examination? The member for Coburn very clearly explained for non-legal people in this house like me what cross-examination means and what is the purpose of cross-examination. It is about re-emphasizing or strengthening the statement of the victim or the statement or the evidence given. And that cross-examination is so critical for the judgment to be coming out. That cannot be jeopardized by the perpetrator like the member for Doswell in her contribution mentioned a narcissistic behavioral person standing there and interrogating the victim to jeopardize the cross-examination effect. Now, imagine the situation, Madam Acting Speaker. The victim is there trying to give evidence. The perpetrator coming in and changing the whole scenario of providing evidence to defending to new allegations that the perpetrator puts on the victim. This particular amendment prevents such a situation occurring. Member, just before you go on, can I acknowledge the um, students from Alan Jarrett Primary School and my electorate? Enjoy your visit. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. This amendment also provides the rights of the perpetrator because he may not be an expert, he or she may not be an expert in cross-examining, may not have the professional knowledge and the calm mind to really do the job. So they might also benefit by an expert actually doing the job for them. A person involved in domestic violence has got a three times higher chance of getting a minority share when it comes to division of property. A person involved in domestic violence has got a three times higher chance of getting a minority share after being abused, after going through the trauma, getting a minority share. The chances are three times higher because they generally try to run away from the situation when it comes to evidence and cross-examination. They've had enough. They don't want to go through anything anymore. They do not have the frame of mind to think about money. They fear for their life. They have post-traumatic stress with rethinking the episodes which has happened where they've been traumatized quite badly. Now, coming to the provisions, one or both parties need to be unrepresented. This amendment also provides protection, Madam Acting Speaker. It allows for evidence to be provided from a remote venue. It allows for a support person to be present with the victim, which is very critical on many occasions because it's so sad and more stressful to be alone in a more devastating situation. The questions could be directed through the presiding judicial officer. This is also a, a protection mechanism being offered by this amendment. What are the implications of this amendment? There's a $7 million spent by the Commonwealth over three years to support this scheme. There's no means test 
to access the scheme. This amendment also provides for late intervention dispute resolution, particularly when it comes to parenting rights and financing issues. Private practitioners with legal aid are also allowed to participate in this scheme. What is the feedback from the family court with the scheme being implemented so far? They have said it is working well. They can't wait for the not married people to start accessing the scheme. And they've also mentioned about the Commonwealth Attorney General who is undergoing a review of the whole scheme at the moment and they hope for ongoing funding and support for the scheme. The family court themselves are saying that the scheme is working well. And can I take this opportunity to thank our enthusiastic Attorney General who has been brought various bills to this house and this is an important bill which protects families, young kids and violence in future. And I commend this bill to the house, Madam Acting Speaker. Question is the bill be read a second time? All those, in, oh, uh, Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. Madam Acting Speaker, it was yesterday morning uh, that this second reading debate resumed, I having second read it earlier. Uh, and I shan't be long in my second reading response. Uh, I just uh, feel part of a team. Uh, I don't want to traverse all the matters that have been raised. Uh, the speakers in this matter were uh, the member for Central Wheatbelt, of course, the Leader of the Opposition. I thank her uh, for indicating the Opposition's support for this bill uh, in this chamber. Uh, the member for Nedlands, uh, the uh, member for Collie Preston, uh, the member for Mirabuka the member for Coburn, uh, the member for Mount Lawley, of course, uh, a very moving speech by the member for Dawesville and the member for Belmont. And lastly, of course, uh, Dr. Jags Krishnan, the member for Riverton. All, in my view, made very erudite uh, and insightful comments on this bill. Uh, and I don't want to stand here and repeat all of those comments, but I thank them for their contribution. Uh, they made very important points, uh, and uh, the central point of which, of course, is that it behoves this parliament to offer the power of this parliament to protect the vulnerable in our community and amongst the cohort of the most vulnerable are victims of, and in 97% of the cases, women victims of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And that when such an allegation, such a serious allegation is raised in our courts, it is only fair in the interests of justice that the allegation be tested, be tested for its veracity, but tested in a way that minimises the re-traumatisation of a true victim. Uh, and we have heard uh, some accounts, some accounts of the manner in which, and, and reading from transcript and press reports, the manner in which perpetrators have used the occasion of a court hearing where our allegation is to be tested to do just that, to re-traumatise a victim. As has been noted, it was in 2018, that the Federal Parliament amended the Family Court Act of Australia to prevent husbands or married spouses
from directly cross-examining their spouse or former spouse on an allegation. It is a matter of history and happy history that back in 1975, this parliament decided to retain its own jurisdiction and the only parliament in Australia to retain its own curial jurisdiction in relation to family court matters. And whilst the constitution gave power over marriage exclusively to the Commonwealth, we as the parliament were able to leverage retention of our own curial jurisdiction by refusing to refer uh, matters relating to what is, I think, sometimes almost uh, an insulting term of de facto, but when looked at legally, de facto, as opposed to de jure marriage. Those people who cohabit uh, without bringing themselves within the purview of the exclusive power of the Commonwealth by marriage. So we've happily kept that uh, jurisdiction and I think that other states are now envious that Western Australia has retained that jurisdiction given the recent amendments in the Commonwealth hiving off uh, so much of the family law disputes to the Federal Circuit Court where non-specialist Federal Circuit Court judges who are hearing civil, civil aviation matters one day, immigration matters the next day, and the following day uh, child access matters, whereas in Western Australia we are proudly and wisely the only jurisdiction that has an exclusive specialist court in relation to these matters. And so it was necessary uh, and appropriate that this parliament in relation to litigation before the Western Australian Family Court also mirror the legislation brought in by the Commonwealth, supported by every state, to ban the prohibition of <clears throat> a victim of domestic abuse or domestic violence by her, you, I say by her, because in 97% of the cases it is her, by her perpetrator. And should not be deterred from raising these matters before the Western Australian Family Court out of fear. And we've heard that some victims will yield to an unfair offer of settlement to avoid the re-traumatisation of the cross-examination by the perpetrator. And we're very pleased, of course, that there will be and there is already in place um, uh, facility at the Legal Aid Commission of Western Australia, uh, the funding uh, for representation of alleged perpetrators uh, for the purposes of cross-examining an elegant so that the cross-examination is done properly. The Commonwealth initially allocated $7 million to fund the scheme across Australia for three years. The Australian Government has worked extensively with National Legal Aid <coughs> to cost the measures in this bill. The average estimated cost of providing legal assistance under the measures of the bill were determined by National Legal Aid, and the cost includes the preparation 
and appearance at final hearing as well as legally assisted dispute resolution where appropriate. Uh, and the number of matters and parties likely to be affected by the measures uh, determined by research conducted by the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Uh, Legal Aid WA has worked with the Attorney General's Department regarding the funding necessary to meet the high demand of this service and ongoing funding in his accordance with the amended <laughs> funding agreement. I hope that those uh, comments uh, <coughs> Uh, and Legal Aid have advised that they uh, support the funding arrangement and have had no issues with the funding of the scheme by the Commonwealth. I hope those comments give some uh, uh, answer to uh, the um, member for Central, for Central Wheatfield and the issue that she raised in relation to funding. The member for Central Wheat Belt also confirmed or also drew the Chamber's attention to the fact that this bill replicates uh, the bill that passed through this Chamber uh, but did not succeed in passing through uh, the other place prior to prorogation uh, and noted, uh, the member for Central Wheat Belt did, <coughs> that it's the same bill except for amendments to section 243 and sought my confirmation in this regard and I can confirm this that section 200, the section 243 amendments address an error currently in the Family Court Act 1977 of Western Australia as identified by the Parliamentary Council Office an error reporting process Section 243 is to be amended to improve the clarity of the section and better set out the respective higher and summary penalties for each crime. Section 243, subsection 8, paragraph A, is inserted to clarify that the restrictions in subsections 1 and 2 also do not apply to state agencies which oversee the welfare of children and which is prescribed in regulations for that purpose. <clears throat> uh, the member for Central Wheat Belt also raised the question of review uh, and asked, isn't it necessary that the Commonwealth be, be conducting the review? And I, I can confirm that this is correct. Uh, under section 102NC of the Act, the Government is required to review the operation of the legislative provisions as soon as possible after the second anniversary of their commencement. The provisions commenced on the 10th of March 2019. Mr Robert Cornell AO and Mrs Kerry Ann Luscombe have been appointed to conduct the review and will report to the Government by August 2021. Mr Robert Cornell AO, reviewer, and, Mrs. and Ms Kerry Ann Luscombe, assistant reviewer, have been appointed to conduct the review into the operation of sections 102NA and 102NB of the Family Law Act 1975 Commonwealth, which implement the government's commitment to banning direct cross-examination of victims of family violence in family law matters. The review will consider improvements to the design and operation of the family violence and cross-examination of parties and propose a future framework for managing demand and funding allocations under the scheme. The scheme provides representations to parties subject to the ban on direct cross-examination for the hearing in which the cross-examination is to occur, including the necessary preparatory work for the hearing. As to the terms of reference, the review will examine and, if necessary, make recommendations for reform in relation to the operation of the legislative provisions, section 102NA and 102NB of the Act, 
design, the, as to the design and operation of the scheme and as to a sustainable and efficient funding model for the scheme. I have already addressed uh, the current funding model uh, for the scheme and Legal Aid WA's uh, uh, satisfaction so far with that funding. So may I conclude uh, where I started, uh, Madam Acting Speaker, uh, by, on behalf of the government, uh, thanking all members uh, for their uh, erudite and insightful contributions uh, to this bill, and I commend the bill to the Chamber. Members, the question is the bill to be now read a second time. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Family Court Act 1997. Uh, is leave granted to forthwith proceed to the third uh, reading? Yes. Yes, leave is granted. <laughs> read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Family Court Act 1997. Orders of the day. Government business order of the day number two, Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021, second reading, adjourned debate. Oh, we might have a bit of a hiatus here. Member Farrow, are you speaking? The question is the bill be read a second time. Yes. Member for Roy. The question is the be, bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Believe the ayes have it. Yeah. Yes, and we have for five minutes, member. <laughs> All right, the question is the bill be read a second time. Member for Roy. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. I apologise. We almost got away with it. I was very focused uh, on what I was going well, to say. Some might say we you weren't focused at all, just, but um, um, far away. <laughs> wrapping up there. but. Um, if I can, I, I would like to say I am um, looking forward to speaking on the uh, Ag Produce Commission <laughs> Amendment Bill. <laughs> um, no, very much looking forward to it, uh, Minister, and um, looking forward to um, hearing you uh, later on regale us with your um, knowledge of the Ag Produce Commission bill and the the stories the, the stories that you'd like to tell us about your farming background in Narragin and many other places, no doubt. So um, yes, indeed. Um, and firstly, I would like to um, point out that once again, once again, we are looking at a scenario where we've got a bill here that uh, was passed in this place in the um, previous parliament, discussed many times, but um, I'm pleased to see it has now come through the, uh, come through the Legislative Council and that um, Member, can I just clarify, are you lead speaker? Are you lead speaker yes, on the bill? Yes, yes I am. I am the lead speaker. Um, and our... Um, on, on behalf of the opposition, we will be um, supporting it, but I will be pointing out some things along the way that I'm pretty uh, a little bit disappointed with that um, have taken place in the other place um, that the ministers um, hasn't quite taken on board some of the industry consultation, I guess you could say, and I think. Um, We've seen a fair few concerns that have been raised in the other place by the likes of the Honourable Colin de Grasser 
um, the likes of uh, the Honourable Steve Martin, and just pointing out some of the some of the issues that they um, were concerned with um, in relation to uh, to levies, um, in relation to. I guess a variation, a variation, especially about the broad acre perspective, and I think in the minister's um, second reading speech, um, he went through a few um, a few issues, which um, firstly relate to um, the Ag Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021, and some of the. Um, scenarios that, that are playing out um, in relation to the Ag Produce Commission. And I guess the first one is um, in relation to the, uh, the compliance and the enforcement provisions. And this is where, uh, as you pointed out, the, the powers to direct a person to provide informational record, powers to investigate, and a penalty for providing false and misleading information. And this is to ensure producers are complying with the Act and that all funds collected are used as intended to support the industry. And I think uh, I don't think there's anyone that would be opposing um, that side of things. Um, but the the second point that he raised um, about key amendments allowing non producers to be appointed to committees. And I think um, this one uh, does create concerns uh, because, firstly, there, there's a good side of it where we've got um, people that can be brought in for their outside expertise. I think that's always important uh, when you're talking about governance. Um, these producer committees may not always have that uh, expertise, I guess, and it's important to to co-opt. Important to co-opt people from the outside. Um, but it does say subject to producers always being in the majority, and I think that's an important element. And the other part of it is that um, voting rights on committees will be uh, restricted to producer members only, and I think that is a that is a very important element because, um, as we know, the producer members are the ones with the uh, the on ground experience. I guess you could say, and I think um, when I look at the the consultation that uh, the uh, member for the agricultural region, the Honourable Colin de Grassa, has done, <coughs> we see that um, you know he's been in contact with the likes of our citrus, egg, strawberry. Uh, pommy, uh, potato, veggie, wine, and avocado industries. So he's he has consulted comprehensively. Um, he's also spoken to the uh, Kimberley Pilbara Cattlemen's Association, and of course WA Farmers and the uh, and the PGA. And um, uh, we know the minister uh, in the other place um, enjoys. Talking about the blue on green wars, and she likes to pit the WA Farmers Federation against the PGA. Um, I noticed that. <laughs> I noticed that from her um, her responses in the uh, in the other place. Um, but you know, so I don't I don't know whether they minister. They are sort of diversionary tactics, but. Um, it, uh, this is an important uh, important bill. The, the genesis of it is um, from 1988, I believe, the um, Horticultural um, um, uh, com Commission Bill. And so it's been around for a long time. And, and I noticed last night uh, when I was doing some preparation, it was interesting to read back, back to May 2000 some of the, um, some of the exchanges that were um, happening from you know, the likes of uh, uh, the Honourable uh, Kim Chance and also uh, the Honourable Murray Criddle, um, who, of course, Murray Criddle, um, a uh, broadacre grain grower from uh, from around the Geraldton region and very knowledgeable on many forms of agriculture. So, uh, Minister, it was it was quite interesting to read those exchanges between uh, Kim Chance and Murray Criddle, um, the back and forward. And, and of course, uh, as we know, this then 
um, went through to sort of 2006, and now it has taken quite a long time to uh, come back, come back into the mixture. So I think uh, I, I'm pleased to see that that it has uh, come through the ranks, um, and we know from. Um, what, what the third point that you raised, Minister, um, in your second reading speech about providing a mechanism uh, for existing committees to be allocated responsibility for additional produce. Um, I understand there's around about 11 um, of these committees at this, the moment. Um, that, that's probably not a, not a bad element to it. I think um, maybe a little bit over the top to actually have to um, keep coming up with, with new committees all of the time. So potentially you could add another, um, another produce element to a, a current committee. So um, <clears throat> now the fourth element that you mentioned uh, was the, the power for the commission to use weighted voting at a poll for the establishment of a, uh, of a committee. And, um, I always worry about weighted voting um, because you know it's about proportion of of um, produce that, that you might might produce. So I always come back to a. Uh, I remember in a couple of years ago at Esperance, I was at a um, CBH meeting, and uh, one of the certain producers down there said to the uh, the current chair of of CBH, he said, "Oh, well, I, I think that." Um, that to um, be a shareholder of CBH, you need to, um, or be on the board, you should produce a minimum of 20,000 tonnes of grain. And I still remember the, um, the the current chair now, Simon Stead, said, "Well, if Richard Goiter produces uh, 300 tonnes of oats at his farm in 2J, um, I think he would still be a suitable um, board member of CBH." So that one's always stuck in my mind, and when I talk about um, weighted weighted voting uh, or the weight of the amount of produce that you come up with to actually give you that extra um, number of votes, I don't think that is necessarily a, a good element. So um, <clears throat> now the other part of that is that um, leaving it for the commission to make the determination and where such an approach is in the best interests of the relevant agricultural industry. Uh, so to me that leaves it a little bit, um, a little bit up in the air as to uh, you know, what, what is weighted voting, um, how much, um, what gives the right for the, uh, the Commission to actually Make that um, make that determination, and I think um, that's probably one element to it that, that does concern me. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to um, address that as we we move along. Um, but I think one of the uh, one of the most contentious elements of this bill is the is the um, proposed, well, and it was in the proposed 2019 version of the bill, was the removal of the exclusion of the broadacre cropping and grazing industries. And um, it says this would have allowed those industries to be prescribed as agricultural industries under the Act. And if they chose to take advantage of the opportunities it offers and create a producer committee to service their industry. Uh, then it goes on to say, however, no consensus was reached amongst pastoralists as to whether their industry wanted access to the Act. As such, this bill retains the current Act's exclusion with amendment to clarify that this excludes an industry that concerns livestock enterprises generally conducted on pastoral land. Um, so this is the one, this is the uh, opt-out, I suppose you could call it the the opt-out provision and, and um, the real concern I think that was expressed in the other chamber was that the, the opt-out provision being put into regulation um, was the real, the real concern, the, the transparency I guess. So as you know, uh, Minister, 
uh, the Honourable Colin de Grasse tried to move an amendment, or he did move an amendment, which was lost, unfortunately, um, where he attempt, attempted to put this into the legislation, um, but unfortunately that was lost. And um, we've got the minister there talking about, oh, that's no problem, we'll, we'll put that into uh, regulation. Well, um, I, I believe WA, the WA Farmers Federation, the, they've expressed uh, their support uh, for the scenario here where um, the capacity for regulations to provide for a circumstance in which a charge for services provided by a committee could be waived, refunded or reduced, which is called the opt-out clause. Um, so the, the WA Farmers Federation, um, they are supportive of an opt-out provision, but what they are not supportive of is that it's not in the legislation. So they are concerned about the regulation um, or the proposed regulations that will be drawn up and they're, they're, uh, they're concerned about the transparency. So I think that's probably one of the most um, one of the most disappointing elements to it to me. Uh, the minister has said, uh, "Oh yes, she'll, she will, uh, she will certainly have the uh, regulations drawn up, and people will be able to see them in time and, and so forth." But as we know now, um, it's very difficult uh, for any regulations to be disallowed, uh, and 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 my concern for our agricultural industry is that this uh, opt-out provision is not in the legislation. And um, I certainly applaud the efforts of uh, the likes of the Honourable Colin de Grasse for trying to bring that amendment in and, and make that happen. Uh, but unfortunately, um, he was unsuccessful. And of course, Minister, as you know, um, the, uh, the pastoralists and graziers, um, they weren't supportive of any attempt um, to bring either pastoralists or uh, the currently excluded industries such as wheat, barley, canola and others under the provisions of the Act. So um, <clears throat> I think uh, that, that's probably the, uh, you know, one, of, one of the big items for me um, in relation to, the, um, to this legislation. And certainly I just wanted to go on to uh, some of the uh, some of the items that I think uh, Steve Martin, the Honourable Steve Martin, brought up um, during his uh, contribution, and I, th I think he had some very some very good points. As we know, Steve Martin is a uh, farmer from uh, Wickerpen. Um, I'm a farmer from Katanning. Of course, Darren West, the Honourable Darren West. Uh, likes to um, point out that he's the only working farmer in Parliament. So I think I haven't heard quite as much about that lately, um, with the Honourable Steve Martin from uh, Wickerpen moving into the Legislative Council. And Steve Martin is very much aware, uh, the Honourable Steve Martin is very much aware of some of the, um, some of the levies that, um, that are actually put on uh, many, of, many of our growers. And, and when you look at it, there's a, uh, there's a vast expanse of levies that growers already pay. And he's, he uh, pointed out, firstly, the, uh, the, certainly the biosecurity levies, um, you know, the likes of the, the wild dog levies and the, um, and the uh, GRDC levies, uh, the skeleton weed levies. Um, I know every year when you uh, deliver grain to CBH and you get your your statement comes back. There's always the uh, yeah the, the skeleton weed levy, the GRDC levy, and so it, the list goes on. And and the I guess the scepticism from the broadacre part, the broadacre element of our growers in WA, as you know, there's around about 4,000 uh, CBH growers, and the scepticism is that they seem to be always picking up the tab for all of these levies, and the worry for them is, is this another scenario where they are just going to be slugged with another form of levies? So that, that's the, uh, the element that 
I know many growers that I've spoken to are worried about. Um, they're worried about the, uh, the lack of clarity, I guess, in some ways, and that's certainly, um, certainly uh, quite interesting to me that the response that I've had when I've spoken to people and, and uh, the Honourable Steve Martin made, uh, he, well, he made a long list and I think it's important to actually repeat that when, when he talks about, um, we already pay these levies, wheat, barley, canola and lupins pay 1.02 per cent of the sale value, wool uh, 1.5 per cent of the sale value, um, fodder 50 cents per tonne, cattle export 0.9523 cents per kilo, lamb and sheep export 0.6 cents per head, cattle processing 60 cents per kilogram, lamb processing 16 cents per head, sheep processing 15 cents per head, cattle transaction uh, $5 a head, lamb and sheep transactions 20 cents per head for the state ones, cattle 20 cents on all carcasses, sheep and goats 15 cents on all carcasses, grain seeds and hay 25 cents per tonne on the first sale of grains, 12 and a half cents per tonne on the first sale of hay produced in the southwest. So you can see, uh, Minister, there's any number of levies and we have, um, I know in the Australian, uh, the AWI, Australian Wool Innovation, <coughs> there's always this contention every so many years we get a, um, a poll that's produced and we have the CEO of um, Australian Wool Innovation putting it out there that we need to give a 2% um, levy on our wool um, that we <coughs> send in. Of course, a lot of the growers uh, question over time what, what that levy is going into. <coughs> Excuse me, the old story, is it going into administration? Is it going into marketing? Where is it going? So we have three options. We have the 1%, the one and a half percent and the two percent. So uh, this is another one that really does create quite a bit of contention. I know at the moment the AWI are looking at the two percent levy. That's what they've recommended, of course. And a lot of growers are going to vote for the uh, one percent levy, I suspect. So um, this this is an element that really has created quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of angst, I suppose you would say, amongst our, our growers out there. And uh, I, I think the, we all understand the, um, the need to, to modernise the legislation. And I, I think, <clears throat> from my perspective, the APC um, does do a good job, especially for those smaller industries, the likes of our our wine, our avocados, our bananas, and so forth, where you can actually, you can actually um, have that producer committee. Uh, you've got a certain item or a certain element that you would like to explore within that industry, and that's a great opportunity where um, you can raise those levies from those particular growers. And I think. <clears throat> I guess an example that was given to me in relation to uh, the broad acre industry, the likes of, uh, say, a Sepwa in um, South East Premium um, growers in uh, Esperance area, where they may want to do a certain study on a, let's say, a barley variety that might be suited to the Esperance region, um, but growers from out in the wheat belt, eastern wheat belt, northern wheat belt, they may not be uh, quite as convinced about the relativity to their particular area of a barley that might be suited to the uh, Esperance region. So that's where that's where the angst has come about, where growers from other parts of the state, broadacre growers from other parts of the state, um, have. Come to a uh, come to a point where they've actually said, well, um, we're not quite sure that we particularly want to put in to another levy for an area that may may not actually um, suit may not actually suit our particular um, part of the world. So I think that was uh, that was well and truly demonstrated through some of the consultation that's been out there. <coughs> if I can. Um, 
I think it's just important to mention uh, there's been a lot of work, of course, going to um, the, uh, the report, the report 45, the Standing Committee on Legislation about the Agri Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill, which was uh, chaired by the uh, Honourable Sally Talbot and also featured uh, the Honourable Pierre Yang, Honourable Colin de Grasser, uh, Honourable Steve Thomas, Honourable um, and Substitute Nick Garan and the Honourable Simon O'Brien, MLC. And I think um, there were some recommendations raised from, the, uh, from that um, committee report and um, <clears throat> probably a, a couple of them I, I just would like to mention are the, um, the recommendation one where the Minister for Agriculture and Food explain why it's necessary for clause four slash two of the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill to insert the words prescribed for the purposes of this definition into the definition of agricultural industry of the Agricultural Produce Commission Act 1988. So um, I think that has been dealt with uh, as, we, as we go through the bill, but I think it was important. Uh, the minister responded that it allows flexibility and it allows modern and future industries to be captured without having to uh, amend the Act. And she um, pointed out that uh, the likes of, say, truffles um, would be uh, a produce that hasn't been really defined as such, but it then could be uh, could be included. Um, the other one of the other recommendations, uh, the minister explained why clause 15.1 of the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill um, delegates the definition of a prescribed person to regulations rather than prescribing its own definition of that term, and the response was. Use of the word prescribed, prescribed in legislation always means it will be set in regulations and allows flexibility as these persons will differ depending on the relevant industry and so are more appropriately dealt with in the regulations. So um, <clears throat> I think that's one where we are not quite as convinced, uh, as I said, regarding the regulations. Uh, we, we believe some of these elements should have been uh, put into the legislation and I think, as I said, the um, Honourable Colin de Grasse moved the, um, certainly moved that um, particular amendment uh, to um, the opt-out uh, clause to have it uh, transparent and um, to actually make sure that it was in the legislation, and there is there is disappointment from the WA Farmers Federation that that particular um, part of it wasn't successful. And um, as you know, as you said in the second reading speech, Minister, the regulations are tailor-made to suit the different requirements of each producer, committee, and industry. And um, for existing committees, this new head power for regulations will allow waiver provisions to be included in their current regulations. Um, if their producers wish to have this option included, and for new committees, the need for a waiver provision will be part of discussions with the Commission when producers indicate an interest in establishing a committee. So, um, you know, your final paragraph, the proposed amendments will improve the effectiveness of the APC mechanism for producers currently using it and make the opportunities it provides available to producers in the broad acre cropping industries. So um, I agree with that to a point, but as I said, there's, there's reservations certainly from the PGA as to the um, broad acre element. And of course, um, we know that the... Uh, I guess the final um, result, if you like, where um, there were, were provisions made for the pastoral, the pastoral industry who have um, livestock operations, and there were questions raised about what happens if the uh, if they have cattle, if you like, in the 
rangelands or in the pastoral regions and then bring those cattle down to be fed lot in the southwest of WA. How do they go there? Um, I think the minister did basically make provision that um, they will be excluded um, even if, uh, if they originate from a pastoral area. So um, because the, uh, the PGA were concerned that um, they would be swept up uh, along with you know, broadacre producers from the general agricultural region when really they'd originally been given um, provision that they would be um, excluded from the situation. So my understanding of it is that the, um, the minister has made provision that um, if they do bring cattle down, uh, as I said, from the rangelands or wherever, that they will actually um, um, be excluded from this um, legislation. So I think <clears throat> that that was a um, that was an important element to it. Uh, I, I do want to reiterate again the um, the hesitation and the nervousness when um, I think there's been calculations done that somewhere between about nine and twelve percent of levies. Uh, or of, of a producer's gross income come out in levies. Um, and that's, that's the, where the real hesitation from our um, broad acre farmers, if you like, right throughout, the, uh, right throughout the grain regions of WA, that's where their hesitations, I think, really, really come through. And, and, um, and I think really this is the whole, the whole crux of this bill, is about the inclusion of the um, of the broadacre broadacre element of the broadacre cropping and graz grazing industries, and I think that is the most um, contentious part of the bill. So I'm, I'm I'll be interested to hear the uh, the contributions of others here today. Um, you know, I've got I think the APC um, is certainly very effective when it comes to those smaller industries. We've heard. You know the um, the likes of our different varieties of apples. Of um, our, I think our avocado industry and our beekeeping and our citrus industries. They are um, they are very much uh, they they fit into the um, the agricultural produce commission amendment bill 2021 without a problem. Um, it's the um, those other groups, the PGA, the WA Grains Group, they are certainly um, hesitant. The WA Farmers, they were supportive on their condition of the opt-out clause, which, as we saw with the loss of that amendment in the other place, um, they will have some hesitancy, I would imagine, about the regulations. Um, the rangeland goat producers, they were supportive. The black barley industry, they were supportive. The South East um, Premium Wheat Growers Association, they were supportive. So, <coughs> um, as I said, the, um, I was impressed with the consultation that uh, the Honourable Colin de Grasse, um certainly uh, had over the last year or two. Um, we've certainly had plenty of briefings in our party room um, and I know the likes of um, uh, Bill Ryan and, and, and so forth from the Ag Produce Commission do, um, do important work. So um, from that perspective, uh, we, are, we are supportive about uh, these smaller industries. Um, we are concerned in conclusion. We are concerned, as the PGA certainly were, um, about the... Uh, the opt-out provisions and whether others will get swept up, whether others will get swept up in our broadacre uh, grain growers especially, um, will end up with levies that they weren't quite expecting. Um, but in a, in a general sense, uh, we are supportive. But I think the key, the key, as I want to reiterate for one last time, the key to it was the opt-out provision. We were hoping, as WA Farmers Federation were, that this could be included as part of the legislation. Um, we're not convinced that the putting it into regulations is quite the way forward. So um, I'll just leave my contribution at that. Thanks, Madam Speaker.
The question is that the bill be read a second time. The member, member for more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, I won't be very long. So, <laughs> um, I just want to make a very brief contribution on this uh, on this particular bill, uh, and just around that point of the inclusion of broad acre uh, farmers uh, into the agricultural. Uh, Produce uh, Commission, Ambit, uh, and into that uh, that um, that levy situation, and reiterate what both uh, the Honourable Colin de Grusu has been saying and what uh, uh, Member for Rowe has just said about the need for that um, that opt-out uh, clause to be considered, uh, and for that to be conditional. I, th I would suspect on our support of the bill. Um, when this was uh, uh, first being mooted as a as an option. Uh, for the broadacre agricultural community to be included. Uh, the reaction from uh, farmers in my electorate was uh, quite immediately uh, opposed uh, to that um, happening. I know in other areas of the state some grower groups, for instance, have, have indicated a level of support for the inclusion of, uh, of broadacre agriculture as a, as a, uh, a levyable industry uh, under the bill. Um, but um, certainly in my area that has not been the case. Uh, and there are many uh, other levies which uh, farmers are already subject to, uh, and uh, they would uh, also question, I think, um, why this needs to be um, so broad in its ambit that, um, that they can't simply opt out. Uh, over the years, the, the delivery of uh, agricultural research and extension uh, has changed, and one of those um, one of those ways it's changed has been the emergence of uh, of self help groups, if you like, grower groups, uh, right across the state, uh, groups like the West Midlands Group, like uh, um, like Levy Group, like Mid Mini U and Group, etc. In my own area, plus others, a lot of other smaller groups which. Uh, are also in the uh, in the agricultural um, area, uh, and and they quite they pride themselves on on a degree of independence and relevance, and that relevance comes from actually being relevant enough to actually have people participate voluntarily. Uh, I think that um, once you take that away and you start to uh, just dole out money uh, that comes from a levy, um, that drive to be relevant uh, and that. Uh, um, Positioning yourself at the cutting edge so people actually want to be involved, uh, that somewhat disappears. Uh, there's a bit of moral hazard involved here. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I certainly do not support um, compulsory uh, levies in this way. Uh, I look at it a little bit like we see now with the biosecurity uh, situation where uh, there are recognised biosecurity groups proliferating around the state. That system worked well in the pastoral areas where there was a, a uh, commonality of um, pest problems uh, and, uh, a, a, if you like, a, a rationale for them to all come together and work together to uh, to challenge these these particular issues. When you come further towards the the south west, uh, the closer you come to populated areas, it becomes more difficult to find common pest problems. Uh, more difficult to find uh, agreement that everybody uh, wants to actually be involved in uh, in those um, uh, in those levies and in that uh, combat with those particular pests, uh, and uh, and so that system, I think, the way that that's operating at the moment shows me that a compulsory levy situation is not necessarily a very good thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, um, you shouldn't be contributing to the common good. But if you are not able to, to opt out uh, of a system which isn't relevant to you and your farm business, I think there's a, there's a real problem in there. So that's a situation with the regional biosecurity groups. I'm in an area where I'm apparently combating wild pigs. I've never seen a wild pig anywhere near my farm, but I pay a levy now to combat wild pigs somewhere and somewhere very remote from me. There might be wild pigs running around, but apparently that's an issue which I'm now levied against. Uh, I actually raised uh, um, this uh, issue with, uh, um, with the department uh, as to how many people had actually responded in when they first imposed that rate uh, in the area that I'm in, the West Midlands, uh, and, uh, and I was told uh, a number, uh, pretty well all of whom, I can't remember the number offhand, but pretty well all of whom were actually opposed. 
yet the minister went on and, and imposed that, decided to impose that rate, uh, and now that system uh, is, um, is up and running. Uh, I'm sure the people that are doing it are, are well-meaning uh, and doing a good job. I'm not, I'm not bagging anyone here. They're, they're doing their thing. It's just not remotely connected to any pest I have on my property. Uh, and, uh, and yet I'm paying several times um, uh, this rate, and I'm not alone in feeling somewhat aggrieved about that situation. Uh, as I say, as you come further and further towards the populated areas, the, the diversity of pest problems uh, makes it almost impossible to, uh, to handle it all under one of those management plans that the, the BAM Act uh, demands that you put up. Uh, so it's somewhat impractical and I, I think uh, shows that uh, compulsory levies are, are problematic. Uh, this is effectively becoming a compulsory levy, in my view. Once you, once you get a group who's, uh, who's keen to have a levy, they get out there, they convince the minister, that gets done, uh, you don't have an opt-out and you're stuck paying yet another fee on top of all of the fees you're already paying in the farm business. Uh, and that's the reason that I particularly uh, don't support this bill. I actually never supported the inclusion of broadacre agriculture in, uh, in here, even when it's been discussed in early stages in our party room. Um, I know that wasn't always the, the view of everybody in that, in that room. Uh, there were some members who felt it was a good idea. Um, I just don't like the idea and I won't support it. Thank you. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The member for Albany. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I rise today to speak in support of the Agriculture Produce Commission's Amendment Bill 2021. The purpose of this bill is to importantly improve the effectiveness of the APC mechanism and for the provision and funding of services by agricultural producers to agricultural producers. This is highly important as they are the voice of their industry. This Act already operates effectively to empower producers to grow their industry. It is an established framework which has led to a cooperative relationship between the Commission and the producers. A review was undertaken to identify several amendments to the improvement of the operation of the Act. There are currently 11 producers, avocados, beekeepers, Carnarvon bananas, egg, palm, citrus and stone fruit, pork, potato, strawberry, grape, table grape, vegetable and wine. I'd like to highlight some of the beneficial work that the Producers Committee has already undertaken. In my neighbouring electorate of Warren Blackwood, through their research activities, the commercialisation of the Bravo apple, which I first tasted at one of my annual foodie events, Truffle Kerfuffle. This apple variety tells a story just through the crunch and the taste of every bite. Promotional activities such as Crunch and Sip, Sip in Schools. Crunch and Sip is a primary school nutrition program developed to increase the quality of fruit, vegetables and water being consumed by West Australian children. It's an easy way for kids to stay healthy and happy. Crunch and Sip is a set time during the school day for students to eat vegetables and fruit and to drink water in classrooms. Students bring fruit and veg to school and each day they have a Crunch and Sip break. This gives students the chance to refill and with fruit and vegetables, which helps to improve physical and mental performance and concentration in the classroom, as well as promoting long-term health. Government re research shows that Australian kids aren't eating enough fruit and vegetables. One in 16 eats the recommended daily fruit and vegetables. Over seven in 10 eat the recommended daily um, serves of fruit. Crunch and Sip helps children to develop regular healthy eating habits. Eating a healthy diet in the ch children reduce the risk of being overweight or obese. The proportion of children carrying excess, excess weight has more than doubled in the last 30 years, with one in four children now overweight or obese. Being overweight or obese increases your risk of developing chronic disease such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes and some cancers in later life. As a mum, this is a daily activity in my house to ensure that my kids go to school with a container of fresh, fresh fruit and veggies. The current star fruit of the month is the pomegranate seed from Rob and Deb's pomegranate farm just down in Napier. Certainly not the easiest fruit to tackle in the morning, but knowing the nutritional value, it's worth the mess. I do look forward to the summer months when we frequent the Nicklup Orchard for the fresh, fruit, fresh tray of stone fruit. My electorate of Albany has an abundance of local produce and we love nothing more than foraging and eating local seasonal produce as much as possible. Albany has some of the best wine and food producers in WA. Last week, the West Australian Investment and Trade Commission delegation visited the Great Southern Region. On Friday, I welcomed Simon Millman, MLA, Parliamentary Secretary to the Deputy Premier, Jobs and Trade to Albany. 
We attended a roundtable discussion with the Great Southern Wine Exporters. It was an opportunity to hear from many producers from my region. Rob Wignall was one of, is a multi-award winning Wignall's Wine business shared his family's story to the group. Wignall's Wine was established on what was the outskirts of, the Albany, of Albany, only eight kilometres from the CBD in 1982. They're a gold medal winner for Pinot and Chardonnay. They continue to produce outstanding wines and are doing Albany very proud. Next door to Wignalls is Handicide Strawberries. Owners Neil and Lynn Handicide grow conventional and organic strawberries along with a wide range of value added products. They received a regional economic grant funding for a freeze dried fruit packing facility to expand the range of value added products. They continue to value add to their business through the vibrant cafe which think, serves all things strawberries, my favourite, a Devonshire tea. The cafe has a great playground and facilities for all abilities within the Albany community. Further down the road on the Calgan River, under new custodians Michelle Gray and Phil Shilcock, is Monty's Leap Vineyard and Restaurant. They also received a regional economic grant funding to redevelop their cellar door and restaurant. This restaurant is now a popular quality dining attraction for locals and tourists. It's a culinary experience showcasing fresh produce such as marin, cheese and vegetables. GP Ayres and Sons have been growing potatoes in Bornholm for three generations and are now the leaders of the specialist market of growing seed potatoes. Today, Colin and his son, Chris, grow more than 100 hectares of seed potatoes a year, with 65 different varieties for fresh and crisp potato markets. They received a $200,000 Mark McGowan State Government grant towards, towards the purchase of the first Viscal Optal sorting machine using high speed cameras to capture photos of the potatoes and direct them to the correct conveyor belts for sorting. Albany is also fortunate to have two local markets in town where the producers can sell and direct to customers. The long running Albany farmers markets on a Saturday morning and the boat shed markets on a Sunday. My kids love Yard 86, cho 86 Choc Milk from the Saturday markets. The Hart family produced the wonderful high quality Yard 86 milk at their dairy in Redmond. This gently pasteurised milk is bottled on the farm and sold to local cafes, independent retailers and direct customers at the farmers markets where they have a very loyal following. Along with their great taste, full milk, they also produce iced coffee, chalk milk and are planning to expand the new milk products in the future. There is something special about the food producers get, getting to know the customers and the customers dealing directly with the producer. The electorate of Albany has many farmers who are recognising the benefits of re Regenerative farming, regenerative farming has to offer. These benefits include productivity reducing cost, increasing soil carbon, soil biology, combating salinity along with the resistance to pests and disease. Mark and Barb Shipley were one of the early adopters of this farming practice for cattle, chicken and egg production in Albany. Using a reg regular short-term intense grazing system to alternative past parasites and increased pasture quality, this resulted in a much lower input cost and increased pasture productivity. Although now retired, Mark is still a passionate advocate for regenerative farming. Cole Bowie and Ash Baldwin from the Great from Green Range Lamb have developed from scratch a paddock to plate product system for their ultra-right grass-fed lambs. To maximise production, they are continuously lambing throughout the year with the used lambing twice every 13 to 14 months. They've only been operating for 18 months and now run 400,000 predominantly ultra-right breeding ewes on 1,250 hectares. I was fortunate to meet the Gilmore family from Iron Gate Wagyu with the Minister for Agriculture. They produce a high quality Wagyu beef and also also received a red grant for funding to create an e-commerce site in the multi multiple languages to sell its Wagyu beef packed in the Great Southern from a base in Singapore. Regenerative wine producers Iron, Irene and Richard Bunn from Bun Wine Winery and Pam Lincoln and Murray Gum Gom from Orange Tractor were pioneers of the industry. I'd like to share the story with you, the Orange Tractor story. Across the entire property and the lifestyle they practice as many key activities that underpin improving sustainability. Recycling, composting, revegetation re re and the use of renewable energy. Murray is very proud, proud of the fact that their daily, their typical weekly rubbish output is merely two super ba supermarket bags full. 
That's for the house and the cellar door kitchen. Everything that can be recycled is. Everything else that, that can't be is composted or fed to the chickens. On the revegetation front, they have planted many thousands of trees on their 20 acre land. Some act as a windbreak, other for future timber, and the rest along the creek line amongst remnant bush. As a result of the planting, they enjoy a lovely display of endemic birds and now have a habitat in which they grow and prosper, as well as knowing that downstream the creek water is quality, the quality is benefiting. The vineyard is growing organically. It's, it's just one of the ways they minimise their footprint on the planet. Since 2002, they've been able to grow grapes according to the organic standard. This means that they don't use superphosphate and other fertilisers that can leach into the waterways. They only use a combination of eco-soil, seaweed ex extracts, copper and wettable sulphur. Their flock of chickens and guinea flour are kept happy gobbling pests, so no pesticides are used. In addition, they let the grass grow between the vine rows and underneath the vineyards, so no herbicides are required. Their goal of crafting unique, unique terra-specific wine using practices that care for the earth, most of the work has been done. However, that is not to say that they don't value the excellent winemaking skills of Rob Deletti, who received the Winemaker of the Year Award in 2014 from James Halliday. Rob and his family own another great regional wine winery called Castle Rock Estate, which crafts beautiful wines for themselves and for other smaller producers, such as Orange Tractor, who use the services. His diligence, dedicated and ethical practices help to create wines, great wines, one that reflect unique aspects of each location. The terror and the maintain the region's reputation of wine excellence. A small proportion of Orange Tractor's wine is made on site, using an intervention, as little intervention as possible, and this falls under the natural wine category. In keeping with their bio-local philosophy, Orange Tractor not only utilise local trades for every poss everywhere possible, their grapes are usually hand-picked by local community groups. It is a win-win situation as the groups get much needed funds to continue doing what they do and the, the winery strengthens its connection with the community. A great example of this is the local mountain bike club who come out and assist at the harvest time. Not only does the club receive a good donation, they also receive a small percentage of the sales. So I encourage you next time when you're standing at the bottle shop looking for a bottle of wine, that you look for a local bottle of wine that's made hopefully in the Great Southern but certainly in Western Australia. It is delicious, it is delicious. <laughs> Not that I've tasted too many of them. <laughs> Bread Crow is a micro bakery in Albany by the run by the passionate duo Rhiannon Moon and Sam Dawson. Their passion is to create a produce and a product where the flavour is re reflected in the quality of the water and the soil that the plant is grown on. Bread of the region and for the region. The bread is stone milled on site from whole grains sourced locally. Stone milling is an important part of making the bread as it is a gentle process that produces less heat and friction. Sam likes to say that the cold flour is good flour because it preserves much more of the nutrition and the fatty acids in the flour. Rhiannon and Sam are working with regenerative farmers Penny and Dale Goodwin from Goodies Farm in Kensington in establishing a local grain for a local bread. Breadco also supplies to the Northbridge Brewing Company with bread that they use to brew their beer. They also supplied the bread for the Friday night gala dinner this year at Truffle Kerfuffle, which I proudly delivered for them. I commend the bill to the House and encourage all members to buy local, buy <coughs> fresh and support our local growers of Western Australia. Thank you. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The member for Geraldton. Oops, a daisy. <laughs> Sorry, just dropped all the bill on the ground. <laughs> I rise to speak in support on the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021. Any opportunities to strengthen and support our agricultural industries should draw support from the government of the day. The inclusion of broadacre farming sector into the remit of the Agricultural Produce Commission is something the peak WA representative body, WA Farmers, have been calling for for well over a decade. The fact that broadacre farmers are excluded from accessing the services of the Agricultural Produce Commission does seem strange to me. 
My electorate of Geraldton is surrounded by broadacre farming. The crops of wheat and canola are looking absolutely spectacular this year after the best winter rainfall seen in many, many years. If the farmers who planted those crops want to access services via the Agricultural Produce Commission, currently they find themselves excluded. So why is that important? Time for a dive into the work of the Agricultural Produce Commission. The Agricultural Produce Commission Act 1988 provides Western Australian agricultural producers with a legal framework to collect funds to provide for the development and security of growers and producers and the industry sectors. In part, this bill seeks to amend that Act of 1988 and include broadacre farming. This would allow the broadacre farmers in my electorate and across WA to access the, Agri access the Agricultural Produce Commission, or APC, in order to establish a committee if producers wish to do so. The services from an APC committee include establishing compensation schemes, assisting in developing systems for quality control or pest and disease control, establishing inspection systems for grading, packaging and storage of agricultural produce, formulating schemes for helping producers gain accreditation, establishing voluntary crop insurers schemes, providing developing educational programs, undertaking research and developing and expanding new markets, as well as undertaking market forecasting. The first of those services, establishing compensation schemes, seems to be particularly relevant for farmers in the Midwest in 2021. Imagine if there had been a long-standing broadacre farming committee in place in the wake of Cyclone Serosia. Establishing a compensation scheme that is driven and overseen by producers would have been immensely helpful for an industry that has been hit by a natural disaster, the likes of which most districts that were impacted have never seen before. And that is just one on a long list of services available. So the work of the APC has seen the development of new cultivars of fruit like the Bravo apple, a sensation around Australia and the world, and a testament to the hard work and innovation of Western Australian primary producers and their related industry research and development groups. Could a future APC broadacre farming committee help develop high yielding wheat varieties that thrive in low rainfall areas and can tolerate higher saline soils or drier finishes to a season? Broadacre farmers Geraldton Port Zone have experienced some amazing highs and lows in 2021. As I mentioned earlier, Cyclone Serosia changed our lives completely as it smashed into the Midwest area in April, with many farmers and families still recovering from its destructive force. But 2021 has also seen the best start to a growing season in many, many years, and the outlook for this year's crops is very favourable. Rainfall records have been broken in many places across the ag region of WA, and some farmers are expecting their best return on investment for decades. The importance of broadacre farming to my electorate is fairly clear to most people. The iconic grain silos at Geraldton Port spell it out to the world. We are a city with deep connections to broadacre farming. According to ABEARS, the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Sciences, the area planted to winter crops in Western Australia is forecast to increase by 5% to a record high 8.7 million hectares in 2021-22. That's 87,000 square kilometres of wheat, barley, canola, oats, lupins, peas and other cereal grains, legumes and pulses. And just to put that into context for the members, our growing area in 2021 is larger than the surface area of Austria. Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development's own website until recent update last Thursday, the 5th of August states, with an excellent season to date, there is potential for a record grain harvest. As you can imagine, we are all thrilled to hear this. The Grain Industry Association of WA July report online suggests that the Geraldton Port Zone could see broadacre farmers produce well over a 3 million tonnes of grain this year. It's an amazing result, but we have some of the most innovative and resilient broadacre farmers in the world. 
So why should they be left out of the APC? Producers are the only people who can form a committee with the framework produced by the APC legislation. These amend amend amendments do not seek to force anything upon unwilling participants. Those from the Midwest may remember it wasn't that long ago the summer that summertime meant grain trucks backed up from the port to the old roundabout at the start of the Northwest Coastal Highway. The Southern Transport Corridor was opened on the 10th of September 2005 by WA Labor Premier Dr Jeff Gallup. We literally redesigned roads and intersections in part to cater for the amount of grain delivered to the Geraldton Port. If we, as a state, want to continue to produce some of the very best cereal grains and legumes in the world, we need to enable our broadacre farmers to develop their farming practices, utilise the latest technologies and take advantage of research and development. If this means broadacre farmers want to create an APC committee, why should ageing legislation that is out of step with the industry prevent them? I read the comments of WA Farmers Chief Executive Officer Trevor Whittington in a Farm Weekly article from the 25th of June 2021 and he was quoted as saying, it was good to see that a bill first pro proposed 14 years ago had finally made it to Parliament and that opening up the APC to the broadacre sector is what WA Farmers have called for with the exclusion in the legislation. The WA Farmers website states they represent a membership of over 1,100 farming businesses. If their membership wants to be part of the Agricultural Produce, Produce Commission, why should government stand in their way? WA Labor has invested in key infrastructure to support broad acre farming, like the work done to provide internet services into regional areas. For example, the Digital Farm Grants Program, a McGowan Labor government policy, has helped to provide a vast broadband service to broadacre farming enterprises in Chapman Valley, the North Midlands and across the wheat belt and agricultural regions of WA. This ability to access fast, reliable broadband has enabled farmers to integrate the latest technology and smart farming techniques into their businesses. Just being able to check commodity prices or weather forecasts is crucial to broadacre farming and the McGowan Labor Government continues to invest in solutions for communications in regional areas. The latest round of digital farm grants announced in January this year will help farmers in the shires of Esperance, Cookeran, Corder, Mount Marshall, Wildcatcham, Tamman, Querreting, Beverley, Yilgarn, Coolan, Kent, Lake Grace, Dumbleyung, Goomelling and Cunderdon access enterprise grade broadband. If those same farmers decided as a producer group they want to create a committee through the Agricultural Produce Commission to develop new markets for their grain or get into research and development to improve efficiencies in their farming businesses, out of date government legislation should not be what stops them. Returning to the Geraldton Port Zone and the crops in the ground, I wish to express my hopes for good finishing conditions for the growing season. I hope all the broadacre farmers in my area of the Northern Wheat Belt and North Midlands have a great year because after the um, trauma of Sorosia, they deserve it. And as we prepare for the field day season with the Mini New Expo started this week, I hope people have the chance to spend some time catching up with colleagues and friends before the pressure of harvest time arrives. The Expo is important to the local community, to build and create relationships, to learn about new agricultural technologies, to showcase their bountiful wares, but most importantly, the Expo is to have a lot of fun. What races? Mullawar. No, no, they used to have a race. And I was up and through this a long time. When the Mingamu <laughs> Expo was on, they used to also have a race meet there. Oh. Ah. Do they? They don't, obviously don't. It was some years ago. I was a jockey at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> about that. Um, Honourable Member in the Ag Region is attending. I'll have to send her a message and ask if she attended the races as well. I also hope... <laughs> the 
Chamber for Geraldton has the call. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Um, I also hope that they will have the choice to access the agri <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> agriculture. <laughs> I am visualising you in a sauna after a heated race meeting at Minningu. Sweating out I also hope they will have the choice to access the Agricultural Produce Commission, the APC. As the member for Albany has already stated, there are currently 11 producers committees for the following industries, avocado, beekeepers, Carnarvon bananas, eggs, palm citrus and stone fruit, pork, potatoes, strawberries, table grapes, vegetables and wine. In supporting the legislation, I would hope that broadacre farmers would access those same services if they so choose, to gain advantages in their business models, to continue to be the best dry land farmers in the world. This amendment bill seeks to do more than just include broadacre farming, but for my electorate of Geraldton, this is perhaps the most relevant part of the legislation. And as raised by the member for Roe, the APC does run under a fee-for-service model. Members of APC committees pay fees and I can, can understand that farming businesses could be concerned they'll be paying for services they may not want or access. But for farmers who have that concern, I would look to the facts. For a committee to be established, the Act requires a poll of producers in the industry to determine if producers are in favour of the proposal. Before the poll can be conducted, the Commission must advertise the intention to conduct the poll and invite submissions from affected producers. The Agricultural Produce Commission, with 30 years of experience in forming and supporting producers' committees, has learnt that the vital component of a successful producer committee is the involvement of and support from the producers, who will be the beneficiaries of the services <coughs> the committee provides. The Commission does not move to conduct a poll until there has been extensive consultation with the members of the industry concerned. As an example, the discussion between the wine industry and the Commission covered a span of nearly 10 years. So any broadacre farming committee would take years of negotiation and consultation before it could be established if producers decided they want to form one. And the Agricultural Producers Commission Amendment Bill 2021 will include a method for committees to waive, refund or reduce charges payable by producers. This will be achieved via regulations instead of legislation, so APC committees will be able to craft specific regulations for their producers' members instead of a one-size-fits-all piece of legislation forced onto all committees. So in conclusion, I wish to thank the Madam Acting Speaker and the House for the opportunity to speak in favour of this legislation and I hope all members will support this legislation and support a real choice for WA's broadacre farmers instead of current legislation that denies them that choice. Thank you, Member. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The Member for Warren Blackwood. Thank you, Acting, Madam Acting Speaker. My electorate of Warren Blackwood within the South West region is a major food bowl in Western Australia, proudly boasting innovation in agriculture, a robust export market, world-class producers and a diverse and abundant range of produce that keeps us fed, watered and many people employed. I rise today to speak in support of the Agriculture Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021. This amendment bill has been a long time coming and has had its fair shares of ups and downs to get to this point. Discussion, consultation and plenty of toing and froing between the different representative bodies as changes, inclusions, omissions were contemplated for the possibilities of updating the Act. 31 years ago, the Horticultural Produce Commission Act 1988 established the Commission as a statutory authority with the primary function of establishing producers' committees for different industries. These committees are run by producers for producers. The Act provides a mechanism for producers to combine their efforts and resources and work together through their producers' committee to achieve the agreed goals of their industry. In 2000, 
the Act was amended to become the Agricultural Produce Commission Act. In 2006, an extensive review of the Act was undertaken. The review identified amendments that could improve the operation of the Act. The Bill proposes to modernise the Act, strengthen governance and responsive to, and on behalf of, producers' committees, while also removing the exclusion of certain industries from use of the Act. It delivers on many of the 2006 recommendations to improve the Act. In the time that I've had the privilege of being the first female member for Warren Blackwood and the first Labor member for 32 years, I've met producers, growers, industry bodies, bodies and attended events that celebrate our outstanding produce and producers, like the Truffle Kerfuffle at Fonty's Pool in Manjimup, where the Market Hall is a treat for the senses. I've now promised to share, I've now promised my team I'll get better at bringing treats home for us all to share. Of all the people I've met, and of all the farms, shops, markets, events, and businesses I've visited, there's a few things that stand out. Produ producers in my patch are passionate people, and they're incredibly hospitable. They're passionate about their industry, passionate about their families and family businesses, passionate about making sure they have a strong workforce. They're passionate about potential growth in their industry. They're also passionate about their produce and passionate about where they live. And they're hospitable, keen to share knowledge and occasionally scones. I recently stopped near Northcliffe, having been waved down by a farmer, Matt Daubney, to allow his cows to pass. We talked about the election, we talked about politics, we talked about the farm, the family business, family, workforce and the industry. And of course we talked about the North Cliff, we talked about North Cliff and the fabulous North Cliff Hotel and Motel Cow and Calf Bistro. Cows got to their paddock and I went on my merry way, but not before Matt invited me back for a tour of the Bannister Downs dairy and to find out more about the industry and the business. I look forward to taking up Matt's offer and to enjoying dinner at the Cow and Calf Bistro next time I'm in North Cliff. The producers' committees established within the framework of the Commission under the Act enable producers and industry to come together to focus on growth in industry, reduce threat to productivity, deal strategically with potential issues and to mitigate risks. As my esteemed colleagues have already mentioned, there are currently 11 producer committees from a range of industries. The first being established in 1991 and the most recent being established in 2015. In order of date, these are Table Grape, which was established in 1991, Pom, Citrus and Stone Fruit, established in 1994, Avocado, established in 1995, Strawberries, established in 1995 as well, Carnarvon Banana, established 1999, Pork, established 2001, Potatoes also established 2001, Eggs, established 2002, Beekeepers in 2003, Vegetables 2005, and Wine 2015. Since the establishment of the Act, through to the review and now, industries have been using the Act to form committees to support and to grow their industries. It's worth noting it remains by choice of industry the option to form a committee or not. This bill does not change that. Creating industry-specific producer committees enables producers to collaborate and combine their efforts to look strategically at common goals across their industries and to pull resources and to achieve agreed outcomes, whether that be developing new markets, increasing production standards or addressing common threats such as pest and biosecurity matters. There are many agricultural industries that have chosen at this stage not to establish a committee under the Act, and this is demonstrative of their choice. If an industry does, however, want to establish a producer's committee, it's to be noted this can be a lengthy process. The Wine Producers Committee was 10 years in the making. For a committee to be established, producers in the relevant industry are polled to determine if they favour, if they are in favour of the proposal. 
Before a poll is conducted, extensive industry consultation with members of that industry is undertaken to gauge interest and support, or not. Unless 60% of the producers vote in favour of the committee being formed, the producers' committee will not be formed. The Act is flexible enough to allow a producers' committee to also be established for a specific industry in a specific area. It doesn't have to be across the whole state. There could be a mushroom producers' committee for the Great Southern, not necessarily the whole state, if that was the need and want of those producers. Producers have many ways to get to market, including at local farmers' markets. In my electorate, farmers' markets are a great community event, with direct-to-consumer fresh produce and tasty treats. They're an opportunity to meet the people that grow, make and shape our agriculture industry. In Denmark, we've got the Kurabup Community Markets, which are hosted at the Golden Hill Steiner School. They are a draw card for locals and tourists visiting town as are the Boyup and Districts Farmers Markets, the Manjimup Farmers Markets, the Manjimup, sorry, the Margaret River Farmers Markets, and the Bridgetown River Markets. These are often not just places to get locally grown fresh produce, but also a community event where locals catch up, stock up, and keep up with new small and large businesses in their own communities. The work of producer committees is broad, and services can include, among other things, research activities, paying compensation, promotional activities, education programs relating to production of produce, developing and expanding markets, accreditation schemes, biosecurity activities, and supporting the specific needs of industry. Where a committee is identified, in consultation with its industry's producers, of course, and services to be provided are agreed upon, the committee can propose a fee-for-service charge to be collected from producers. As someone that comes from a communications background, I'm also excited about the opportunities that will be available for non-producers to be appointed to committees as part of the key amendments to the Act. This means committees can have a blend of producer and non-producer members. Producers will always have the majority on the committee and non-producers won't have voting rights. But it means committees will be empowered, if they so choose, to have specialist non-producer knowledge and skill sets on their team. I'd like to offer a huge thanks to the producers and farmers across my electorate. Of the food that makes its way to your plates, lunch boxes, picnics, and the wine, juice, beer, and ciders that you sup over dinner with your friends, much of it will come from Warren Blackwood. I'm telling you. It's likely the avocado in your smashed avo, Minister Templeman, came from my electorate, possibly from the West Manjimup Premium Avocados paddock to plate producer that supply directly and deliver across, across Warren Blackwood via their active Facebook page. The fruit in your kids' lunch boxes probably came from my electorate too. Warren Blackwood, as we've heard today, is home to the WA Apple Breeding Program. It's where the world famous Pink Lady and Bravo apples come from, which I know is a favourite of the acting Madam Speaker. And the wine you share with friends over dinner is also probably from my electorate, from, from sustainable wines organically farmed at Voyager Estate in Margaret River, to the beautifully handcrafted wines at family winery Mumbaki Wines in Kentdale. We also have traditional European cider from the Denmark Heritage Cider Company, to boutique beverages from the cidery in Bridgetown. Our wine list in the dining room is also flush with beverages from my electorate, and the parliamentary wines are also from the region. You were able to give us the list of your electorate. Oh, go on then. A wine from a bottle of blackberry nip. Did you? Oh. Talking about the historic nature of blackberry nip. Could well have been. <laughs> could well have been the berry farm. You may have to bring some in so we could share. I like a bit of blackberry nip. I wouldn't mind trying it. 
To all the producers in my electorate, I offer a thank you for doing what you do and doing it passionately. And of course, for being hospitable and willing to share your knowledge and passion for the industry with me as the member for Warren Blackwood. I commend this bill to the House and remind all members and their guests to enjoy the Manjimup chips served in the dining room. And I invite you to visit my electorate and to try, taste and buy local agricultural produce. It's truly second to none in our state. Thank you. Member for Swan Hill. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, I rise to uh, speak to the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill, which I really didn't intend to. Um, but uh, when I started to do my, <laughs> do my, <laughs> well, firstly, I, I did attend a very interesting briefing where uh, I was, I'm sure, extremely annoying for the <laughs> for the uh, policy advisers because um, I kept asking incessant questions. But um, the more I got into this bill, the, m the more fascinating um, I found it, and then the more relevant I discovered it was to uh, to my electorate, and that really has been quite. It turns out um, almost half of the committees have my constituents on them <laughs> and uh, from all sorts of, uh, of these different um, industries. And so, and I engage with these folk um, as part of the ordinary course of business as being a member and obviously the industry organisations that they are part of and the local uh, organisations, but I wasn't aware that uh, many of my constituents sit on the committees and certainly not aware of the capacity that the Agricultural Produce Commission has um, to... Uh, uh, to do its role currently, and then uh, the further changes and the, the enhanced capacity that they will have once and if um, these changes are successfully shepherded through the uh, through the House. Um, so I'll just speak briefly to the legislation itself, and then why it's so important to uh, to the community of uh, of Swan Hills. Um, at the current point in time. Um, the Act uh, is, um, uh, provides a mechanism where producers, that producers can choose to access to establish uh, industry committees and uh, the Act empowers the producers to direct the growth of their own industries by, by combining efforts and resources and, and that's really great and I do think it's actually quite an interesting um, aspect of the agricultural sector that they are able to come together even when notionally they're in competition and form these organisations and form these committees Committees where, where they perceive mutual interest, they're able to work together, direct their resources. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. And I think there's lessons that could probably be learned right the way across the economy um, on uh, that, the, these types of models. Um, there is a real focus in the current Act on collaboration, consultation, uh, majority supported outcomes, and the committees can work together to develop new markets, increase production standards, and, and address common threats. So uh, it is a, you know, it's a very useful um, uh, uh, Act. It creates, obviously, the Agricultural Produce Commission, um, which uh, is a secretariat, if you like, to, uh, to support the committees and to enable the committees to provide services. So um, it can... It, it establishes the committees, it appoints members to the committees, um, has advertising requirements, and con it conducts polls of the industries to see if they want to form a committee, can dissolve them, hopefully that doesn't happen too often. Um, it provides a whole heap of services and, and really directs, coordinates and supervises the funding and expenditure of committees. And if you have a look through the website, which I did do, um, you can see the annual reports are there and there's uh, reporting mechanisms about what the activities of each of the committees has been. And, uh, and it is really quite an interesting read. Um, other members have noted the, uh, the committees that currently exist for avocados, Carnarvon bananas, wouldn't want to say that too quickly, um, <laughs> um, beekeepers, uh, eggs, poms, citrus and stone fruit, pork, potatoes, strawberries, table grapes, vegetables and wine. And uh, the, these uh, Groups come together to be the voice of their industry, identify those opportunities and, and develop strategic plans. Very often uh, they'll work with other industry bodies, peak industry organisations, to sponsor research projects or marketing activities. So these committees are, are great and um, uh, you know, do do some fabulous work. 
Um, they have, as I say, funded industry bodies to do certain things. They undertake biosecurity activities. They basically are supporting the very specific needs of the industry. And as industry participants themselves, and the committees are all uh, constituted by uh, people who are producers in the sector, they're really well positioned to understand and identify exactly what those needs are. So uh, they're, they're very, very good things. So the purpose of this bill, this bill is going to improve the effectiveness of the APC mechanism for the provision of funding services by agricultural producers for agricultural producers. And that's a, a really important point to appreciate. It's going to do this by, by strengthening and clarifying governance and compliance frameworks, modernising the language of the Act, introducing flexibility in committee numbers, um, permitting non-producer committee membership so that specific expertise can be used where advantageous. That's a really interesting part, and we spent a bit of time in the briefing talking about that, that you know, the committee membership does need to be producers, but it is very helpful if they're able to co-opt in specific expertise for, be it animal nutrition in order to improve pork production standards or how to most effectively address bugs or you know biosecurity mechanisms and mealy bugs and look they they exist <laughs> And, uh, and look, it's you know to get that expertise, be able to draft that expertise onto your committees. I think is going to be a really, really fantastic uh, improvement. Um, uh, you know, producers can choose to access these mechanisms if they wish, and uh, by creating a producers committee for their industry, producers can combine their efforts and resources, working together for their industry, whether it's through um, identifying new industries, new markets, production standards, or addressing common threats. So the bill is very good, and I want to move on to why it is directly relevant to my electorate, because as I say, it does turn out that uh, my uh, constituents have a, a, a real interest in it. What people, I mean, I'm a metropolitan region member of parliament, but the and a lot of people think I just represent Ellenbrook, which is a very, uh, very suburban area and, you know, 100 square metre blocks and incredibly dense urban development. I do represent that community. I'm very fond of it. And uh, But what's often unappreciated, probably about two-thirds of my electors live in Ellenbrook, but then the other 1,380 square kilometres of my electorate um, encompasses uh, these rural and agricultural communities. So I've got the Swan Valley in my electorate. Um, it extends all the way up through Bullsbrook to Lower Chittering and then all the way out through Gidjiganup, um, out to Morangup and then through the hills, through through Sawyers Valley, out to um, Chidlow, Mount Helena, Brigadoon, um, Mal Malling. Um, so sorry if I've forgotten any of the little townships that I do represent, but these townships uh, are, have for many, many years now um, often revolved around the agricultural uh, uh, industries that surround them. And it's therefore no surprise to find that uh, in the APC committee structures, there are many of my constituents who are currently members. So for example, on the Strawberry Committee, um, Jamie Michael is a member, and he uh, has a strawberry farm in Bullsbrook, and uh, they've sort of had to pivot their model to, to pick your own strawberries. They invite families to come up and pick their own strawberries. There's a lupin factory in the middle of um, in the middle of the strawberry farms in um, in Bullsbrook, and in fact, I visited uh, the, that lupin factory with the member for Bicton um, to talk about the export and identifying markets for uh, export agricultural products. And uh, I, I, who'd have thought? that key export industries or agricultural exports would be a very material issue in my own electorate. And I do know as well, actually, Member for Wanneroo, you might be interested to know that a couple, I think the committee is actually chaired by uh, a Wanneroo strawberry uh, farm operator. So um, you've got uh, constituents with a real interest in this bill as well. And I know uh, yourself, you also have a very agricultural based uh, electorate out there in Wanneroo. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so the strawberry pickers have a real interest. The strawberry committee has members from the seat of Swan Hills. 
So the, that committee has been very focused on marketing the fruit and improving fruit quality and so doing some great work. The pork committee, um, Peter Spackman from Craig Moston Group, um, Lindley Valley Pork has their abattoir facility in Wurraloo, which is in my lecturate. And um, uh, I actually do quite frequently visit uh, Lindley Valley Pork. Once I did go through the whole process, um, uh, which was uh, a real eye-opening experience. I accompanied the Minister for Agriculture, the Honourable Alana McTin, and to the facility. Um, um, and, uh, and I do think it's very important that we understand where our food comes from. And much as it was a confronting experience to go from the very, right the way through the process, nonetheless it gave me a far deeper appreciation and understanding of the, the pork production process. Um, and actually, I think, particularly where Lindley Valley Pork is concerned, the, the lengths they go to to ensure that their process is as humane as possible, imposing as little stress as possible um, on, on the animals. And, uh, and look, it's, it's been, um, it was a very educational process. But so Lindley Valley Pork and the Pork Committee, very material to, uh, to the people of Swan Hills. Now, it's been interesting um, speaking to uh, uh, Lindley Valley Pork about the challenges that they faced in COVID and indeed also the strawberry farmers, I'm aware, have had some real challenges faced by COVID and looking into responses is potentially a function that these committees could perform as part of their research programs. So um, obviously, as we looked first, particularly at the very beginning of COVID, um, food supply continuity was a real issue, ensuring that we had access to food and in particularly in the abattoir industry, um, at one point there were real concerns about whether you could staff the abattoirs and, and keep our food produ being produced. Similarly, the strawberry farmers, they cannot, uh, they're struggling to get backpackers percent of their labour for the um, uh, harvesting season are backpackers. So with the closing of the borders, they're experiencing some real staffing issues. So, um, so yeah, so some real challenges there for the, the pork producers and the strawberry growers. Now, look, probably the most significant committee, though, um, is, uh, is our wine, uh, well, one of them is the winemakers. Uh, the winemakers uh, committee, there is a uh, member on the wine um, uh, committee, Cliff, uh, Garth Cliff, who has uh, been quite a fierce advocate actually for the uh, Swan Valley winemakers. Um, the winemakers committee um, undertake two functions that are very relevant to the seat of Swan Hills. Firstly, they sponsor the Perth Hills Vineyards Association Awards, and I'm representing the Minister for Tourism at that um, uh, in, the, in the very near future, which I'm very... Uh, you you, pun, you uh, asked me to represent you, and I willingly accepted, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Perth Hills Vignerons Association Wine Awards. You're very happy to. Uh, you're very welcome to be my plus one if you uh, <laughs> if you'd like. It's a great night. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a great night, and uh, and the Perth Hills uh, the the uh, winemakers committee sponsor or provide funding to that event. Um, they also have helped the Perth Hills winemakers um, expand their social media presence, update their website. So some really good work there um, in the Swan Valley as well uh, for the Swan Valley wine region. That committee have funded co uh, marketing activities in order to promote the Swan the Swan uh, Valley as a uh, as a fabulous the well wine region that it is. And in fact, I will say, um, Western Australia's oldest wine region and the only wine region in Australia located in the metropolitan area. And I understand one of the only wine regions in a metropolitan area in the world that can be reached along a river. So generating beautiful tourism opportunities as well into the Swan Valley. And, uh, and certainly uh, the winemakers, I do meet with the Swan Valley Winemakers Association very uh, frequently. And uh, always happy to assist them in uh, in their big ambitions for creating a premier uh, tourism attraction in the Swan Valley. Um, Madam Speaker, may I have, or Acting Speaker, may I have an extension of time to speak, please? An extension granted. Okay, so the next, so probably the most important uh, or the most significant committee in terms of representation um, on uh, for the seat of Swan Hills is the Great Growers Committee, and that is actually that was the first committee established um, under the APC Act um, in nine, back in 1991. Three quarters of its membership are from the Swan Valley, so it's chaired by a, a Swan Valley table grape grower, and as I say, three quarters of its membership uh, is drawn from the Swan Valley. Fifty percent. 
50% of our grapes grown in the Swan Valley are table grapes, 50% are wine uh, grapes. Um, so we really do have a, a, a significant stake in table growing. And in fact, Western Australia produces 5% of, uh, of the nation's table grapes. So, you know, we really do have a stake in the work of this committee. Um, and uh, the, the committee itself um, undertakes marketing, promotion and inspection uh, activities. There is one thing I do want to emphasise that is of concern to the grape growers, and I think it would be, again, perhaps a, a research initiative that uh, the APC could consider, and certainly that I've been advocating for, and that is about uh, the management of rainbow lorikeets, which are a pest that is increasingly threatening the viability of not only the table grape industry, but also the wine grape industry in my electorate. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kevin Peterson, who's the president of the Swan Valley Grape Growers Association for raising this issue. I'd like to thank Razor Nino for hosting me on his property to show me the extent of the problem, along with Councillor David Lucas, who's the Deputy Mayor of the City of Swan. His advocacy to me on this has been, has been fabulous, and we went out and had a look at the impact that these um, rainbow lorikeets are having. Now, um, the Swan Valley Grape Growers Association tell me that this year they've had 50% loss of crops in comparison to the same time last year on account of the rainbow lorikeet problem. And this is despite the attempts of grape growers to use their net vines, to use gas guns to scare off the birds, the employment of um, professional shooters to cull the birds, and uh, experimentation with falconry and drone technology to try and move the birds on from the Swan Valley. So um, they really are facing a very very significant issue out in the um, in the Swan Valley. I am aware that Operation Rainbow Roost has existed, and that's been aimed at identifying where these um, these birds are roosting, and uh, that's great. We, I think we have a far more complete picture. But to give members an understanding of the extent of the problem, it was probably in the 1960s when the first 10 rainbow lorikeets were, were released into the wild by, I would say, negligent um, uh, lorikeet owners. There are now 40,000 of these things, um, and they're very beautiful. There's no two ways about that, but they are destroying um, uh, our grape industry, and um, they are not just affecting the grape growers in the Swan Valley, but the orchardists up into the Perth Hills as well are seeing their crops being damaged, and I'm sure that that's the case right the way across uh, the agricultural regions contained in the metropolitan area. They also threaten a whole range of, uh, of birds, of, of, of endemic native Western Australian bird species. They're, they're, no, that's right, quite right. They're not, they're not native member. Um, they, uh, they are affecting the red-capped parrot, the western rosella, the Australian ringnet, and the carnaby's black cockatoo, which is such an iconic bird for, for the Perth Hills in particular. They spread diseases. They're aggressive little things. They, they turf other birds out of their nests, and, um, and they are spreading further and further and further afield. They will, in a day, roam up to 50 kilometres away from home. Their primary nesting sites are um, on the coast, um, and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go out for the day to the Swan Valley for lunch, which we all love to do. <laughs> and I really, you know, part of me doesn't blame them for this, but, uh, <laughs> you know, and I'd, I'd like to encourage more of it, but just, but just not the rainbow lorikeets. So so, um, so look, it, it is a, it's a significant uh, problem in my electorate. Now, I have uh, continued to advocate to the Minister for Agriculture's office on this issue, um, and, uh, and I uh, am aware that uh, the, uh, there is a real appetite to initiate a pest parrot strategy for Western Australia, and I understand that part of, um, part of that strategy will involve uh, some form of stakeholder uh, consultation process. Uh, the objective the objectives of the strategy would be to uh, develop a collaborative framework for managing pest parrots in Western Australia and then identifying what the roles and responsibilities are um, for, so that stakeholders can, can address this issue. And uh, I've asked the Minister's office if I can be kept updated as that strategy develops and indeed I'll be engaging with my constituents that have an interest in this to keep them updated as it progresses and particularly um, uh, if and when those consultation processes begin. Now, 
probably, I would say, ubiquitous across all of the uh, agricultural industry stakeholders that I, uh, that I engage with, they are all addressing a significant threat, and that is climate change. And I think uh, it's, it's important that we, that we address that. Um, my grape growers and my winemakers, access to the water in the Swan Valley in the face of a drying climate. Um, at the moment, uh, we've just had an absolutely del a deluge of rain into the Swan Valley, and I know I was only at Upper Reach Winery the other day, and, uh, and I've been watching Laura's Facebook posts since Great Winery, beautiful wines, but their um, parts of their vineyard have been completely taken out by flooding um, of the Swan Valley, and they're now trying to, you know, repair their um, their trestles and, and get rid of all the detritus that is littered throughout their their vineyards. Luckily, um, the vines are dormant at the moment, um, so it has had happened at a good time, if there's ever a good time for this stuff to happen, but it has significantly um, affected uh, the, the wine growers, and I'm, I have no doubt that other grape growers and winemakers in the area have been, um, have been affected. Of course, the other issue is smoke taint. And, uh, you know, when you have bushfires, as we have done horrifically uh, in Wooroloo, um, smoke taint for grapes can become an issue. And even um, hazard reduction burns can have a smoke taint implication for winemakers. And I know that that is an issue that it would be front of mind um, to my constituents. And indeed, again, is how we address smoke taint um, could be one of the uh, issues that is addressed uh, by uh, one of these committees. So our farmers, they're, they're on the front line. They're living the impacts of, um, of climate change. It is directly affecting their livelihoods. It affects all of us, and, and that goes without saying, but these guys are on the front line, and um, they do understand the impacts of climate change in a way that many of us, I think, don't, and an ever-growing proportion of farmers are um, embracing the responsibility they have and the custodianship they have of the land they operate on and want to see serious action on climate change. And in fact, if you, if you drive up 2J Road through my electorate, um, just before you reach Gijiganup on the left-hand side, there's a big sign there on the front of the farm, on the front of a farm that says Farmers for Climate Action. And it absolutely makes my heart sing when I drive past that property and I see that sign from a farmer demanding action on climate change. And indeed, if you then have a, a look at the, uh, the Farmers for Climate Action webpage, they have over 5,000 members now and they are running a campaign at the moment called Tell Barnaby Joyce Farmers Care About Climate Action. They are running a, 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 an active social media campaign because we have Australia's second biggest climate sceptical cheerleader behind Prime Minister Scott Morrison um, out there spreading all sorts of fear and misinformation about the causes, impacts and impacts of climate change and in particular the uh, misinformation about the impacts of climate mitigation. And he's scaring communities purely to shore up his own electoral position, and it's shameful. And I'm so pleased to see leadership in the farming community um, to, uh, uh, that, um, uh, to say, no, we do. We demand action on climate change. Now, climate change is the issue uh, that I basically chose to uh, leave my career in the energy sector um, for. I, I decided, uh, having had a decade-long uh, career in the energy industry, that we needed to take more direct direct action on climate change, and the best way to do that was to get involved in politics. So I changed my career for this issue. And uh, a couple of years ago, I went to Harvard, and in fact, the, the, the Minister for Mines and Petroleum was there, and uh, he was in the classroom next door. And uh, uh, we were both at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I took the program on energy and climate change policy. And uh, the first half of the course was on the science of climate change, and the second was on policy responses at both the national, subnational, local government level, and right around the world. And there were all sorts of really fascinating people on that course 
course. The, the climate change chief advisor for Number 10 Downing Street was on that course. The head of global relations for BP was on that course. The WWF was represented. The Ghanais Environment Minister was on that course. There was people from um, the Californian state government. There were health industry advocates there. All sorts of... Uh, there was even a, a, a water supply specialist from the Middle East because the country that she was from was grappling with, well, where do we get our water from? We are running out of water. So this amazing group of people that I had the great privilege to, to learn from, and all of them said to me, what's wrong with you in Australia? What's wrong with you? And, you know, because everybody looking from afar can see that we are disproportionately suffering the, uh, the effects of climate change, that we are the best positioned to develop responses, but that we are stymied completely in uh, any sort of meaningful uh, debate and leadership at the national level on climate change. And I had to keep apologising and saying, mate, it's the federal government. At the state level, we're taking this seriously and we understand the challenges. And I think that the awareness in the community of the need to do that has been brought home uh, very clearly with the publication of the most recent IPCC report. And it specifically discussed Australia and, uh, and found that uh, we're experiencing widespread rapid climate change that hasn't been seen for thousands of years and we may warm by four degrees centigrade or more this century. And uh, the report warned of unprecedented increases in climate extremes such as bushfires, floods and drought. Now this is the sixth report um, produced by the IPCC since it was founded in 1988 and it really does give a very clear picture of how climate change is going to play out for us and the picture isn't pretty. Even um, under a moderate emission scenario, the, the global effects of climate change are going to worsen significantly over the coming years, as identified in this report. And Australia, without doubt, in this report is identified as warming. We have warmed, uh, the IPCs found, by about 1.4 degrees since 1910. And it is driving a significantly, uh, significant increase in the intensity and frequency of extremely hot temperatures in Australia, as well as a decrease in almost all cold extremes. The IPCC had high confidence that recent extreme heat events in Australia were made more likely or severe due to human influence. It identified a range of events, including the summer of 2012-13, known as the Angry Summer, where more than 70% of Australia experienced extreme temperatures. Um, it noted the Brisbane heat wave in 2014, the extreme heat preceding the 2018 Queensland fires, the heat leading into the Black Summer bushfires of 1920, and my electorate, more than any other in the last year, has experienced the impacts of a drying climate horrifically through the Wurraloo bushfires. It is a material, pressing and ever-present risk to the people in my electorate and we are on the front line of the impacts of climate change and it is no longer an abstract issue. It is affecting our lived experience every summer and as I say it is confronting my farmers all year round and we must do something to address it. The IPCC says that as the planet warms, future heat waves in Australia are going to be hotter and last longer. Cold extremes will be co uh, less frequent and less intense. Um, Western Australia, the southwest of Western Australia, our part of the world, is identified as a globally notable hotspot for drying. And this drying is projected to continue as emissions rise and the climate warms. We in Western Australia, Australia is disproportionately exposed and we in Western Australia are disproportionately exposed and the most disproportionately exposed part of Western Australia is our home the southwest of Western Australia, and we have to, we have to do something about it. I, um, look, we, we have to take climate action, and, and I do want to, to uh, acknowledge the work of, of the McGowan government, and particularly Minister for Energy, um, the Energy Transformation Strategy. I think moving our energy economy towards a, a far more sustainable uh, energy model um, is, a, is a wonderful step forward. It doesn't only make sense financially, but from a carbon mitigation perspective, it makes all sorts of sense. And, uh, and I want to uh, say how what a great initiative that is.
I also want to acknowledge the work of the Minister for Water. I think the narrative of the Minister for Water over the last four years, he brought climate change into pretty much every communication that was put out by the Water Corporation. It stops being something that's abstract and irrelevant and starts being part of our everyday narrative. It starts to be something we are consciously thinking about every time we turn our tap on. And the Minister for Water led that, and he was very proactive on climate change, and I'd really like to, um, to acknowledge him. And also, uh, obviously, Minister Dawson in the last term of Parliament um, led the development of our climate change policy. And so real leadership at the state government um, uh, level. And I must say I was very heartened by uh, the recent comments from the Premier as, um, as reported in the West a couple of days ago, where he certainly, while he doesn't want to preempt any decisions that the Cabinet might uh, take around climate change, he is open to a conversation about the, the legislation, uh, legislative targets and at a state level, and noted that everywhere else. Everyone else is doing it. Everyone else seems to be able to wrap their heads around it and actually, again, regrets the lack of leadership at the federal government level. Because at the end of the day, we do need a national coordinated uh, approach. We need national leadership. So, so, look, I really hope that the IPCC report prompts action on climate change. I want to acknowledge the great work being done by the McGowan Labor government in, in the space. And I certainly look forward to hearing more about it, because it's so important to the electors of Swan Hills, to the people of Western Australia and more broadly to the Australian nation. <laughs> Member for Wanneroo. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. I too rise to make a contribution to the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021. And, um, Mem members, um, as many of you know who have spoken so far and have done your research, this bill has certainly has been a long time coming, and I commend the Minister for Agriculture, the Honourable Alana McTiernan, for bringing it to this place. Um, members, the Horticultural Produce Commission Act 1988 established the Commission on a statutory, as a statutory authority with the primary function of establishing producers' committees. This Act was amended to become the Agricultural Produce Commission Act in 2000. The amendments now proposed will modernise the Act, improve, improving service and responsiveness to agricultural industries that already use and those that might in future use the Act. The amendments emerged from a comprehensive review of the Act in 2006. That review took place some 15 years ago. The 11 existing APC committees covering 13 horticultural industries use the Act to provide various services. Over the years, producers' committees for agricultural produce has allowed and encouraged producers to undertake assessments of their industries and to work together for individual and greater industry good. There's no doubt about it that more people and more, uh, more um, players in the industry want to get involved. Essentially, we've waited 16 years for this review back in 2006 to be enacted. Now, a number of ministers have had a go at this, and it's not surprisingly to us on the Labor side that the Honourable Alana McTiernan has got it done. Okay. Um, members, in preparation for this speech, I have read through the hand-side of, of uh, this bill's passage through the Legislative Council, and I have to say, if we thought the bunch in the opposite, in this chamber, were uninspiring, or sometimes I call them incompetent. There's a whole different level going up on up there, and I suggest you read the hand side of the passage of the bill in, in the other up, up place. Um, I just wanted to take up the member for Rowe, um, uh, just on uh, in his speech, and he, he harboured the point point in regards to the um, disappointment that the amendment. Um, in the other place regarding the uh, not having an opt-out clause for the broad acre cropping um, uh, industry. Um, I don't propose to be an expert, but it seems to me we've got a bunch of committees at the moment who are doing very, very well under the existing Act, and the proposed amendment um, in the other place by the opposition to put the um, opt-out clause in would actually impact on all those committees who are actually successful, successfully operating right now. So it was actually the minister's um, view that it would best be served that, it, that we do it 
by way of regulation. Now, I can't explain it as well as the Honourable Alana McTina does, but I would just like to read from uh, the Hansard as she explained why um, she and the government have chosen to deal with the issue that the opposition keep raising in terms of regulations. We are very keen, when possible, to accommodate legitimate concerns that are raised by members, but I simply cannot, as a matter of principle, accept this amendment. In a way, this is a case of the tail wagging the dog. When this, um, it is very clear that a number of the most active and successful existing committees and various members have highlighted those, and, and uh, the member for Swan Hills um, very uh, well explained the successful workings of some of the committees. It is very clear that a number of the most active and successful existing committees are very strongly opposed to the introduction of an opt-out clause into their existing provisions. That comes from the producers of vegetables, palm and wine, who between them collect approximately 50 per cent of the total fee-for-service funds. There is no way we are going to introduce an opt-out provision just to accommodate people, and that is the broad acre um, uh, cropping, who are not actually already in, as part of the system. So the better way, in, in the minister's view and the government's view, is that those concerns can actually be dealt with through regulations. And that's the bit that ha you didn't explain properly, uh, the member for Roe. Um, members, um, in regard to the opposition and and in terms of their uninspiring approach to this, it's been really inspiring to be in this place to hear so many Labor members representing the regions. You know, uh, the member for Geraldton's contribution to the debate, the member for Albany's contribution for the debate, to the debate, the member for Warren Blackwood's uh, contribution to the debate. It's really disappointing the lack of interest by the Liberal and National Party mm. in this place Shame. to actually debate a very important bill. Mm. And I would have thought it was an important bill for their constituents, yet they are sadly absent. Um, uh, um, you're hopeless. You're hopeless. You're, yeah. you're not even here. We're debating the issue of uh, vital importance to regional people, and you're members. not even here. You can't speak for the regions. You're not even here. You're not even here. Where are you? You're not even here. Members, you say you're a regional the member. member for Wanneroo has the call. Be part Please member. Be part continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Speaker. Uh, member for Rowe, um, you've actually just got to do the work. Mm, yeah. Uh, all, all we hear in this place is constant excuses about your performance. If it's not COVID, it's going to be electoral reform. Um, you know, just turn up, do your homework and do the work. Um, not, notwithstanding, you had a, you know, a red hot crack once you realised the bill was on. Um, but in the other place, uh, uh, it was really quite comic, comical. And I want to, I want to also, um, if I can, read from the minister's contribution in the other place because I think it's at the heart of what's at, at the problem with the, the, the opposition at the moment in terms of the Nats. National Party and the Liberal Party. Um, I thank the members for their input to the debate on the bill. This is a most interesting debate because it almost distills all the issues and problems that we have in agriculture in Western Australia, not the least of which is the blue on green war, which actually impedes any reasonable progress. Mm. Our, I was astounded that members opposite were saying this review came down in 2006, and golly gosh, why are we only now dealing with this recommendation of the review? We should look to the other side of the House. During the eight and a half years that the now opposition was in government, from 2008 to early 2017, the people who purport to represent the farmers were not able to bring a piece of legislation forward on pastoral reform because its members could not agree. Mm. Right out there in the bush, this big fight goes on between the Pastoralists and the Graziers Association and the West Australian Farmers Federation. That big fight between the PGA and the WAWF plays out time and again, and it's done, done so here uh, again today. Um, we came to government after eight and a half years of inaction. Actually, no progress was made during um, 
the previous Liberal National Party coalition. We saw zero progress. And in fact, in that regard, um, can I just you know, last night, I think I mentioned how many housing ministers there are. It's also really interesting to look back how many, how many ministers the previous um, uh, Liberal National Party had in terms of agricultural ministers as a comparison. So, it, you know, from 2008 to 2013, we had the Honourable um, Ter Terry Redman, previous member for Warren Blackwood, who I think did a reasonable job. And then from 2013 and to 2017, the wheels fell off. You had the Honourable uh, Ken Bastion for a couple of years. Then the Liberal opposition decided to give the agriculture portfolio to the Hon uh, Honourable Dean Nalder, albeit for about eight months. And then the agricultural portfolio went to the Honourable Mark William sorry, Mark Lewis, Mark Lewis, who had it uh, running up to the 2017 election. So, you know, it shows in the previous Liberal government that they really didn't care about agriculture. Mm. They didn't uh, put any priority on it, but instead they actually decimated. So we need to remember what they did uh, so that we can actually understand what we inherited back in 2017 and certainly what our current agricultural minister, the Honourable Alana McTiernan, inherited. Between 2008 and 2017, nearly 600 jobs were lost in the agricultural department, a 35 per cent cut in staff. In the same period, the department's funding from the state fell 26 per cent. The previous government also built in a further 37 per cent cut into their forward estimates. It was a reckless slash and burn approach that put the future prosperity of our agricultural industry at risk. Shame. Now, we have moved to fix it, and we all recognise in this place the current uh, agricultural minister has been on a mission to fix it. In the 1920 budget, we delivered $131.5 million in funding boosts for the Department of Primary Industries um, to deal with the fiscal cliff left by the previous government and put DPIRD back on a sustainable footing. The minister in this government has worked hard at rebuilding our state's agricultural research and development capability, and there's been a big focus of this in this government since 2017 compared to the previous one. Now, the ministers in the previous op op uh, sorry the, the ministers that I referred to in the previous Liberal National Government um, were okay, but let's see what the, the the Liberal National Opposition thought about agriculture when they went into opposition and who they put in charge. So in 2000. In 17, post-election, when you, uh, you sat in opposition after having done such an un, uninspiring job in eight and a half years of government, you gave the portfolio to the member for Geraldton, Ian Blaney. That didn't go too well, and we're all the better for it. Then the agricultural portfolio in opposition was given to the Honourable Jim Chow. I've got some wonderful um, news articles that I could uh, read. Uh, about him and what some of the uh, uh, industry uh, players think about his performance in the portfolio. Then we had the Honourable Steve Thomas. Uh, he lasted about nine months. And now, since the election, uh, the re-election of the McGowan government and the Lib National second term in opposition, we have the Honourable Colin de Grasse, um taking on the portfolio. Um, it's only been a few months, but he's still there. So, so far, um, members, the very capable um, Minister for Agriculture has seen off three shadows already. Yeah. yeah. So, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, look, um, 
it's great, it's great, it's great that I, I, I flushed them all out from wherever they're hiding to come back into the chamber. Okay. Would have been great if they'd take some notes and actually make they a, make a, they, they make, came make, into, make. They came back in to make their own member statements. They're still, they're, they're saying from oh. the members, they're not even interested in the debate. Oh, they've I only see. turned up to make their member statements. Oh, they don't care about agriculture. They've come back in. They've come back into. They've come back in to make their members' statements, and they've just confessed. Excuse they've me, confessed. members. <laughs> Member for Wanneroo. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought they were coming back to to um, listen to not my. I, I, Couldn't care. I, I, no, Couldn't I should have known better that they're actually yeah. not interested in agriculture or right. representing the regions. Right. Um, of course, they're not interested. Um, and they're just coming in here to make their quick 90-second statements and then get out for, yep. in time for lunch. I got it. I got it. Um, I got it. Um, now. You can't wait for your contribution, Member for Cottesloe. Yeah. Hang on, I've lost my... Where has he been all morning? Gee, members. Now... Gee, members. Members, one row, um has got a long and proud history of agriculture. Mm. Um, in fact, it exists really um, in terms of European settlement uh, from its very earliest beginnings um, in 1852 when the Cockmans first made uh, the first permanent settlement in Wanneroo, um, growing crops close to the lake systems that run along Wanneroo, which is really the heart of why market gardening um, was established in Wanneroo. Um, I'm very proud of the history of Wanneroo, um, and members know that I've previously spoken about the Wanneroo Ag Society, which has been going since 1909. Uh, the Ag Society, very importantly, has been supporting growers for, for 100 and I think it's 112 years now, and one of the main things that, of course, we all know and love them for is them organising and running um, the Wanneroo Show each year, which this year will be the 112th um, show. The Wanneroo Show um, showcases the produce of Wanneroo, um, and very importantly for those regional members who've spoken about their wonderful areas and the contribution to agriculture, um, outside of the Perth Royal Show, the Wanneroo Show is the second biggest show um, in our state. I'm very proud of that. No, I, I disagree with you. Um, um, <laughs> minister, a minister. I'm, go, I'm going to I have to take that on notice. That that little challenge to. to <laughs> you don't have an agricultural show down in Mandurah. I oh, know you have a crab festival. Yeah. Um, and uh, this year again, we're really looking forward to a successful show. Last year, everyone knows it was very difficult in terms of the planning, given the COVID nature of the year. Um, and a minister, a minister, I was just about to say, despite the uncertainty throughout the year in terms of planning, certainly Wanneroo was its most successful show in a very, very long time last year. And we're looking um, same as this year to be able to um, have huge crowds, not only Wanneroo locals, but uh, people throughout the northern suburbs and throughout the metropolitan and region area. And I would encourage all members um, whether you're a metropolitan member or a regional member, come and say hi at the biggest tent, which will be the Labor tent down at the Wanneroo Show. Um, although, given... Thank you. Thank you, members. In accordance with the Standing Order 61, this business is interrupted and adjourned until a later stage of this day of sitting. Uh, private members' business, 90-second statements. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. My uh, uh, state 90 second statement is on the Resilient Australian Awards 2021. On Monday, I had the pleasure of attending the 2021 Re Resilient Australian Awards alongside the Minister for Emergency Services. The Resilient, Resilient Awards celebrate and promote initiatives that build whole of community resilience to disasters and emergencies around Australia, as well as images capturing resilience in action. The awards recognise collaboration and innovative thinking across all sectors. 
The five exceptional individuals and groups have been recognised for delivering projects that build community and resilience against emergencies in Western Australia. I was very pleased to note that Bridgetown Senior High School of uh, Emergency Service Cadet Corps won the school award, and that was for their training program that equips the youth um, to be volunteers uh, in the future. Cadet, uh, uh, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, WA Colin Pettit, received the Government Award for Research into the Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Young People's Wellbeing. The Local Government Award went to the City of Fremantle for its Neighbour to Neighbour project. Nikki Woods, an outstanding photographer and volunteer firefighter, was the People's uh, Choice uh, in the Photography Award um, for the second year running. Um, it was also interesting to note that Nikki had received a high recommendation for another photo. Lastly, and, and not least uh, importantly, uh, the Emergency Animal Support Evacuation WA team uh, was recognised for ensuring the safety of animals during emergencies. Member for Thornley. I'd like to congratulate the City of Gosnells in Perth South East, which last month celebrated 60 years of being a local government. On Saturday the 1st of July in 1961, the Gosnells Road Board became the Shire of Gosnells, following the introduction of the 1960 Local Government Act. The 1960s also marked the start of significant change and population growth in the district, with market gardens, poultry farms and orchards transforming into suburbs of residential housing. As a result of rapid growth, the Shire soon became the town of Gosnells and then, in 1977, the city of Gosnells. Today, the city is the sixth largest local government by population in WA, with more than 133,000 residents and 11 suburbs. It encompasses a mix of housing, parks, commercial and industrial areas, rural areas and beautiful natural spaces like Ellisbrook Valley and Mary Carroll Park. Today, the city is home to one of the state's most cultural culturally diverse communities, with over 43% of residents born overseas, the second largest Indigenous population in Perth also called the City of Gosnells home. I'd like to offer my congratulations to the City of Gosnells and its proud community on reaching this significant milestone. And can I acknowledge in the Speaker's Gallery today the Mayor of the City of Gosnells, David Good, and his wife Jenny, Freeman of the City, former Mayor Pat Morris, and CEO Ian Cowie and his wife Sarah. Member for more. Thank you, Speaker. Today I'd like to acknowledge the outstanding work of the Cervantes Historical Society, not only in preserving the heritage of Cervantes and its surrounds, but its involvement with the Midwest chapter of the Australian Museums and Galleries Association, who would ultimately like to develop a museum trail visiting towns such as Cervantes, Dongara, Karnamar, Karu and Mora. For almost 20 years, members of the Cervantes Historical Society have been working to build a museum collection which details how this fishing town came to be. As the only official historical society in the Dandarrigan Shire, the museum collection will broaden its scope to also take in the other three towns in the Shire. The town of Cervantes was gazetted in 1963, the town named in honour of the American whaler, the Cervantes, itself named after Spanish author Miguel de Cervantes. The vessel was wrecked just offshore of Cervantes in 1844. I applaud the Historical Society's latest project, which will see them construct the monument to the whaling brig to Cervantes. As the original plans for the brig are not available, the Cervantes Historical Society have settled for a creative depiction of the Cervantes. I attended the launch of the project at Bronsard Reserve in the town recently. A concrete base has been poured to represent the vessel's 90-foot hull, and the Cervantes' three ma masts are marked by three flagpoles flying the flags of Australia, the United States and Spain. The Cervantes Med Shed will craft further items associated with the whaling brig and information science will tell the story of this ill-fated whaler. I thank and congratulate those working on this terrific project. Acting Speaker. Member for Vic Park. I am delighted to inform members about a recent McGowan government decision to invest in new infrastructure at Carson Street School in my electorate of Victoria Park. Carson Street School provides quality education programs for children living with disability aged 0 to 11 years. It is an extraordinary school with a proud tradition of innovation, excellence and care. Many Carson Street students require significant mobility assistance and many use large powered mobility aids. As such, the otherwise simple act of getting in and out of vehicles at school drop-off and pick-up can take considerable time and effort. A few months ago, I met with members of the school community who expressed to me a need for covers over existing parking bays and the adjacent walkway to protect users from the elements. 
As the member for Victoria Park, supporting our local schools is my priority. As such, I was happy to pursue this issue on behalf of the school community. It is with great pleasure that I inform members of the, that the McGowan government will invest $100,000 in Carson Street School for new purpose-built covers over the school's six existing accessible parking bays and the adjacent walkway. Construction is scheduled for the upcoming December school holidays to minimise disruption to the school community. I sincerely thank and congratulate the Minister for Education for delivering this important funding. Member for Rome. As the Shadow Minister for Sport and Recreation, I would like to acknowledge the excellent performance of the Australian Olympic team at the Tokyo Olympics. Athletes who not only exceeded all expectations, but gave the Australian sport-loving public a great morale boost during these difficult times. As the Olympics comes to a close and on the cusp of the Paralympics, I would like to thank Gina Reinhardt and the Hancock Prospecting Group for their ongoing support of our Olympic team and of sport in general. At the conclusion of the Tokyo Olympics, I have listed some of Mrs Reinhardt's contributions to sport. Mrs Reinhardt is a financial supporter of swimming, rowing, volleyball and artistic swimming and a patron of all four sports. She has been supporting swimming in WA for 29 years and has been the patron for Swimming Australia since 2012. She has also been the patron of rowing, volleyball and artistic swimming since 2016 and involved in WA artistic swimming for longer, leading to most of the artistic swim team training in WA. I note that many of Australia's medals came from both swimming and rowing. The Hancock Group advertising during the Tokyo Olympics was inspirational and I'm sure motivated many athletes to set their sights on the next Olympics or even Brisbane 2032. As Shadow Minister for Sport and Recreation, I appreciate Mrs Reinhardt's efforts to promote and encourage our Olympic athletes and after such a successful Tokyo Olympics, I'm sure the people of Australia do as well. Acting Speaker. Member for Hillary's. I wish to highlight the incredible investment the McGowan government has made to Hillary's Primary School. The community has been campaigning for over 15 years to get funding to redevelop their local school, which was built back in 1973. Like many schools built in this era, the buildings are drastically ageing. I want to thank the community for being so proactive in reaching out to me as a candidate back in July last year. I met with members of the board, PNC and parents to listen to their concerns about the conditions of the school. The principal, Trevor Mitchell, invited me to the school to inspect the facilities and I strongly agreed that there was a need for a serious upgrade. Trevor is a remarkable spokesperson for the school and is someone who truly wants the best for his students. I strongly advocated for funding to the Minister for Education, Sue Ellery, and Premier Mark McGowan. The McGowan government listened and committed $16.7 million to rebuild Hillary's primary school. This will include a new administration building, library, staff facilities, two kindies, four general learning areas with new classrooms and more parking for staff and parents. The project is expected to be completed for the start of the 2023 school year. I am so proud to be part of the McGowan team, which is committed to our children's future and putting our schools first. Thank you. Um, given the time, I will vacate the chair until the ringing of the bells. Members, uh, on behalf of uh, the member for the Pilbara, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, students here from Bainton Primary School. So it's lovely to have them in the gallery here today. Uh, are there any questions? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to reports of staff walking off site in protest of chronic staff shortages and unsafe working conditions at South Headland Hospital and ask. Can the minister explain what has led to the staff uh, leaving due to these chronic shortages and unsafe conditions? The Minister for Health. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm advised that there's a range of issues which, uh, which were 
uh, raised by healthcare workers, um, primarily uh, employees or members of the United Workers' Union regarding support services staff at Headland Hospital. Um, we have since broke, proactively reached out to United Workers' Union to discuss the situation and I want to assure the community we take all staff feedback very seriously and listen to any skirt concerns carefully and compassionately. Um, I, I think there are concerns right throughout uh, the regional health services, Madam Speaker, as they struggle with um, to attract the staff that they need, and I understand that it puts them under pressure, and it puts them under pressure at a time when they've been doing a magnificent job uh, keeping Western Australians safe during our COVID-19 experience. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, this is an issue for the WA Country Health Service to sort, and I understand they are on top of it. Supplementary question. Uh, supplementary question. Minister, isn't this just another example of your inability to properly manage your portfolio, leading to this first walk out of the Headland Hospital since 2004? Minister for Health? No. The member for Netherlands. To the McGowan Labor government's commitment to putting patients first through its significant investment in hospitals and health infrastructure through Western Australia. And I ask, can the Premier outline to the House what the McGowan Labor government's investment in a new women and babies hospital will mean for West Australian mothers and their newborns? And can the Premier advise how it is only through this government's strong financial management that this important investment can be made? Premier. Speaker, can I also welcome the students from Bainton West Primary School who are here today on behalf of the uh, member for Pilbara. Can I thank the member for Nedlands uh, for the question? And it's true, uh, this government has done more for Nedlands than any, any government in history with Bob Hall College. Bob Hall College uh, and uh, the expansion of Bob Hall College uh, and also uh, the new Women's and Babies Hospital uh, that we are building uh, in Nedlands. Uh, Madam Speaker. So uh, King Edwards has been there for more than 100 years. Uh, obviously it's, uh, it's uh, done a wonderful job over that period of time, uh, but it's, uh, it's rapidly ageing. Uh, and so we want to and will be providing a new uh, women's and babies hospital for the people of both the city and the country in this state. Uh, we committed uh, $3.3 million towards the project in the 19th 20 budget for preliminary planning. Uh, we've worked out that the preferred site uh, is at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, north of G Block, uh, just uh, near the QE2 site. Uh, and the new hospital will be Western Australia's only maternity, maternity and gynaecological uh, hospital, uh, which also includes obstetric and birthing suites, as well as a full range of specialist uh, services. Uh, it will be a centre of excellence for West Australian mothers and newborns, uh, and I would expect the best women's and babies hospital, not just in Australia, but also in the world. Yeah, yeah. It will be very impressive. Uh, we're working on uh, the designs and scope of work, uh, follow, following the detailed business case and project definition plan that are being worked through now. Uh, we expect work to get underway in 2023. Uh, we'll be declaring the hospital a strategic project under the West Australian Jobs Act to ma maximise uh, local content, and we expect it will, it will create 1,400 uh, local jobs uh, during uh, construction. Uh, we're able to do this because of good financial management over the last four and a half years. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, as you'll see in the budget, there will be $1.8 billion uh, invested uh, in this uh, project, uh, a fully funding or fully funded project uh, that will provide support for uh, families all over the state. What's great about the Women's and Babies Hospital is it just doesn't serve the metro metropolitan area. It serves women and children from all over uh, Western Australia and be in proximity to the other health services uh, on that site, obviously in Netherlands in the half of the city, uh, but near public transport and obviously accessible uh, for people uh, all over the state. The great thing is, Madam Speaker, is we've managed the finance as well, which means we're able to do this. I do note uh, that in, on the final Thursday of the election campaign, uh, when the Liberal Party released their costings, uh, which we all remember, uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the former member for Churchlands and the um, and the member for Cottesloe were yelling at uh, journalists uh, on that occasion. Uh, the uh, the Liberal Party, as part of their costings, allocated three million dollars towards this project, uh, Madam Speaker. So uh, we've allocated 1.8 billion. That's because we managed the finance as well, uh, and we're able to set the state up for the future, which, which is what this project is. 
the member for North West Central. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Tourism. Minister, I refer to the latest report by Tourism WA on uh, vitalisation, uh, visitation, sorry, to Western Australia overview year ending March 2021, which showed WA Tourism had lost $3.3 billion and declined by 39 per cent since the onset of COVID-19. And the recent business survey conducted by Tourism Council WA that reveals almost one in three tourism businesses have reported they will run out of cash reserves in six months and face closure due to COVID-19 related restrictions, both here in WA and interstate. And I ask, one, will your government provide further relief this financial year from fees collected from tourism related businesses, which are significantly impacted by these restrictions and if not, why not? I thank the, uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, and, uh, sorry, know, I haven't given you the call um, yet, Minister for uh, Tourism. Uh, Minister if, if for Tourism, I haven't given you the call yet because I was just waiting for the other people who wanted to answer the question to uh, be quiet. Um, Minister for Tourism. Uh, our government has, uh, of course, great sympathy, sympathy for any businesses that are affected by uh, COVID-19. But where else would you be in Australia than Western Australia? Exactly. The simple fact is this. The simple fact is this. Uh, the uh, uh, sad, uh, sad failures uh, that we see uh, over in the eastern seaboard, particularly in New South Wales, uh, uh, is a stark uh, example of what happens when you don't act swiftly, when you don't respond quickly as this government has consistently done since the COVID-19 situation faced the nation. And it is very interesting, it is very interesting to see that uh, we have uh, now uh, not only the most robust economy in uh, Australia, but also in the nation, consumer confidence at some of its highest levels ever. And we have uh, un uh, unemployment rates, again, uh, low, uh, unlike other uh, parts of the nation, and we have people uh, in Western Australia currently, because of the strong border policy of this government and this Premier, uh, seeing Western Australians able to move throughout the state, able to experience the magnificent tourism opportunities and tourism uh, uh, um, uh, 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 offers throughout the state of Western Australia. And they have done that in their Thousands. Western Australians are travelling more and more since the Wander Out Yonder campaign that was launched last year. We have seen now Western Australians exploring places that many of them have never been to. Many of them never been to. And we know that there are uh, a number of uh, businesses, be they accommodation providers, be they uh, tourism experiences, uh, that of course have seen numbers uh, unlike any other in the past. We know that when borders are uh, have to be closed. Of course, that impacts on inbound, uh, inbound visitors from the eastern states. We recognise that. And one of the places that particularly is impacted by that member, as you may be aware, is indeed Perth City itself. And so our hotels in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Perth in particular, particularly midweek, have been impacted. So this government has responded consistently, talking to the industry, talking to the sector, and responding when necessary. And look, there's a whole range, a whole list of initiatives that this government has put in place and responded to to assist and support when there are there are there are uh, uh, troughs in some parts of the market. But goodness gracious me, look across to the border. Look at New South Wales, and if you're a tourism operator in New South Wales, you can't do anything. You can't do anything at all. Nothing. And yet we know that in Western Australia there are businesses that are uh, doing, doing well. And those that are not have been supported by campaigns in the northwest, uh, campaigns supporting uh, uh, um, air, t air ticket uh, subsidies, uh, campaigns for experience subsidies in the Kimberley. Uh, experiences uh, with the, uh, uh, the Look and Rebook uh, campaign, which was launched specifically to backfill uh, uh, accommodation uh, uh, cancellations from, the, north, uh, from the, uh, the eastern seaboard. The government is responding consistently to these things, and we will keep on doing that. In Kalbarri, 
uh, uh, the, we, we launched a campaign to uh, ensure that people are reminded that Calberry is now open for business. And we've got also a campaign that they will support people uh, to uh, allow some subsidies for experiences there. The government is responding consistently to the market. But remember this, we are in the best position than any other state and territory in Australia. And it gives us an opportunity to sell the state to our own population as we are doing, and they are responding in their, in their hundreds of thousands and getting out into the industries. But it also allows us to ensure that when we are able to open the borders safely, obviously to interstate and then uh, to international uh, visitation, we will have uh, we will be a place of uh, a destination for many of those people because we know we have a whole suite of experiences, landscapes, cultural and arts experiences to share with the rest of the world when we're able to open. The problem with you, Member, is you keep talking down the state. You keep talking down the state. And it's what you and it's what you and your dwindled members on the other side consistently do. This state is the safest in the nation and one of the safest places in the world. We'll keep on honing our story for when we can welcome visitors back from the eastern states and overseas, but we'll also keep encouraging Western Australians to travel within their own state. They're doing that, and I want them to keep on, uh, while they're doing that, to purchase uh, experiences while they're in those, uh, those places so that they support the tourism industry going forward. You keep talking down the state, and I tell you what, it does you a great disservice and it certainly doesn't instil confidence in people who need confidence in, in how well Western Australia is doing. The yeah, supplementary question to the Minister for North West Central. Minister, member for if, North West Central. Minister, if your government will not agree to provide further relief to these businesses, does it mean that you're happy for them to go out of business, costing jobs, causing experienced operators to exit the industry? Well, I'll tell you what we won't do. I'll tell Minister you what we won't do. for Unlike Tourism. You, we won't stand with Clive Palmer and start attacking this uh, and, and start attacking the state no. as you have done and your people have done over the time. We won't stand with Clive Palmer. We stand against him, mate. We stand against him. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because you and your side of politics, your side of politics consistently, 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 consistently won't, won't, uh, won't I could uh, ask you to come back to the question, please, and perhaps uh, address your comments to the chair. And I'll ask the member for North West Central not to continuously interject. I think you've made your point by way of interjection, and perhaps we can just hear the remainder of uh, the rather brief answer that you're about to give. We'll make sure, Madam Speaker, can I assure you of this? We'll make sure that our border policy is the strongest in the nation, that it protects Western Australians, it protects businesses in Western Australia so that they actually can continue to do business. And many of them are doing very, very well in business because of that strong, strong border policy. But we won't be a puppet to Clive Palmer like the member for North West Coastal. We won't be a puppet to Palmer like he is, nor him and the National Party. We'll keep the state safe. We'll keep the state safe. And I tell you what, I'd rather be here in Western Australia than because we've seen what happens when you don't act swiftly and you don't do things in, in support and ensure the safety and well-being of your own state's population. The member for Chandicott. Madam, Madam Speaker, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have a very important question to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to meeting the unprecedented levels of demand facing Western Australia's emergency departments. And I ask, can the minister update the House on how the McGowan Labor government's $1.9 billion investment, I repeat, $1.9 billion investment in our health systems will ease the pressure on the Western Australian emergency departments and ensure world-class care can continue to be delivered. 
Madam the, Speaker. The Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for the question. And before I do answer the member um, about this important question, Madam Speaker, I hope you'll indulge me just briefly to say uh, this morning I went as the member for Cronana and representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I attended the funeral of Mrs. Theresa Wally, uh, who'd been known to many in the parliament, Madam Absolutely. Speaker. Um, um, Mrs. Wally was uh, one of the great elders of the southwest of Western Australia, uh, a, a member of the stolen generation who went on to grow a, a huge, uh, thriving family, but also was a stalwart and a great advocate for the Noongar community. And I just wanted to put yeah, on, yeah. on the record my, my condolences to her family and thanks for her. Um, and Madam Speaker, um, it's a very important question, and we know that our emergency departments are under unprecedented pressure at the moment. And, um, and for a lot of, and for a lot of um, uh, our, our healthcare work, frontline healthcare workers, uh, they're doing it tough at the moment. Uh, we are seeing a post-COVID spike in relation to hospital demand. And although those opposite are, are, are in denial with around, around these things, Madam Speaker, I just want to quote briefly Dr Sean Stevens, the chair of the WA faculty of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, where yesterday on Channel 9 he said they, the Premier and, and Health Minister, are actually quite true. We did see a period during the pandemic where, for a range of reasons, people didn't see their GP for their regular prevention, preventative health. And it just shows the importance of having regular preventative health checks because now we are seeing some of the effects of this delayed diagnosis and treatment. And, Madam Speaker, that's the reason why we have such peaks at the moment in triage 1s and triage 2s and, to a lesser extent, triage 3s in our EDs and why our hospitals are under particular pressure. So, Madam Speaker, I'm particularly proud of the $1.9 billion commitment from the McGowan government to health care, uh, which is committed to putting patients first. And part of that plan, uh, Madam Speaker, is to assist the emergency departments and the, staffs, the staff that work there. Perth CDs will be receiving a massive $100 million funding injection as part of the upcoming state budget, which will see an additional 50 staff, full-time equivalent staff employed, including um, uh, medical, nursing, allied health and support services. It is designed to improve patient flow, reduce uh, bed block and relieve ambulance con congestion and, of course, Madam Speaker, improve health outcomes for, for WA patients. We are also pleased to announce plans uh, whilst touring the virtual emergency medicine system at Fiona Stanley Hospital uh, on Monday, which during the first month of this pilot successfully reduced ramping or diverted 25 per cent of ambulances away from EDs. This is a system which works, Madam Speaker, by having a, a tele conference call uh, with the uh, paramedics and the patient in the ambulance before they get to the ED so that they may be diverted, if, ne if possible, to ambulatory care or go straight to an, a medical imaging uh, 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 department for, uh, for diagnostic attention, uh, which of itself obviously provides a very innovative and, and clever way of reducing congestion in our EDs. A $2.3 million boost to this uh, cutting-edge system will, will be expanded to Rockingham and Peel Hospital, and we look forward to seeing it flow through to other EDs. We've also committed $4.8 billion to boost the Perth Children's Hospital Emergency Department to employ an additional 16 nurses, Madam Speaker, which will allow an additional nurse on every shift to be based in the ED waiting area to monitor patients. This $100 million package includes $61.6 million to, to mental health, including $7.9 million for child and adolescent mental health services, at the construction of two mental health emergency centres at Rockingham and Armidale hospitals, new multidisciplinary team pilots are called active recovery teams based at a range of hospitals across Perth and regional uh, hospitals, and an expansion of the adult community treatment services that support people with mental health. Uh, issues as they come out of a hospital environment. Madam Speaker, the, um, the reasons for the, uh, for the increased pressure on our hospital are multifactorial, and that's why we've brought a multifactorial response, sponsored by a $1.9 billion, $1 billion boost to healthcare services in Western Australia, and is another example, Madam Speaker, of how the McGowan government is putting patients first. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <coughs> My question is to the Minister for Energy. Minister, I refer to your response on Tuesday in question time regarding the hardship provisions offered to, by, uh, by Synergy to customers in the Swiss 
And I ask, in July, why did Horizon Power disconnect 606 re regional electricity customers, which is 20 times the rate on a per customer basis of Synergy's disconnections of 587 disconnections in the same month? This was during the coldest and wettest month of the year. Minister for Energy. So Horizon Power manages its disconnections very carefully. Because it has advanced metering infrastructure, it can disconnect and reconnect a customer instantaneously. So whilst it does uh, disconnect a higher proportion of customers, it's able to reconnect them much faster. In the southwest interconnected system, because there are not advanced metering infrastructure, they, uh, you actually have to have a physical disconnection with an electrician going from Western Power to site. In addition to that, Horizon Power also has uh, prepaid metres. They have a, a specific arrangement that was entered into during the former government that allows them to use prepaid metres. That's not available to uh, Synergy. Those prepaid metres are in uh, Indigenous communities. And uh, when a person doesn't top up their prepaid metre, that's still a disconnection. So the reason that there's a higher rate is because they have completely different systems. In the, in the southwest interconnected system, Synergy is making a deliberate effort to uh, work with customers to manage debts in a new and innovative way that I re reported it the other day. And unlike you, Member, I, I welcome Synergy's work. I don't think, as you said, that it's a, that it's a what was the word you used on radio? Uh, appalling, I think you said. Um, I can't remember the so exact word. So you should care for people in need. Uh, no, you said no, you said, said that it was appalling that the government the wasn't sum sending was debt collectors in to collect this money. Said you should no, help people you, in need. You can't have this both ways. 82.6 per cent increase in disconnections during the period of the last government. Uh, and attacking us for being reasonable in the way that Synergy behaves in its disconnections uh, procedures. You can't have this both ways. You have to choose one side of the street to walk on. You can't, uh, you can't continue to behave in this irresponsible manner. Speaker, supplementary su question. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, given that historically and in previous months the disconnection disparity between Synergy and Horizon is around four times, how do you account for, for the, the rate of disconnection being 20 times in the month of July? July? It cannot be for the reasons that you have given. Minister well, for Energy. Well, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know the answer to the question, why don't you provide it to me? Why don't you? You're well, the minister. You know, I have provided the answer. The historic to the average is four times since the, 19. As you In know, July, it was 20 times. As you know, there was a moratorium on disconnections that expired on the 30th of June. The companies have, have uh, engaged with their local communities at my direction to make sure that uh, when disconnection practices recommenced, that they would not be done uh, to, as a surprise to any of the communities. Uh, I understand there's 563 residential customers had been disconnected in the first month of disconnections by Horizon. Uh, and it's true, that's more than uh, Synergy did. Uh, but as I say, that, that 563 by the, by the 26th of July, member, um, uh, as I say, the, there's a range of reasons for that. One of those is that, that prepaid metres were not being disconnected. So you understand what I'm saying here. Those metres, that was a system that your government introduced. I supported it when it was introduced. They put prepaid metres into Aboriginal communities. So they didn't have to pay and they kept their electricity. But once the 30th of June came... I mean, you really need to listen and not talk. This is one of your problems. You're very happy to talk and not listen. Now it's your turn to listen and not talk. Let me make... No, I was not asking a question. I'm making a point to you, and you need to listen and not talk. What I said to you was that those prepaid metres continued to provide electricity during the period of time where there was a disconnection moratorium. But those prepaid metres, after the 30th of June, could not get electricity because they did not have payments made. So they were disconnected. <clears throat> so I, I, exactly what I said to you is true. Horizon has a different set of procedures. Sure. The average disconnection period for Horizon is less than one hour. The, you cannot reconnect 
a Synergy customer in less than one day. So they are completely different practices. The member for Mirabuka. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Planning. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts to drive greater investment in our economy that supports local jobs and local businesses. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House on what this government's efforts to cut red tape and support our economic recovery through the State Development Assessment Unit has meant for local workers and local businesses? And can the Minister advise the House if she is aware of anyone who opposes these efforts to support local jobs? Thank the you. Minister for Planning. Thank you. Thank, can I thank the member for Mirabuka for that question? Of course, last year, members, we introduced a number of reforms to help deliver an economic recovery to this state. A number of reforms were implemented, including the new pathway, the new streamlined pathway. And that was aimed to create more investment certainty, to ensure that we have better design buildings and, of course, to make sure we have a pipeline of work to allow us to get out of the economic, um, the potential economic turmoil that the state had, was facing. So far, 12 appointment uh, developments have been approved, representing $375 million in total investment members, 2,000 construction and ongoing jobs. And member for South Perth, we were there at the sod turning of the first project being delivered under that new pathway out at 8 Parker Street in South Perth and the good Labor stronghold of South Perth members. It was, um, it was great to see the local um, landowners being involved in getting that project um, up and I'm so glad that we're delivering that new project. Since July, more than 70 applicants have expressed interest in accessing the pathway. Another 12 developments are now under consideration, worth more than a billion dollars and also um, thousands of new jobs. Projects that have been included include projects that have been approved include the State Football Centre in Queen's Park, Yay! Minister for Sport and Recreation, residential aged care facilities, the wharf extension at Henderson, student accommodation, multi-storey apartment buildings, and of course regional projects such as the LNG plant in Mount Magnet and a shopping centre in Dawesville. Members, this is all about making sure our economic recovery continues. Because our economic recovery doesn't stop today. It continues, members. And we need a pipeline of work, whether it be civil construction or whether it be um, business investment across the state. Now, we have the Liberal Party arguing that this new pathway should finish today, members. Nice. The Liberal Party who believes that the economic recovery needs to finish now, that we could all wipe our hands and go home, members. The economic recovery has to continue. We need to continue a pipeline of projects, a pipeline of projects throughout the state to ensure we continue job opportunities and create economic opportunities. The member for Cottesloe came in yesterday arguing for public housing members. This is the member who opposes every development, every development across the state, who opposes multi-million dollar apartments because they are 21.2 metres on the street frontage and not 21 metres, members. This is what the member for Cottesloe does. Opposes every development. Well, to develop, deliver social housing, to deliver other housing, you need construction, you need development approvals, and that's what we'll continue to do. The member argued yesterday he wants more public housing in Cottesloe. Well, member, do you still subscribe to that? Oh, whereabouts, member? Whereabouts? Whereabouts? Over the southern part of Mosman Park. Is Where about? Southern, southern, southern part of Mosman Park, Park is perfect for redevelopment. Southern, po southern part of Mosman Park. So you want additional public housing? A additional, no, additional public housing. Additional pu public housing. Well, member, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, member. I'm glad to hear that because we're implementing new housing opportunities across the state across the suburbs, and we'll be looking at continuing our economic recovery, creating jobs, and not listening to the Liberal Party. Economic vandals who <laughs> believe economic recovery has finished, members. That's what they believe. Scrap the pathway. Let's all go home. Economic recovery is finished. We know it hasn't. We need to continue to create jobs and opportunities for the entire Western Australia. Yeah. The member for Rowe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Police. 
Minister, I refer to media reports regarding Hannah John, a registered midwife currently living in South Australia, who has accepted a contract with the Kalgoorlie Health Service and has reportedly had her G to G pass application rejected three times. And I ask, Minister, do you accept it would be more effective <coughs> to have a transparent G2G assessment process which would allow essential workers like this to fill critical gaps. Uh, Madam Speaker. The Minister for Police. Oh, <coughs> extraordinary. Uh, Madam Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for his question. Uh, only this morning, Member, I uh, was meeting with the Police Commissioner and his team with respect to a, a range of issues, including Operation Tide, which is the uh, operation that supports uh, protecting our borders, defending Western Australia against COVID and uh, ensuring that we are the strongest and best place in the world for uh, people to live and for businesses to flourish. And uh, during that conversation, I, I asked the Commissioner about um, matters that had been raised in the media. Um, you would have probably heard beyond uh, Hannah's uh, story, uh, there's been a, a few call-ins to talk back where people <laughs> claim to have been uh, ringing from eastern states and you know, having difficulty with G2G. Uh, it was made very clear to me and the Commissioner were, you know, this is an operational matter. It's a police operational matter. And I've got to say, they are doing an extraordinary job. Yeah. What, what a job <laughs> our Western Australian Police Force has done over the last 18 months or so. It, is, it has been world class. Um, it's undeniable the best uh, performing work police force in the nation, poss possibly in the world, in regards to protecting us all against COVID. Uh, and the Commissioner pointed out to me that <coughs> regularly, and noting that there's been more than a, mi a, a million applications for uh, passes, uh, the vast majority of which are approved. Uh, there is an, a, a very big workload, and when they get them, they interrogate every single one of them because it's very important, it's vital for the safety of Western Australians that they inter interrogate every application. What has happened is regularly people uh, make application for G2G, the police request backing information. They request evidence. So it's one thing to, to make a claim that you're mentally unwell or you've got a job or, uh, or you're a Western Australian resident returning, uh, having been trapped in the East Coast in recent times, but you must provide evidence. And so if an individual makes an application, no matter how many times they make it, if they make it, every time it'll be assessed, but if they don't provide the necessary backing documentation, then it will be rejected. And Honestly, I've got to say, I make no apologies for that. I don't think the police should apologise for that. They are defending our state. They are keeping us safe, and they are complying with the they are complying with the chief health officer's advice. They are complying with the chief health officer's advice. So, if you are asked to provide substantiation in form of documentation, you must do it. They, there are exemptions all the time for any number of reasons around uh, uh, people having confronting difficult circumstances, or in this case, if they've got a, if they've got work and the, and uh, they've uh, got reason to come, then there are exemptions. But you must provide appropriate documentation. Supplementary question. Uh, thanks for your response, Minister. Minister, will the government consider updating the G2G pass processes to allow those West Australians who are fully vaccinated and have jobs lined up in critical sectors like health to be processed and approved in a quicker and clearer way? Madam, Minister, Madam please. Speaker, as, I, as I said, the vast majority of G2G passes are approved. And they're done, they are processed completely in accordance with the Chief Health Officer's advice. So we're not going to compromise that. That will never happen. But what I can ask, I would ask through you uh, and at every opportunity, I would ask that people who are making applications comply with the request for documentation. At attach all of the information you require. Apparently, I'm told, I'm informed by the Commissioner, very frequently people will do nothing other than to show a driver's licence. You know, they take a photo of their driver's licence and attach that to their, their application. And because they've got a Western Australian driver's licence, they, f they feel that that meets the obligation. It doesn't. You must provide necessary uh, documentation. Talk to the police officers. Seek out a conversation with the people who are assessing the application. And there are exemptions regularly. There are, the vast majority of G2G applications are approved. It is just that very frequently, apparently, 
people are not complying with some of the most basic requirements for that are set by the Chief Health Officer, not by police. They've done a wonderful job. I commend them. I congratulate the Commissioner and his team and every police officer. There's some 408 dedicated to this task. Uh, and uh, they're out there on a daily basis defending the state for all of us. The member for Kalgoorlie. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Mines. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment. Sorry, Minister Talans. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to same. It's same thing. We're doing. We're doing fantastic work in that. <laughs> yeah. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to creating regional jobs and support regional businesses by helping facilitate development of industrial land. And I ask, can the minister update the house on how this government is supporting the planning and development? of Lot 350 in Kalgoorlie, and can the Minister advise the House of anyone making misleading comments about the development of this industrial land? The Minister for Lands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thought the member for Kalgoorlie had got the disease of the opposition when they asked questions of the wrong minister, but uh, I'm no. glad you got back on track. Now, Cal like Cal Cal Kalgoorlie is obviously a mining town. It is obviously a mining town. I can understand. Oh, well, her favourite minister. Well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> So I thank, uh, I thank the member for a question. Uh, member, I'm very happy to report and advise the House that there's been some crucial steps made in the development of Lot 350 in Kalgoorlie, and thank you for the role that you played uh, since you've been elected in March, an outstanding member for Kalgoorlie. So the progress has actually been excellent. So I was actually very, very surprised with some of the comments from a trio of embattled individuals, one being the embattled member from Mining and Pastoral, the Honourable Neil Thompson, one being the embattled Kalgoorlie CEO, John Walker, and the third is the so-called missing leader of the opposition, the member for Cottesloe. So can I just give you a bit of a quick history lesson, which I know that you're aware of, but uh, just for the rest of the, uh, the chamber in what we have done to create uh, job-moving um, um, uh, opportunities in your region. So it started with the state leasing lots uh, 500 in 2017. And the Minister for Mines, I can understand why you might be confused, because he's had a role to play. And the, um, the then Minister for Lands. And, and, the minister, and then Minister for Lands, right in front of me. So collective, collective uh, responsibility here. So as you know, that, that's, uh, the Lot 3, uh, 500 is a block across the road from Lot 350. And it was for a rare earth cracking and leaching plant, which is currently awaiting environmental approvals for development, which will bring 500 regional jobs in construction and 100 ongoing local jobs. And as you would know, uh, the city of Kalgoorlie failed to get traction for a number of years, and the proposed development of Lot 350 played out over 2020 and nearly 2021 until the March election with your elevation as the new member for Kalgoorlie and the work that you put in in regards to Lot um, 350. And as we know, Energy Oz, Energy Oz now have moved uh, in regards to that project, and we visited them at that site when I'd made a visit. Um, to Lot 350 earlier, uh, a couple of months ago now, I think. So following the recent election, we have approved freehold transfer, <coughs> undertaken a business case soon to be considered by the board, granted early access to Energy Oz to do a site investigation, and co-currently preparing the stage one subdivision application. So I'm really, really surprised that on the Facebook of the Leader of the Opposition, who posts a number of, um, of photographs of, of the Liberal Party, the Leader of the Opposition of the Liberal Party, um, he has a number of photographs taken of himself and the member for Mining Pastoral, Neil Thompson, around the Goldfields outside our projects that he's canning. Like for this, this is actually Lot 3, Lot 350, Lot 350, Lot 350 uh, member for Cottesloe. Yeah, you, Lot 350. No, that's Lot 500. That's Lot 500. That's Lot 500. That's Lot 500. And then member, member for op a member of the opposition. I mean, uh, leader of the opposition. There you are. There you are with um, with the honourable Neil Thompson and the embattled mayor of uh, the embattled CEO of Kalgoorlie, John Walker. But hey, a member for Cottesloe. Member, member for.
Minister Cottesloe. Member for Cottesloe. Minister, can I just Besides, uh, Minister, can I just be clear uh, that the photos you're holding up are actually of the leader of the Liberal Party, not the leader yeah, of the sorry, opposition. The of the Liberal yep. Party. I, I keep forgetting the Liberal Party aren't the opposition party. There's only two members of this house. I keep forgetting that. It's really hard to get used to the fact that we have a sectarian, agrarian, socialist party as the leader of the opposition, as the opposition party, in West Australia. Sorry, I meant I meant the leader of the Liberal Party, the member for Cottesloe. So, as you know, as you know, um, um, member for Cottesloe, we live in a COVID COVID nineteen pandemic situation. As you also know, we are the safest jurisdiction in Australia. Why are we the safest jurisdiction in Australia? Could we have a premier, a deputy premier? We have a cabinet. We have a community that complies with the health advice of the chief health officer. We are we are a very compliant state. We comply with rules when it comes to masks. We comply with social distancing. So I want to know. So point of order. The relevance of this, this whole line of answer that we're receiving from the minister it doesn't seem to have any relevance to the question asked whatsoever. I hear and decide on the points of order, and uh, I, it's my understanding that the minister is making a rather lengthy analogy, um, which I'd ask him to draw to a conclusion and maybe wind up his answer, uh, so that we've got the opportunity for a couple more questions before Thank I you, close Speaker. question the, time. The question from the member of Kalgoorlie talked about misleading statements. And uh, in respect to misleading the public and treating the whole issue of COVID-19 compliance as a joke, the Honourable Neil Thompson has a photo downplaying and joking about not putting a mask on properly on Facebook. So, leader of the opposite, leader of leader of the Liberal Party, are you going to be like are you going to be like your leader in New South Wales, as the Premier referred to, had no backbone, who had no backbone, and is called? Disgraceful post. How can you stand there and defend a situation like that? You are a judge, you lack backbone, and you're only currently the leader of the Liberal Party. When I, do you agree with that post? 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 Say. Hey, member for Cottesloe. Member Cottesloe, do you agree with that? Do you agree with that post? Uh, thank you, Minister. I think you've made your point as well. If I can uh, ask the leader of the Liberal Party for the next question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, and I know this minister will give a proper answer. My minister, uh, my question is to the minister for police. I refer to the lack of trans. <laughs> I am extremely confident after the Clown Act we just heard. I refer to the lack of transparency. I refer to the lack of transparency in the G to G process, leaving Western Australians stranded on the East Coast who have been repeatedly denied G to G passes. Even if they are even if they are vaccinated, live and work in this state and in some cases need to return home for medical reasons. And I ask, and this is a key part to the question if you care to listen, members, will you... Uh, members, I'm not sure if you'd like question time to run for the rest of the afternoon or whether you want me to cut it short, but we are not going to be able to progress if I get incessant interjections throughout the opposition questions. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, will you introduce a transparent review process for rejected applications for G to D G passes? If not, will you provide the House with the rationale behind your unwillingness to make this change and be upfront with the WA public? Madam the Speaker. Minister for Police and the Minister for Police only, please. Madam Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for his question. Member, the G to G pass criteria are set by the Chief Health Officer. The police apply the rules as directed, as indicated and, and uh, confirmed by the Chief Health Officer. They go via a directive and they apply them. 
When we shut down a border, it's all done legally. It is all done in accordance with the process that has been established since uh, COVID was, uh, you know, first uh, confronted us all last year. There's nothing, nothing has changed other than the threat of Delta has meant that some jurisdictions have been uh, had increased threat levels uh, placed upon them, and as a consequence, our border has been hardened. I don't think that is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing that our border is hardened. I think it's a good thing that our police are rigorous in pursuing the requirements of the Chief Health Officer in protecting the state, and I refuse to even contemplate uh, contradicting that process, which has served us so well to date. What I will re repeat, though, I'll, I'll say again, and I'll ask that you convey this to anyone who uh, contacts you mistakenly thinking that that is worth doing, um, I would ask that you do this. Ask them to comply with the requests by the police for documentation, whatever they ask for in terms of justification. Because, as I am informed by the police commissioner only a couple of hours ago, it is a regular occurrence, not incredibly regular. There, most people comply. The vast majority of G2G applications are approved. Occasionally, some people are rejected, and instead of changing their application to comply with the request for information, they reapply without any change to their application. Contact the police, talk to them about what's required, read the emails that you receive or the messages you receive, and comply with the request for documentation that confirms whatever claim that you are making. And then it is very likely that you'll be given an exemption and you will be able to travel. Thank you. Supplementary question. The, uh, Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. Minister, the question was about transparency of the process. What was the rationale behind the recent decision to allow a multi-millionaire hedge fund founder who entered WA from the UK being, and I quote news.com, allowed to skip out on mandatory hotel quarantine after three days to attend his father's funeral? And, but why are ordinary Western Australians on the East Coast with the same cause being barred from returning home at all? Madam Speaker. So, um, Madam Speaker. I'm not, just before, uh, with the supplementaries, I'm not sure how many warnings I need to give you, um, but I'm, my patience is wearing thin. You, you've really introduced new material into your supplementary, which you're not supposed to do. Yeah. But I'll ask the Minister to so, respond. Uh, Madam Speaker, as you know, Member, um, the international borders is the responsibility of the federal government. And uh, the federal government allowed that individual to return to Australia. That aside, I, I, it is very disappointing that you appear to be determined to undermine our capacity to defend Western Australia against COVID. You are undermining... You, are appear, you, appear, determined, you appear determined to undermine confidence in our system, which has served us so well. Can I, can I point out, just with respect to that individual, it's an operational matter, it's controlled by the police. I wouldn't have a clue as to why that individual uh, you know, is, was managed in the way he was, but what I can confirm is he went straight back into hotel quarantine. So there is no such thing as an individual being allowed to skip out uh, I am aware in this case, because it's been in the media, that when he uh, attended the funeral, he was 40 metres away from all of his family and the people who were attended the funeral. It's, I know, it's, a, it's, it's pretty low. It's pretty low that you would choose to... That you would choose to... to uh, under, <laughs> it's pretty low that you would choose this particular matter, an individual attending his funeral. That aside... You're stopping other Western Australians doing it. Can I just thank the Minister for Police for his excellent answer? It's very clear to me. Uh, and perhaps I could ask the member for Swan Hills to move on to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence, Member for Willoughby. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a serious question. Um, my, my question without notice. <clears throat> My question without notice is to the Minister for Emergency Services, and I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to reducing the risk of bushfire to local communities across Western Australia. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on this government's significant investment in bushfire mitigation measures? And can the Minister outline to the House what this record investment means for bushfire-prone communities across WA? 
The Minister for Emergency Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I can, I can do that, uh, Member for Swan Hills. And can I um, just thank you and congratulate you for your excellent advocacy and hard work for your constituents, especially after a very tough year with the Wirralu impacting largely in your electorate. What you have done over the past few months has been extraordinary. It's been very tough, uh, and I thank you for what you've done. Um, the, uh, this gives me an opportunity, uh, Member, to explain what the government is doing in terms of bushfire mitigation, which you obviously will have a special uh, interest in. Uh, more than 90 per cent of our state members is bushfire prone, and over the past five years we have invested a record $50 million in mitigation that includes $35 million for mitigation on Crown land. Now, it's the first time that DFES has performed this important work. And we also secured $15 million for the Bushfire Risk Management Planning Program to support local governments identify and then treat bushfire risk. So our state is actually entering a new era of enhanced bushfire management the likes of which we've not seen before. Uh, and this funding is making a real difference. We are seeing more planned burning and other mitigation activities. Uh, since 2017, the McGowan government has invested $31 million of funding that, is that has been provided to 48 local governments across the state. And that's meant 4,306 potentially life and property saving bushfire mitigation treatments across more than 9,000 hectares and more than 4,700 kilometres, 4,700 kilometres of upgraded fire breaks and fire access roads to reduce the threat of disastrous bushfires. And just weeks ago, members, uh, 26 additional local governments shared a record of $7.5 million in mitigation activity funding for more than 1,100 mitigation activities in high bushfire risk areas. And this includes mechanical treatments to reduce fuel levels, uh, the creation of fire breaks and planned burns. Now, Members, we know where the uh, the party of the region, the true party of the regions, and I've got a long list of local governments, local governments that have uh, benefited from this mitigation funding, and I can go through the list. Uh, and and as I look through the list, uh, they, they they seem to be all Labor seats, but we share the responsibility across some of the few remaining non-Labor seats in our, in, the, in across the state. Uh, I can see Pilbara, I can see uh, Warren Blackwood, Collie Preston. Uh, there's Vass there, Vass. Uh, Moore, Moore is, is included, Member for Moore. You'll be glad to know that. You'll be glad to at least know the McGowan government is looking after the constituents of Moore, even if the local member isn't. Uh, so it's true to say we've done more for Moore than ever before, Member. <laughs> As I, look through, as I look through the list, the member for Roe, you're not forgotten about. We haven't, seen, we haven't said no to Roe either. Uh, uh, we're, you're all there. But this is a... Uh, but, but members, members it, has been, it has been a very difficult year. We've had uh, Wirraloo and Red Gully bushfires. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, issues that our firefighters and first responders have had to uh, attend to. Uh, our emergency services continue to work harder than they ever had be have before. They can't do it by themselves. Uh, and we can't stop every bushfire, but what we can do is reduce the impact of when that fire occurs. And as the member for uh, Swan Hills well knows, that a prepared community is a safer community. Thank you. Um, just before I give the last question, I think I saw the former member for the Kimberley, Carol Martin, walk in. But I Yes, she's here. Uh, welcome, Carol. Uh, and the last question uh, to the member for Roy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sport and Recreation. I refer to the current discussions with the AFL regarding hosting the AFL Grand Final at Optus Stadium, and I ask, can you provide an update on how these discussions are progressing, and are you undertaking proactive steps to ensure WA footy fans don't miss out on this opportunity? Madam the Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Member Perot, for your question. Uh, as you would have, um, of, course, of course, read in the papers, uh, discussions have been had. The AFL is keen, obviously, if possible, uh, as asked to be the possible destination for the finals. 
Our, as the Premier said, as the Deputy Premier said, as, as I will say, we very much hope the situation gets under control in Victoria and that the grand final judicially, which is held at the MCG, continues to be held there. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, if it is held in WA, it'd be great to see the doctors playing the grand final at the stadium. <laughs> No, I, was, I thought that was a good answer to to, to the last line. Uh, supplementary. <laughs> Minister, I can't I can't agree with that last um, section. But um, given given WA successfully hosted uh, the recent um, Dreamtime match very well, um, are you advocating for Perth to host the entire? AFL final series, series potentially. Uh, Minister. As you said, we did uh, successfully uh, um, manage the uh, Dreamtime game here. And the fact that we, the fact that we can have major games here and that we can be in the picture for AFL finals is because of the leadership of this government in controlling the COVID-19 situation. And I'll tell you one place where the finals won't be held, it's New South Wales. So it's about time you got on the phone, rather than talking to Clyde Palmer, you got on the phone to the Premier of New South Wales and tell her to come and have a look at what we do in WA. Thank you. Uh, members. Members. Leader of the House. Members. No, I'm not giving you the call. I'm asking you to. I'm calling you to order. Um, message uh, number 15 from the Legislative Council. The Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021 without amendment. On Elena Clossy. And message number 16, the Legislative Council equates the Legislative Assembly. It has agreed to the Railway BBI Rail Oz Priority Limited Agreement Bill 2021 without amendment. Uh, government business orders of the day. Madam Speaker. Leader of the I House. I move that uh, government business order of the day number two be resumed. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those in favour? Those to the contrary? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Government Business Order of the Day Number 2, Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021, Second Reading Adjourned Debate. Uh, the Member for Wanneroo. Um, I would just, uh, before I begin, may I be granted a short extension, please? Pardon? May I be granted a short extension, please? Yeah, extension granted. Sorry, I'll do that now before I forget if I, when I start. Um, yeah, just uh, just hold on two secs, member, and uh, wait till everyone settles uh, down. Minister, um, just before you leave the chamber, I've been doing a little bit of research about your uh, suggestion just before um, I, I was interrupted by uh, uh, member statements, where you suggested that the Canning Show is, yeah. is was the biggest show last year outside of the Perth yeah. Royal Show, and you said that it, you also claimed that it was the oldest show. Yeah, I yeah, so I, I, look, we, I'm going to throw some, I'm going to <laughs> throw you some new stats and, and perhaps you need to verify your information because based on some research that um, we've been doing, last year's show at Canning was its 110th. Now, I don't know what year that that equates to, but on their website they're claiming that last year's show was 110th. And whereas the Wanneroo show, last year's show, was 111th. So on that basis, uh, I... Oh. ...run every year during wars. OK. So 1892, it started as a flower show. But okay. that's the, where we date it from. All right. And, so we'll, I... and the Canning Act Society owns the showgrounds and you use council facilities. Oh, OK. And now, on that basis, you may... I might accept that the canning is the oldest show, but I guess we've been... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I don't want to give it up. And in terms of actual... Um, you, um, uh, you know, you people that came along Before. to the shows, you mentioned that 15,000 came along to the canning show last year. I have it on very good authority that over 22,000 oh. people attended the Wanneroo show last year. Mm. Yeah, including many ministers, including the Premier, uh, including um, the Agricultural Minister, who I believe has attended every single year uh, since she's become the Agricultural Minister. And again, uh, like I said before, I want to remind members this year's show is bigger and better than ever. Um, 
and will be held on, sorry, where are my dates? It's going to be held on the 19th and 20th November. Uh, come along, have some fun. Uh, the fireworks are spectacular, particularly on Friday night. Um, I want to just, before I move on from the agriculture show, do give a particular um, shout out to current president, Michael Aspinall, um, Treasurer Bev Errington, Secretary Jan Hakon, and all the committee who do such a fabulous work. Volunteers in Wanneroo community who do an incredible job in providing, um, which is the most important and, and biggest event that happens in Wanneroo. And I know Michael, the president in particular, last year uh, was a particularly challenging time to keep the hope of hosting the show alive, given the COVID circumstances that we're facing. Um, he kept it alive and as a result we had 22,000 people attending last year at the Wanneroo Show, bigger than the Canning Show, um, the biggest show <laughs> outside of the Perth Royal Show. Members, um, I just wanted to uh, touch briefly on Wanneroo now in terms of agriculture. We know Wanneroo's got a proud agricultural history. Um, but you've heard me many times mention that Wanneroo pl uh, plays a big part uh, in terms of the agricultural contribution to our state's output. It was really interesting to hear, particularly uh, from the member for Warren Blackwood, who's not behind me right now, um, and uh, so, some of the information she provided about uh, the fantastic produce that is coming out of her electorate um, and also the quantities and, and the kind of um, value adding that's happening down in that area. Um, what was it, the blackberry nip in particular? Yeah, I'll see, I have to see what can get ca happening out of Wanneroo. Of course, Wanneroo in particular is known um, for its strawberries. We produce over 35% of the state's production in strawberries. Sweet corn, um, and particularly thanks to um, the Trandos family and their extraordinary operation in Wanneroo, um, 68% of the state's sweet corn comes out of Wanneroo. We produce 20% of West Australia's capsicums, 20% of West Australia's beans, 22% of West Australia's cabbages, and of course we produce a fair whack of the state's tomato production. Um, in Wanneroo we have over 100 growers, varying in size, from huge, huge productions like the Trandosses that I mentioned that run farms not only in Wanneroo but in Jinjin and Broome to provide produce all year round, to very, very small market gardens of perhaps on five acres just uh, producing niche products like herbs or micro herbs. Um, over 100 growers are situated in Wanneroo, We're employing over 1,000 people. It's quite incredible when you think it's, it's about $120 million in gross value um, of production, which sort of accounts to about 30% of the total that's produced in the Perth region. So I think Wanneroo does very, very well. I just wanted to just briefly um, also uh, explain what's happening in Wanneroo or a bit of an update. Members, you would know that uh, when we came to government in 2017, there was a fair bit of uncertainty for growers, uh, particularly because the previous Liberal government had, um, under one of the, what was it, four or five agricultural ministers they had in that government, I'm not sure, uh, you know, uh, but I think it was under the Honourable um, Dean Norder, made the announcement uh, without any negotiation that there would be a 25% cut to water, um, which caused great, great concern amongst growers in Wanneroo, did nothing to help people in terms of providing certainty in terms of their tenure, in terms of their water resource, created more problems in terms of the planning issues that are already existing in Wanneroo, given the urban encroachment. Um, and uh, the commitment that we made in 2017 was to convene a task force to have a look at these issues to provide some long-term planning and water certainty to those growers. Now, one of the things that came out of the task force or one of the results of that task force was that uh, the um, Water Minister, uh, uh, Dave Kelly, and um, 
the Agricultural Minister, Lana McTiernan, made the announcement that growers would face a 10 per cent cut to come in in 2028. Now, members, as you well could imagine, that didn't go down too well uh, with growers, but it's actually a necessary decision. Um, I noticed the member for Swan Hills, in her uh, contribution to this bill, talked quite a lot about climate change. Uh, we all know that it is having an impact out there. It is a drying climate and water is a key issue in Wanneroo. The licences are uh, oversubscribed and we've had to ha make the tough decision to decrease the water licences by 10 per cent in 2028. But members, the whole purpose of making that announcement a couple of years ago was to allow growers to transition and to support them in terms of making sure that they could um, accommodate that 10 per cent cut by encouraging them and supporting them in further efficiency me measures. And in that regard, um, as part of my 21 election commitment, we are investing $750,000 in Wanneroo and $600,000 in particular to assist growers in managing the drying climate. Um, growers will be able to uh, apply for grants of up to $30,000 to install technology to improve their water systems and increase their water efficiency. Um, importantly too though, um, not all growers are able to access that kind of grant straight away because they don't know what they don't know. So part of these $600,000 investment will also um, include $5,000 grants so that growers can engage professionals to come out to their farms in the first place to assist them to um, make some decisions about what kind of efficiency technology might serve their particular farms well. I'm looking forward to that uh, grant process being rolled out and um, urging farmers to work with the government in supporting them to make sure that they can be efficient in their uses. Um, I also um, wanted to mention the, the work that we're doing with the City of Wanneroo, which is ongoing in terms of trying to resolve some of the planning issues up there. Um, lots of members would know, and I'm sure the Minister who talked about Cannington would know, and I know um, uh, the member for Balcatta. Quite often, traditional market garden areas, uh, bit by bit, over time, get urbanisation pressures on them, whereby market gardeners just may actually just want to pack up cash in, superannuation and move away. And so um, we have dual problems of growers who need water certainty um, and need to drive efficiencies, but there's no doubt that there are some growers, depending on their family circumstances, etc., who actually just want to pack up and have a good planning outcome so that they can actually capitalise their assets. Um, and we're working that through with the City of Wanneroo and the Department of Planning. Of course, when I mentioned the City of Wanneroo members, uh, we've got a great mayor up there, Tracy Roberts. Fantastic mayor, yeah, yeah. Tracy Roberts. Um, and absolutely, I cannot tell you members how excited I am at the announcement, I think it was today. Yep. Was it in the paper today? That uh, the mayor, uh, uh, Tracy Roberts, has been uh, uh, pre selected by Labor. And aren't Labor good at, at picking well-connected local candidates to run um, for state and federal seats? That's right. Aren't, mm. aren't Labor good at doing that? And you're not going to find someone much better than Tracy Roberts in terms of being connected to her community, having served at the local council level, I think it was since 2009, and having been the mayor since 2011. Um, and I have had a lot to do with the Mayor of Wanneroo, and I can tell you there's not many people that work harder than her in terms of being out in her community and knowing what her community's needs are. And I think she would be a fantastic voice for Pierce in um, the federal sphere. And um, I look forward uh, to the opportunity to work with her um, because, let me tell you, she also knows the issues that are... that that plague North Wanneroo in terms of water certainty. And um, so far, the federal government 
in all of the advocacy that uh, the, the state government has tried to pursue have not been able to uh, get any significant funding out of the federal government to support growers and to support agriculture in Monaroo. And I'm hoping, through Tracy's advocacy, um, that we might actually get a little bit more attention that we haven't been getting from the coalition gov government. Members, I want to conclude just by saying, um, as part of this uh, debate, it has been so fantastic to hear people like the member for Geraldton, the member for Albany, the member for Warren Black Blackwood talk with such great passion about their electorates and, in particular, the agricultural pursuits that are happening in those electorates. I've never heard, heard uh, um, in the first four years that I was in Parliament uh, those kind of industries being spoken about with such passion. And I think it's a great reflection of how fantastic um, the, the Labor government is in terms of representing regional Western Australia, where, of course, a lot of our agricultural production happens. And I want to finally uh, say uh, I don't think that is not... Um, I think a little bit or a lot is part partly due to our fantastic agricultural and regional um, affairs minister, the Honourable Anna McTiernan, who has worked the regions. She's been there doing the business, worked with these wonderful um, regional advocates, and I look forward to what's in store for the next uh, three and a half years, or three years. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Member. Member's question is that the bill will now be read a second time. Deputy yes. Speaker. Member from Mount Lawley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to make a brief contribution to this debate on the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill. Um, and I'd like to start where the Member for Wanneroo left off. Um, we talk about previous uh, Ministers for Agriculture in Western Australia, and I don't think there's anyone who's ever been quite as accomplished or quite as famous or quite as forceful as the current Minister for Agriculture. And it's through her strength, her willpower and her advocacy that she is making sure that agriculture is well represented within the Parliament of Western Australia. A great woman advocating passionately for something that she believes in. And as I rise to speak, I'm, the, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm the first male speaker on the, on the Labor benches to speak in support of this, in, in support of this bill. I don't agree. I don't agree. Our opponents may be pale, male and stale, but our, our successes are all coming after us. And, and, I, and I think about the areas that they represent. You know, we've had regional areas like the member for Warren Blackwood. We've had important country towns like Albany and Geraldton, and both of their members spoke in behalf. And we've had members on the peri-urban fringe, like the member for Wanneroo, the, the, cabinet, the uh, parliamentary secretary to the Premier, and the uh, member for Swan Hills, the parliamentary secretary uh, to the minister, who's got carriage of the bill in this place. And I think it can never be alleged against the Labor Party that we won't stick up for the regions. I'm the member. I'm the member for Mount Lawley, and I speak. And I speak. And I speak. And I speak. And I speak in support of this legislation. And I, I join my voice to all of those other voices who have spoken so articulately and so passionately, as the member for Wanneroo has said who really genuinely want to stand up and represent their communities. And the reason that I am relaxed about any proposals for electoral reform, member for Roe, is that I know that if we continue to elect Labor members to this chamber, those areas will be more than adequately represented. The only, the only risk the only risk for regional people is if they can continue, is if, is if they go back to electing hopeless members who've, had, who've, faced the, who've faced the judgment of the community at the last election, who were all out on their ear, all out on their ear, replaced by the women who stood up and made the passionate arguments in support of this legislation. Thoughtful, thoughtful contributions that form part of the debate in this place. And it's debate centred around another landmark McGowan government initiative. Because what we are doing, this McGowan government, elected in 2017 and re-elected in 2021, has always had jobs as its number one focus. And in order to encourage and promote jobs growth and new opportunities, we need to make sure that we support our agricultural industries, we need to make sure that we support all of our industries, but in particular, we have an obligation as a responsible parliament to make sure that our legislative framework, the regulatory framework that governs these industries, is modern 
and up to date. And when you look at the neglect that this particular area suffered under years of blue versus green infighting during the period of the last government, as the National Party and the Liberal Party couldn't figure out what reforms they were going to put in place, I say thank goodness. Thank goodness we have active representatives from the country towns and from the regions, and thank goodness we have a minister like Alana McTiernan, like the Honourable Alana McTiernan, taking up this necessary legislative reform because this provides certainty and it provides opportunity for people in our agricultural industry. One of the things that we've all been confronted with over the past 18 months is the COVID pandemic and the way in which we rebuild our economy back after the COVID pandemic has abated is going to be very important. We've known and we've always articulated that there's a heavy reliance in Western Australia on the mining sector. And the mining sector will always play an incredibly significant part in the economy and the prosperity of Western Australia. But we also know that it is incumbent upon us to diversify our economy. And by putting an emphasis on supporting our agricultural producers, we can achieve just that. One of the real difficulties that arises as a result of the, of the COVID pandemic is that our reliance on the mining sector has in, has in fact increased in recent times. And so the urgency of the task that we now confront in reforming our economy and diversifying our economy is even more acute. One way, members, that we can promote our agricultural industries, our primary producers and our, and our world leading products is by encouraging export markets. It's by encouraging those world class gold standard producers to take their products and get them into those lucrative export markets. And that's why the other opportunity that's presented, so, so and, 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 the, and the way we are doing that, the way the McGowan Labor government is doing that is through its new plans for the investment, Invest and Trade WA office, which will consist of four dedicated trade commissioners located in key export markets, Northeast Asia, ASEAN, Greater China and India and the Gulf, to promote Western Australian products to these markets. Now, these new commissioners are all in place. They're all in place, they're all ready to go, and they can't wait to get out into those export markets so they can start promoting Western Australian products and goods and services to those markets. They are ready to go. But before they go, before they leave to go offshore to their postings, these four trade commissioners, together with representatives from uh, the Department of Jobs and Tourism, Science and Innovation, last week undertook a familiarisation tour of the South West and the Great Southern, just to do a deep dive into what's going on in those regions, to have a proper understanding so that when they get out into those markets, when they get to Tokyo and Singapore and Mumbai and Shanghai, they'll be, they'll be well versed in the, uh, in the work that is being done by some of our world-class producers in Western Australia. So firstly, can I, um, can I just uh, thank the, uh, the four trade commissioners that I was able to join with last week on the, on the uh, familiarisation tour. Um, Ms Duan Lu, who will be our Investment and Trade Commissioner for Greater China. Uh, Ms Krista Dunstan, who will be our Investment and Trade Commissioner for the ASEAN. Nicole Fasana, our Investment and Trade Commissioner for North East Asia, which is Japan and Korea. And Mr Chris Bandy, who will be our Investment and Trade Commissioner for India and the Gulf. And together with... Uh, Fiona Goss, who is the um, Principal Trade Consultant at the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, as well as um, uh, representatives from Investment and Trade WA, uh, Simone Spencer, the Deputy Director General, and Christian Dawson, um, we were able to undertake a familiarisation tour, as I say, last week. And as part of that, we got to visit some of the incredible Western Australian producers, like uh, Jasper Farms. Now, Jasper Farms is an avocado producer Western Australia members, Western Australia produces 39% of the national avocado crop, and it's, it's through the 360 hectares of land under cultivation at Jasper Farms that they contribute so significantly. And, and not only do um, Jasper Farms do a terrific job in, in, in growing this um, product for the international market and the Western Australian and Australian markets, but they also provide um, 
jobs for Pacific Islanders whose remittances help keep those economies afloat as they struggle with the COVID pandemic and the undermining of their tourism sectors. Uh, we visit, visited uh, Truffle Hill down in Nanjimup, an incredible world-leading um, producer of truffles, and we, we spoke with Michael Lowe, the, ma the general manager down there, the managing director down there. We, we visited tall timbers in Nanjimup, and and, and, sorry, and and in fact, one of the great one of the great uh, visits that we undertook uh, was in in Katanning, in the um, member for Rose electorate. We spoke to an organisation called Mojapin. Now. Um, one of, the, one of the real problems that we're facing as an agricultural community in Western Australia is increasing salinity. And speaking to Mojapin, uh, th these guys were just so energetic and enthusiastic and they know exactly what's required in order to try and tackle the issue of, um, of salinity. We spoke to a farmer down there who was so enthusiastic and so energetic and so passionate about tackling salinity uh, in, in the wheat belt. And his name was, um, was David Thompson. And he's, he's set aside his farm as a test site for saltbush and other saline intensive uh, um, crops in order to try and reduce the salinity in the soil. And, and just speaking to these people with their, with their passion and commitment and their dedication, it's just, it's, um, it's uh, inspiring because you can see just how, just how committed they are to improve uh, the lives of the, 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 um, the productivity of their farms and the wellbeing of the, of the, of the land they're on. Um, and so when, when we undertook this tour, I thought to myself, this, this is an incredible testament because it brings me back to the first point that I was making and that is that the McGowan government is committed to jobs. You know, WA jobs have always been the, the, the government's number one priority. We've, we've steered the community through, uh, through the COVID pandemic and, 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 that, and that work will continue to be undertaken. But as, as, we, as we get beyond COVID, hopefully in, in, in the not too distant future, as vaccination rates hopefully pick up and we can start to look at how we rebuild the economy. Um, initiatives like this familiarisation tour serve to do two things. One, they demonstrate quite clearly to the people in those communities that as far as the WA government is concerned, with the McGowan Labor government, we've got your back. Right? We're interested in what you're doing. We're here to help. We want to make sure that your products can make it to international markets. That's the first thing. And the second thing it does is by encouraging those producers to grow and expand and innovate, encouraging them to seize those entrepreneurial opportunities, we're creating more jobs in the regions. We are creating more jobs in the regions. And so what underpins both of those initiatives and both of those really worthwhile objectives is the proper regulatory framework, the proper regulatory regime. And so whilst this might seem like a relatively straightforward piece of legislation, and I commend the member for Roe for being the only member of the opposition to have sat through this debate. He's the, he's the one person amongst the whole of the opposition to have participated by listening to the contribution. Unbelievable. By listening to the contribution. I was astounded, members. I was astounded when the member for Wanneroo was on her feet and a whole bunch of opposition members returned to the chamber at about 12.45. And the member for Wanneroo said, oh, Welcome back, you've come to hear my contribution. And the member of Cottesloe said, no, we haven't. We've come in to make our private member statements. They weren't even interested in listening to the contribution that, that the, 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 um, the passionate Labor members were making in support of the regions and in support of this legislation. Well, the member for O is the only, is the only one who's, who's, who's stayed there. And, 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 you know, and, and thank goodness he, he finally got the call when he did to stand up and contribute to this debate, because if he hadn't, the thing would have passed without any second reading debate. But all of the contributions that have been made, with the exception of the member for all of the contributions have been made by Labor people passionate about those things, passionate about making sure that the regulatory regime is in place to promote efficiency and effectiveness in the marketplace, passionate about growing WA jobs and passionate about diversifying our economy. And so this is another piece of the puzzle for which the minister must be commended and for which the government must be commended. And I support the passage of this bill. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, member. Uh, the member for Thornley. Uh, thank you, Ten minutes. I'm very to I know. Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021. It uh, really does bring into place these producer committees. And uh, producer committees 
use for all kinds of agricultural produce, uh, a system that does, and uh, I know uh, the member for Roe touched on this, enable the, um, uh, the placement of levies in certain industries to fund activities that can be extremely positive and enhancing for an industry. So, for example, uh, it uh, could be about the marketing of a particular produce. Uh, it could be uh, about the um, biosecurity measures around a produce and can complement some of the biosecurity security measures that are necessary for, for various produce areas. Uh, but I think more than anything, what I find particularly exciting with this is that it does set us on the right trajectory for what's known as geographic indication. And this is something that's really exciting. This is the way forward for agricultural production. If we want to see agricultural production move beyond being about commodity production, we want to see agricultural producers not being price takers where they put a produce onto the global market and take whatever the global market price is. We want to see our agricultural produce being dominated by sectors that are into price setting, that they have that uniqueness, that they are able to set their price and to be able to promote their product as being unique. And I think the best way to do that is through this system of geographic indication. Now, I say all this, but to the best of my knowledge, our peak agricultural lobby groups and you know, perhaps the member for Roe might be able to correct me on this. To the best of my knowledge, our peak agricultural lobby groups, the WA Farmers Federation, the PGA, they're at best sceptical about geographic indication. Uh, it's an issue that comes up whenever we talk about the emerging Australia-EU free trade agreement as being potentially a barrier to that agreement taking place. A whole free trade agreement encompassing so many sectors could be held up because we We've got a few people in the agricultural sector who are scared of what geographic indication might mean, even though geographic indication can actually be an amazing opportunity for agricultural producers, especially our Australian agricultural producers. So I really do urge those in the agricultural sector to see this as a brilliant opportunity. I mean, we've got produce that is unique to this part of the world and should be marketed as such. And this is one of the things that these producers' committees enable us to do, to set production standards so that the average consumer goes into a Coles, a Woolworths, an IGA and sees on the shelf a particular product coming from uh, one region or another and they might not really be able to do the research on what the production standards are that have gone into the making of that product, product. but they know, oh, I really like truffles that come from Manjimup. And then they can, if they want, later find out what the production standard is. Was it a dog or a pig that was used to sniff out the truffles? Uh, what colour truffle? When is it actually the best time of year for that truffle to be um, found and dug up? Uh, they can then feel some sort of affinity with the, pro the particular property. They might have even visited the property on a holiday. They know something about about where the produce has come from. So this is one of the beauties of these producer committees that I see as potentially evolving into geographic, a system of geographic indication, that it gives us this fantastic opportunity to create a real bond between producer and consumer. That's a great strength. That's where you get this price setting capability, when you've got that bond between producer and consumer. And this is very much the experience in Europe, and we have that great food culture. Uh, whenever you watch the food programs that come from Europe, and it's Rick Stein or it's uh, Mavo Mira or one of the other SBS programs, and they're doing their tours around Europe, they always talk about how wonderful it is, this connection that people have. Have with, with the food of their country, of that culture, and where that food comes from. This is one of the ways we can really instil that into our own culture and make sure that it's something that is highly profitable for the producers. 
that they become more respected than ever as the producers of quality products. Now, I'm seeing uniquely Australian interpretations on this, and um, I had the pleasure of uh, writing in the city of Armadale Grand Fondo, and congratulations to the organisers of that. This is something new in something like a bike ride Grand Fondo, where the Hills Emporium, Emporio in Carrigullen, that's run by Simon and Nat, uh, the um, Emporio had made a feature of that particular event, the highlighting of local produce, the wines, the, uh, the honeys, uh, all sorts of other produce from the region that was there for people participating in that cycling event to be able to buy uh, at the beginning or at the end of the event. And uh, I thought that was a very good way of uh, promoting to people who are often riding their bikes in the Perth Hills, in that particular Armadale, Kelmscott part of the Perth Hills, to be able to appreciate the, the beauty, the aesthetics, uh, the, uh, the lovely climbs, the orcharding and everything that's going on there, but to be able to appreciate the food produce that comes from the region. Region, to, to get to know a little bit more about the story of that region. And so uh, to be there, uh, along with Mayor Ruth Butterfield, Mayor of the City of Armidale, uh, to be able to uh, present the awards to the various riders and enjoy it, uh, that was a very uh, positive uh, occasion, something that I very much enjoyed. Now, to one thing that does concern me a little bit in the legislation, um, I see that pastoral leaseholders, as I understand it, are being exempt uh, no doubt they've lobbied, they've said that, oh, you know, it's, it, we, we, we've just got so much uh, in the way of price constraint that they're exempted from the need to form the agricultural produce committees. Uh, I think that might be a missed opportunity and there might be some changes afoot there, but I do worry when I hear that the pastoral lease sector is again crying poor. I mean, I was amazed when I had a look at the latest figures on how much a pastoral lease actually actually costs in terms of annual rental. And uh, the, the figures are really astounding. I mean, I often make the comparison between what it costs to rent uh, 250,000 hectares, a typical size of a pastoral lease, and uh, the uh, cost of renting a house in Thornley. And uh, the, the, the difference, it's, it's actually much cheaper to rent 250,000 hectares in the Pilbara or the Kimberley, much, much cheaper to do that than it is to rent a, a, a three by one uh, house in Thornley. Uh, so, um, you know, when people cry poor and say, oh, we couldn't possibly be involved in producer committees because it would be another financial impost on us and it would send us broke, it, it just doesn't add up, it doesn't make sense. But I know that there are many in that uh, uh, pastoral sector uh, who own some or have control. They don't own it, they're, they're, they're tenants. Um, they have control over, I think it's about 35, 37% of the state of Western Australia. Um, they um, uh, are I think becoming increasingly progressive in their outlook about how they do manage their lands and the opportunities that this government has made available to them and the opportunities around carbon farming, those are exciting diversification opportunities that are going to help them have enhanced financial viability going into the future. So, Deputy Speaker, I think what we see with this legislation is a very exciting opportunity. It's something that uh, we should all embrace. I mean, I, I did hear from the member for Roe, and, and, and I understand that so much in Western Australian agriculture is dominated by broad acre producers. And, uh, you know, I did my uh, tertiary studies at Muresk Institute of Agriculture dominated by broad acre farming. And it's true, it's a bit hard to see how you're going to uh, uh, make a, um, a premium product. Well, I think it can be done, but I know some people argue that it can't be done, making a premium product out of uh, West Australian wheat. Um, I mean, we, we like to say it's a high quality, but in the end we become price takers. It is a commodity product, but I think we've got to do more to highlight the, the, um, the unique features of it, the benefits of it, and as well to talk about the various production standards that we are meeting, and then use that as an opportunity to improve those production standards.
efforts uh, to make sure that we're making uh, more and more efficient use of things like fertilisers, uh, that we're uh, not uh, wasting nitrogen and phosphorus that then gets washed into river systems, uh, causing algal blooms and what have you later on. We've got to make sure that there's good efficient use of those inputs there. Uh, I mean, I know we're set for a very uh, large <coughs> harvest. It, it's uh, going to be around, um, I think, somewhere between 13 to 15 million tonnes this year, uh, grain harvest, if, if things keep going as well as they have been doing. Uh, but we've got to bear in mind that on a global scale, in terms of agricultural production per hectare, we're not very efficient. Uh, our hectares don't produce much in the way of fertiliser, uh, in, in the way of, um, of um, produce, uh, because of the, the nature of the soils. Uh, but to make up for that just by putting on large amounts of fertiliser and then some of that fertiliser being wasted, that's not the way to go. We've got to find a way of making our agriculture highly efficient and I think as well by diversifying, enabling producers to be uh, as diverse and not just reliant on one or two enterprises on their, their property. I mean, if you're running a property that's really a wheat and sheep farm, uh, you're really taking a big financial risk because for all the prices might be good at the moment for um, your uh, grains, uh, you can't rely on that into the future. You've got to be able to diversify and, and to diversify into these areas where we are actually marketing the uniqueness of our product eventually through geographic indication. I think that's going to be a great, great opportunity for us. So I look forward to uh, hearing how this whole system of producer committees evolves and gives Australian, uh, the uh, primary industry sector in Australia, in Western Australia, more opportunities and uh, more financial returns. Thank you, uh, Member. Members, the question is the bill now be read a second time. Member for Belmont. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I wish to make a brief contribution to uh, the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill of 2021. Now, although my electorate of Belmont doesn't necessarily have a plethora of agricultural primary producers, I'm really pleased to speak on this bill because agriculture and all industries within this sector make a critical contribution uh, to our economic strength and the provision of employment right across our state of WA. The Western Australian primary industries are a significant contribution to our economy and they support around 58,000 400 jobs, which is huge. With 39,300 people directly employed in agriculture, fisheries, aquaculture and forestry, and 19,100 people directly employed in food, beverage and forest manufacturing. 162,000 primary industries also contribute to employment with 162,000 jobs in the WA supply chain from paddock to plate. In 2018-19, primary industries had a gross value of production of $11.7 billion and their exports were valued at $8.4 billion. So it's undeniable from these figures alone the importance of our agricultural industries in WA. And I would like to at this point acknowledge the Minister, the Honourable Alana McTiernan, for her continued and tireless promotion and support of these industries uh, through her portfolio. Uh, this bill before us today sets out to modernise the Agricultural Produce Commission Act of 1988. Largely, the amendments put forward were born out of co a comprehensive review of the Act in 2006 and provide a mechanism for the provision and funding of services by agricultural producers to agricultural producers. The current bill currently provides producers with mechanisms to ensure they can operate effectively and empowers them to grow their industries through the establishment of producers' committees. These committees are run by producers for producers, as they very well should be. They are therefore the voice for their industry. The Act provides a mechanism that producers can choose to access if they wish. By creating a producers committee for their industry, producers can combine their efforts and resources and work together to achieve the identified goals for their industry. 
And this may be in the form of developing new markets, increasing production standards and addressing common threats such as pests and biodiversity matters. There are currently 11 producer committees for the following industries. Avocado, beekeepers, Carnarvon banana, egg, pomme, citrus and stone fruit, pork, potato, strawberry, table grape, vegetable and wine. These producers committees do really, really important work. From undertaking research activities, which others uh, members I know have noted, uh, it includes commercialisation of Bravo Apple, a personal favourite of my children, to paying compensation to banana producers, uh, sorry, banana growers in Carnarvon in the aftermath of Cyclone Olwen. The committees also deliver important promotional activities. One of which um, other members have also acknowledged is the Crunch and Sip program in our schools. And as a parent of two young primary school age children, I'm acutely aware of this. Uh, and even though it can be a point of frustration in the mornings as I'm trying to frantically find scrounge for um, fresh fruit and vegetables in the fridge, I think does um, send a really great and powerful message to our children, instilling healthy eating habits from a really young age, which they will hopefully carry through into adulthood. Importantly, these committees also undertake biosecurity activities, such as support for eradication of the Queensland fruit fly uh, when there was uh, an outbreak in 2016 in Alfred Cove. Um, the member for Swan Hills spoke about the importance of um, this mechanism when she talked about the damage that's caused by rainbow lorikeets, not only to native flora and fauna, but also to uh, primary producers. The committees also provide um, support for the unique needs uh, that is relevant just to that specific and, um, industry. So, for example, the Beekeeping Producers Committee supports beekeeping training as well as producing the Bee Informed newsletter and monitors biosecurity policies and they actually advocate uh, to both uh, state and federal parliaments on these matters. Uh, and they also look to promote and advocate for enhanced pest and disease surveillance. Uh, and this is in order to better protect their industry here in WA. Another function of the Beekeeping Producers Committee is to ensure that the industry remains supported by leading cutting edge research about primarily bee health and disease prevention, but not exclusively those things, other matters as well. And the reason I'm, I suppose, dwelling on this particular committee is because of the extensive media coverage over recent years, um, which has really highlighted the plight of bees, not only here in uh, WA and across our country, but more, um, uh, more broadly, right across our globe. Um, and I'd just like to note, um, according to an article in ABC from the 25th of June 2018, Bee, pop bee populations have fallen by a third in some parts of the world, and that's really quite dramatic. Um, experts, uh, according to this article, experts pointed to a particular disease uh, that causes bee wings to deform, but also to climate change as some of the leading causes uh, for this radical decline in bee numbers. And we need to um, ensure that adequate protection of bees because of the critical function that they undertake in our ecosystem, but also, of course, the critical function and role that they play in our agricultural industries as well. Bee pollination is integral in supporting and assisting around 35 per cent of our total food production. And it's suggested that around 75 per cent of all crops receive some benefit from pollination uh, from bees. And again, that's from um, this same article that I'm quoted. And it's called, Bees are dying, what can we do about it? The impact or consequence, according to experts, of poor pollination can be lower yields of crops or fruit that is misshapen and therefore unable to be sold. Ultimately, the role of the APC producers committees is to provide services required by producers of the relevant agricultural produce. And this bill will improve the effectiveness of these committees, committee mechanism for the provision and funding of services by agricultural producers to, 
to agricultural producers and will allow current APC groups to continue the very important work that they perform here in our state. The minister has listened to the concerns of those in the industry through the comprehensive consultation process that was undertaken over a number of years and I think responded appropriately throughout this legislation. Primary industries are vital to our state and agriculture is a crucial component of our economy and is also a key aspect of our state's identity. So therefore it's critical to protect, support and grow these industries which provide so much for Western Australia. And I think our government is providing producers with the resources and support that is required to not only grow but also to, for their, their industries to thrive into the future. And I commend this bill to the House. Thank you, Member. Members, the question is the bill will now be read a second yeah. time. The, the Minister member representing for, the Agricultural Minister. Can I also thank the Member for Rowe, Members for Moore, Albany, Geraldton, Ma um, Warren Blackwood, Swan Hills, Wanneroo, Mount Lawley and Gosnells, and of course, as I said, the member for uh, Belmont for their contribution to this bill um, that, uh, that um, is before the House and has come, of course, from the other House, delivered with great, uh, uh, great uh, effort by the uh, Agricultural Minister in the other place, the, the Honourable Eleanor McTiernan. Uh, a number of members have uh, raised uh, uh, some issues uh, and I thank them for their concerns and also for their uh, contributions. I thank the opposition for their, uh, what I've quoted as, in general, supportive but hesitant and concerned support, uh, which should probably describe the member for Rowe's uh, contribution. Uh, and I do want to highlight and just respond to a couple of those. I don't wish to keep the House late today or late tonight. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll obviously go into consideration in detail um, and then complete this bill this afternoon. That is the intention. Look, uh, I, there's a couple of key issues that were highlighted, and I just want to go through those because I think they may allay some of the issues that have been raised by the member for uh, uh, Roe and uh, the member for Moore uh, and uh, possibly other members. The first is the issue around broad acre cropping. A number of members have raised concerns about the removal of the exemption for broadacre cropping and asked whether this will mean that the broadacre producers will, um, will have a committee forced upon them. Um, and I want to stress that this legislation or that this is not the case. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of debate about the broadacre issue, um, both in the other place and over in, in a number of years with regard to the, uh, the um, uh, drafting and uh, shaping of this, uh, this um, uh, amendment uh, legislation. Uh, so I want to stress that it's not the case of uh, um, a committee being forced. The ultimate or the removal of the exemption gives broadacre cropping producers the opportunity to participate should they vote to do so. The Commission cannot force a committee onto, a, onto an industry. Uh, committees are initiated, established and operated at the request of producers and the fees they charge are determined in consultation with those producers based on the services that the producers have said they want the committee to provide. And there are many agricultural industries which have chosen not to establish a committee under this Act. And uh, uh, there, whilst there are uh, uh, a number that currently exist under this Act, there are many that do not. Uh, uh, um, uh, that is uh, dem dem demonstrative of uh, their choice in the matter. And a, a number of members highlighted that this, uh, the focus of choice is a, is a key component of consideration. Uh, and ultimately, the broader, if the broadacre uh, industry doesn't want to take advantage of the APC mechanism, they do not have to do so. All of this legislation does is remove uh, the exclusion that prevented them from establishing a committee if they wanted to do so. Um, now, look, uh, there are some other, uh, so I hope that clarifies that matter. Um, the, the member for Roe and uh, a number of other members, did, or some members did highlight the, the issues around the opt-out clause. Can I just highlight that there has been uh, much discussion in this place and in the other place regarding the uh, opt-out clause. Now, um, um, what we are providing here is a head of power for an opt-out clause to be made in regulations, um, and there has been concern about what that might look like. 
Uh, as the regulations on the Derivatives Act are designed to support each other, or sorry, to support each committee and the operations of their industry, the way that an opt-out clause functions will differ for each industry. Um, and as of yet, existing committees have not approached the APC or the department asking for consideration. Um, uh, consideration um, of such provisions in their regulations once this bill is passed and the head powers available. It is more likely, members, that the uh, new committees will wish to design their regulations to include this component, and this will be an issue raised by the Commission when it commences discussions with producers about their proposal to form a committee for their industry. I think it's important to emphasise that the reason for including a head of power for regulations to be made on this issue is because we want to give committees the flexibility to determine whether a waiver, refund or reduction power works for their industry, and if so, how they want it to work. And this is consistent with the spirit of the Act and the way uh, that producers' committees operate. It is not appropriate to have a one-size-fits-all option, as that ignores the wishes of the producers and their committees. And I do want to draw the member for Row, uh, uh, member for Row's attention to the letter, uh, a letter from uh, the WA, or uh, not a letter, but uh, the submission from WA Farmers, uh, dated July uh, 2020, uh, which specifically makes mention now uh, with regard to the opt-out issue. And I do quote from that letter from uh, the. Uh, um, uh, from that submission, where, and I quote, the, uh, the WA Farmers submission highlights that we note the advice provided by the state, this is quoted, sorry, we note the advice provided by the State Solicitor's Office of the legal merits of placing the opt-out provision in the regulations and accept that it is the most workable approach and that the risk of legislators moving to impose new fees on growers is not borne out by past experience. Um, now, they do go on to, to ask the government fast-track the drafting um, and prep or preparation of those regulations, but I think that is uh, a clear uh, indication from the Farmers' Federation uh, with regard to um, uh, un an understanding as to why uh, those uh, opt-out provisions um, uh, or provision it, it will be uh, delivered through regulation rather than um, in the Act. They describe it as being the most workable approach. So that's not my quote, that's from the Farmers' Federation. Um, look, uh, um, uh, there is some issues around uh, levies which were highlighted. Um, uh, uh, the member for Rowe um, uh, and the member for um, uh, Moore, in particular, highlighted the issues around levies. Can I just say this about that? Members talked about uh, producers being locked into a framework that they don't want and the fear of having to pay levies that, that duplicate what they already pay. Um, I just want to explain how committees can address any potential duplication. For industries that pay other charges or levies, the relevant producers committee will generally work with the peak state and national bodies responsible for the expenditure of the other charge or levy to provide desired or complementary services. And there have been many situations where a committee has worked with the commission, the department or other uh, and other national bodies to combine funding in order to achieve a specific outcome. Uh, an example of this, and there are a couple, is the current project undertaken with the berries industry, where funding for an ind industry development officer is being provided through the National Berry Industry Body, Berries Australia, the Strawberry Producers Committee and Deep Herd. This collaborative funding provides targeted industry-driven service provision and helps to invest national levies paid by growers back to WA growers, and in this case, enables co-investment with state government. The other example, or another example, is in the poem industry, seeking the ability to export Bravo apples to Japan, Taiwan and China. In this case, Deep Herd, the POM Producers Committee and, the, and Fruit West combined their funding to conduct research and provided the resultant findings to the federal agency for that uh, to be progressed. Now, committees work to identify uh, any 
uh, or to identify opportunities to improve value for dollar paid by producers in levies and charges. Um, and any duplication of fees and services can in fact be addressed by the committee in consultation with producers. And ultimately, the role of the APC Producers Committee is to provide services required by the producers of the relevant agricultural uh, produce. Um, some members highlighted issues around setting of charges um, uh, and, and concern that a committee may be established and charges then imposed on producers who do not want to pay them. A fee for service charge is determined by the relevant committee in consultation with their producers. And as the charge is a fee for service, it is linked to the service that the industry wants the committee to provide. Providers are able to advise the committee where they want or do not want a service to be provided. On two occasions, producer committees have in fact voted for a fee for service charge and then in subsequent years decided that it was no longer necessary. Now, an example of that was there are currently no levies on either avocados or eggs uh, because the industry decided that it did not want to receive a service from their committee and so there was no need to impose a fee or service charge. Um, now, in relation to uh, weighted voting, um, I think that was one of your uh, key concerns, Member Farrow. Um, you highlighted the, your concerns around weighted voting. Um, the amendments in the bill allow the Commission to use weighted voting in an establishment poll, but only where the Commission has sufficient industry data available for it to determine what the appropriate weighting should be. And ultimately, the Commission must be satisfied that the use of weighted voting is in the best interests of the agricultural industry. Um, and I think that's an important uh, uh, consideration uh, and point with regard to the weighted voting issue. Um, uh, there were uh, issues uh, raised um, in regards to the committee's uh, comp uh, uh, um, um, that word. <laughs> the uh, construction or the who sits on the committee. Uh, and I think you raised some, some issues around um, um, uh, appointment and, uh, and um, um, now where a committee is first established, the commission is required under section 11 to invite nominations from the producers for appointment to the committee. And after receiving nominations, the committee shall decide how many members there should be and whether a poll of producers should be held to elect the members. The members are appointed to committees by the Commission, and if a poll is held to elect members, the Commission must appoint the members elected in that poll. And a person can only be appointed to a committee if they are a producer of the relevant uh, agric agricultural produce. Um, uh, and now, um, um, in terms of, uh, essentially in terms of the, uh, the um, establishment uh, of the committee itself. Um, uh, I think most members are aware um, uh, of, if, of effectively how a committee has established. And, and I think it's important to note that in establishing these committees, they, they don't happen overnight. Um, and indeed, if we look at the wine industry, I think it took some 10 years before uh, the committee was established and started operating. Um, because the Commission spends an extensive amount of time uh, educating interested producers, establishing the extent of support and discussing what services the industry is interested in, in obtaining and understanding how the industry works. And all of this occurs before there is an establishment poll uh, is even held. So I think uh, under the Commission's work there is a lot of effort, a time, and consultation that is undertaken uh, before anything leads to uh, a potential uh, establishment poll. Um, and the Commission is aware ahead of time as to whether there is any division within the industry on the proposal to establish a, um, a committee. And in order for the establishment protest to, process to commence, a producer or a group of producers would in fact of course need to approach the Commission requesting such a poll be conducted. And the Commission is required to advertise the proposal to establish a producers committee for a type of agricultural produce. They are required to invite submissions from producers who may be affected. Um, and the Commission is required to have regard to those submissions. 
and a poll is then held to, to identify producer support for establishment of a committee. Essentially, a majority of producers need to vote in favour of the establishment of the committee in order for the Commission to actually establish that committee, and the Commission has a policy on polling whereby it requires 60 per cent of producers who vote in favour of the establishment of such a committee. Uh, I think there were some issues raised with regard to the uh, establishment. Um, um, I mentioned duplication of, uh, of um, uh, fees. The issues around the setting of charges. Um, uh, I did highlight about um, the fee for services determined by the relevant committee in consultation with their uh, with their um, uh, um, with their. Uh, um, uh, stakeholders, or producers in this case, um, and uh, I did highlight that eggs and avocados were an example where the uh, industry sector actually uh, um, decided to not uh, seek to have a, a, a service fee imposed. Uh, vote weighting I've highlighted um, uh, the prescribed agricultural industry. Um, there were some members highlighted uh, issues around prescribed agricultural industry. I note that members asked why Clause 4, and I think this might have been a matter you raised as well from memory, um, or it might have been a member for more, um, why Clause 4 provides for regulations to prescribe what is an in agricultural industry. Uh, this is how the Act currently works. Uh, it's not being amended. The definition states that an agricultural industry means a horticultural industry and, any, and such other industry as is prescribed. And the reason for this is that new industries will emerge over time and we do not want them to be prevented from establishing a committee to represent them because an Act amendment is required to broaden the definition. And so that would allow in the future uh, um, future uh, in, uh, industries including uh, uh, or sector, in, in sector interests in, 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 in the industry, agricultural industry and horticultural industry. Hemp, for example. Uh, truffles is another example, I think, that was referred to by the member for um, um, Warren Blackwood. Uh, insects um, uh, and lupins as examples. Um, now, uh, members have asked, um, have asked what aspects of this bill reflect recommendations made by the review uh, that, was, that was carried out in 2006. Several of the issues we have been discussing stem from the recommendations made in 2006, uh, but namely they include, of course, the inclusion of an opt-out provision and the inclusion of weighted voting. Other changes include the broadening of committee services to include educational or instructional, instructional programs, strengthening the power of the Commission to audit documents uh, and clarifying that charges collected by a person is held by that person on trust for the committee until it is paid to the Commission. Um, uh, I do have, I understand I do have, or I may be able to do this in consideration detail, and I'm glancing at my advisors who are who've been sitting patiently, uh, that there is a, a document that explains what provisions, if any, of this bill implement the recommendations made by that committee. We have that. If I need to table that, I can do so uh, perhaps during uh, consideration and detail. Um, look, this is a long history, and uh, the, member, the Minister for Agriculture explained to me the intricacies of the, the politics of Broadacre, the Broadacre issue, the long-held views of various parties, um, uh, and uh, the gestation period for the amendments to uh, uh, this Act uh, go back some, some years. I do take note of the member for Wanneroo's comments, which, you know, um, uh, uh, that um, it's actually a Labor government that's re reforming, uh, uh, continuing to reform uh, the, the provisions around um, uh, around um, uh, the Agricultural Produce Commission uh, and its endeavours, and it is, of course, uh, 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 responding to the changing uh, pressures, challenges, and nature of uh, 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 the agriculture and horticultural industries of uh, of, uh, of uh, Western Australia. I, I, um, congratulate the uh, members, uh, the Minister for Agriculture, 
uh, in the other place for once again with her tenacity in uh, bringing to this parliament finally uh, sensible, appropriate, uh, uh, consultative amendments, um, dealing with some of the issues that have uh, been f have clearly would have frustrated the previous government because they didn't bring in these, uh, uh, didn't uh, do anything in this uh, space. Um, and so, with that, um, I do urge that members support um, the, uh, the legislation that's before us uh, it, because it essentially empowers growers to come together, establish schemes for their mutual benefit, for their industries, uh, and it has already, as we know, resulted in beneficial outcomes for so many groups. And um, uh, let's not further delay this, uh, this important reform. Uh, let's get them in place uh, and let's ensure that the Commission continue to do its important work and, of course, that those committees, when formed, if formed uh, and informed by industry that they continue to do uh, the important work that they are uh, established under this um, frame this legislative framework uh, to do uh, into uh, into the future the question is that the bill be now read a second time all those in favor say aye. aye all those to the contrary say no I think the ayes have it the ayes have it a bill for an act to amend the agriculture produce Commission Act of 1988 is leave granted to proceed forthwith to the third reading Leave is not granted. We proceed to the consideration in detail stage. Y yes, Timber. Minister, petition, permission granted. If you could perhaps, Minister, introduce your yes. advisors. Yes. I have. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you, Mr. Acting Speaker, to my uh, advisers. Um, first of all, uh, Ms. Angela Howie, who is uh, the Principal Legal Officer at DPIRD, uh, to my direct right. Ms. Karen Barlow, who is ac across from me to my right. Uh, Ms. Barlow is the Principal Policy Officer of Deep Herd, and Ms Ingrid Burr, who is directly in front of me, uh, is, um, Ms Burr is the Chief Executive Officer of the Agricultural Produce Commission. So as you can see, Mr Speaker, I am very, I am surrounded by the expertise that I will require. Thank, uh, as always, to be expected. Thank you, Minister. Uh, members, we are dealing with the Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021. There are 31 clauses and no schedules. Uh, could I have an indication of where the member for Rowe would start? start? Clause 4. The question is that clauses 1 to 3 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 4. The member for Rowe. Speaker, um, and I do. I will be relatively brief today, uh, Minister. But there are just a few, a few questions that I would um, like to answer on, or like answers uh, on, in a few clauses, and um, just further on from your uh, your comments there. It's fairly ironical when we do look back um, to uh, Wednesday, the 24th of May, 2000, where the um, in relation to um, clause uh, two here, which says concerns livestock enterprises generally conducted on land under a pastoral lease. And it was just um, interesting that the um, member for uh, Murray Criddle, the Honourable MJ Criddle, moved, uh, moved that we delete all words after the word industry and substitute the following words means a horticultural industry and such other agricultural industry as may be prescribed, but excluding broad acre cropping and grazing industries. And the Honourable Kim Chance said, I'm happy to indicate that I and my colleagues will support the proposed amendment. So there we go, 15 years later, and um, uh, the, the wheel has turned again. But um, that, aside from that little history lesson, um, 
I, I just would like some clarity. I, I guess I'm worried when, when I look at this, this wording generally um, conducted on land under a pastoral lease. And we saw in the other place um, the references to um, pastoralists bringing down their cattle, for argument's sake, to a, a property um, in the ag region. And then um, another question which arose asking um, if they had two separate properties. So there was one, one instance of you uh, own a, a pastoral station, you bring cattle down and um, fatten them up for argument's sake. So um, are they excluded under these arrangements? And number two, um, what if they actually own two separate properties? That, that's the clarity that I would like. One, one property in the pastoral region and one property in the agricultural region. The Minister. So, uh, thank you. I thank the member for his uh, question. Um, now, first of all, I just want to draw your attention to uh, the um, the uh, minister's response in the other place to uh, to this particular uh, issue and. Um, um, the concern being raised as to whether an animal moved from one pastoral property to a freehold property would be captured under the scope of uh, an agricultural industry that the committee was responsible for. Um, uh, in response to those concerns, the Minister for Agriculture and Food in the other place moved a, an amendment to insert the word generally, and this was, this was uh, accepted by the Legislative Council um, in the other place. And uh, um, what that essentially does, or the, de the, the revised definition, provides that an industry can be prescribed for the purposes of that definition, other than an industry that concerns livestock enterprises generally conducted on land under a pastoral lease. So the explanation in the other place given to that, essentially you're asking about your concern about the word generally um, and, and implications of that. Um, I think her, her, uh, her explanation um, and essentially the revised definition that was um, uh, um, uh, provided um, gives, some, gives clarity to that. Now, in the other place, um, um, the Honourable uh, um, Alana McKinnon was, uh, did refer to getting down to some very fine points here, as she said, and I quote, um, and she said, I am not arguing that I, I, I'm saying that if a person is the owner of the enterprise in Dandarigan, it may well be that all the activities that they do on that property in Dandarigan are captured by this. However, she said, bear in mind that this would come about only should the industry, just, uh, industry decide that it wanted to go down this particular path. So that's the uh, considerations of, a, of the committee in that respect. Um, this is purely an enabling uh, aspect. If part of the business of an operator in Dan Darrigan was to bring their animals down, those animals might uh, in fact be captured in some way in a scheme, but if they were a pastoralist and their enterprise was in the pastoral region, the fact that they might background their cattle on another property would not bring that enterprise into the purview of the Act. So I think she's made fairly clear in her comments, and that was of course supported. Uh, that explanation and the the, um, uh, the review, if you like, of the um, of the definition was supported in the other place. Member for Speaker, uh, thank you for that explanation, Minister. I so I, I guess I'm responding here in a way on behalf of the, the PGA, who generally represent pastoralists. So it's fairly clear that you know if you bring those cattle down from the um, pastoral block and they're just feedlotting them temporarily, that's fine. Um, 
But if you physically own that property and sort of shift cattle back and forth at different times of the year, that's where I felt the Minister's explanation in the other place left a bit to be desired, where we there was a little bit of a um, lack of clarity and, and it was almost, oh, well, we'll just work it out as we go. So I guess that's the worry um, that we get pushed back later on. Um, why didn't you ask the question? Um, you know, there wasn't a real uh, a lot of clarity on that particular example because I do know there are people that have properties in both um, for sure. So uh, that that would be a concern. So I don't know whether any of the advisers have any other comments on that. Perhaps. <coughs> <clears throat> the Minister. Uh, I'm advised that uh, essentially uh, this, uh, this does and has sought to uh, um, uh, define more clarity with regard to the status of uh, produce create or produced on pastoral land. Um, and uh, the minister's comments in the other place, and the uh, uh, reworked definition aspects within this uh, amendment uh, have sought to do that. The Thanks, member minister. for Rowe. And just the um, acting speaker, just the final question would be um, who, do, who will decide and how, I guess, would be the last question in relation to this. Um, question mark over shifting from one property to another stock, etc. The minister, as highlighted in the. Uh the debate early in the second reading and uh, my, my comments. This is a producer-driven entity, essentially. So it's the producers who would um, have direct input into the how that uh, operation of the, the committee, if they decided to set one up, would operate because they would be determining what are the priorities. And some of, and the, as we know, priorities within uh, various existing committees vary. Um, uh, some focus on research, some focus on um, essentially how to uh, uh, improve the marketability of their product. So it is very much still produ you know, uh, the producers would first of all need to come together seeking to establish a committee and there's a long process and consultative process for that to happen and in doing so if at some point having s established there was issues around uh, the uh, uh, references to pa the pastoral um, the pastoral uh, uh, lease origins issue, then that would, uh, the, the legislation ensures that that is not um, imposed uh, upon uh, um, that, that group that has formed the committee. The question is that clause four stand is printed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Member for Road, do you have further clauses? The question is that clauses five to ten stand is printed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is, members, that clause 11 capital A. The question is that clauses 11 capital A. The question is that clause 11 stand is printed, which includes the clause that you're referring to. So I'll call the member for Rowe. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, just had a question uh, in relation to 11C uh, 1B, halfway down page 11 there, and it says uh, 
the poll is in favour of the proposal. Um, I'm struggling to find, I've heard a couple of references about 50%. Um, so if a poll is held um, and it says it must not allocate responsibility for the agricultural produce to an existing producers committee unless um, you know, the Commission has complied with sections 11A, etc., and conducted a poll under section 11B among the producers, and the poll is in favour of the proposal. So, um, is it just 50%, or do you have to get to 51% or 75%? Is there clarity on that? Thanks, Minister. The Minister. Not actually 50 per cent, it is in fact 60 per cent. Uh, and, Minister, can I, uh, sorry, Member, can I refer you to the uh, Agricultural Produce Committee Commission's uh, um, uh, uh, documentation regarding producers' committee establishment polls? And I can quote from that, and I'm happy, and I'll table this uh, yeah. for you on page four. Uh, it is the policy of the Commission that the Commission will not establish a committee unless a supportive vote of 60 per cent of those that respond to the poll has been achieved. So it is very clearly 60 per cent, and uh, it is the existing uh, policy position of the Commission, and that, uh, um, that will, of course, um, apply to any future committees in their establishment. And I'm happy to table. Uh, so I'm tabling, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, the uh, Agricultural Produce Commission's Pro Producers Committee Establishment Polls Policy Statement. Paper tabled. The member for roll, or any further questions? That's, that's it. The, question is that, is the question is that Clause 11 standards printed. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses 12 to 20 standards printed. All those in favour. Uh, the question is that clauses 12 to 20 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 21 stand as printed. And that is, includes the clause you're after. Member for Row. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, page 21, section uh, 21 and 1A, um, for starters where it, it says the, um, in the case of the producers committee uh, responsibility for the agricultural produce for the whole of the state, compile a list of producers of the agricultural produce in the whole of the state. Uh, my question is, what, I guess, what evidence um, do they rely on and where do they, where do they um, get the list from? That would be... Um, my first question in relation to that. Minister. For his question, look, in, in uh, uh, my, the advice I have is that um, uh, the Commission works with the body or, pro of, or producers requesting the establishment poll, so compiling the list. Um, uh, in terms of identifying the most appropriate definition of a producer, um, um, for example, wine, this was decided to be the owner of the grapes at the point of crush. For vegetables or fruit, it is the producer of horticultural produce of the particular type of which the committee is being established. In identifying those producers that meet the definition, um, this has uh, would have been done by uh, ensuring that the pre-polling consultation process includes clear information on who will be considered a producer and requesting that persons who fall within this definition contact the Commission to ensure that they are included in the polling list so that they can participate in the poll uh, or contact the Commission to advise why they should not be considered a producer should they not want to be included as a producer. Uh, requesting uh, membership information from industry associations or other established bodies to which producers might belong. For example, in the wine producers poll, the, the holders of a producer's licence with racing and gaming and liquor were identified as producers. Um, the Commission includes in the notice which advises of the conduct of the poll that a list of eligible producers is being compiled, uh, sorry, uh, complied. Uh, 
compiled. Is it compiled or incompiled? Complied. And invites producers to view the list or who may have questions with respect to the list. Um, and, and, uh, and refers them to contact the returning officer by a nominated date. Um, the, uh, um, uh, so essentially, the, there are a variety of sources, ultimately, that the list is, is sourced from uh, industry and sector, or already established industry and sector um, uh, um, entities. Um, and there's an, a process of advertising for uh, uh, input from those that may seek to be included uh, uh, within the definition of, of, the, of a producer within that particular uh, industry. Um, um, if relevant industry registration, such as with beekeepers, where beekeepers are required to be registered with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, that would also be an example of uh, a source of, from government, from a government department, essentially, uh, in the case of uh, beekeeping. The question is that Clause 21 standards printed. The member for Rowe. Um, I guess in a broad acre sense, Minister, um, when we're talking about statewide, if we talk about uh, grain growers, for argument's sake, I'm assuming that uh, the register of CBH would be one that you know the industry would would go to, um, or the commission would go to. How would they deal with? Uh, I, I understand there are certain shareholders. Uh, well, there's approximately I think 3,800 CBH shareholders, but there are shareholders who perhaps trade in different names, who may be the one producer, but actually have different trading names within the shareholder register of CBH, how would they deal with that? <clears throat> the Minister. I'm advised that it's quite a forensic experience um, and in terms of the wine industry uh, experience where that committee, as I said, took 10 years to uh, establish, uh, essentially uh, the available uh, registrations uh, and information that both government collects and indeed uh, industry sector groups collect uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, gone through until um, the, uh, there is clarity about uh, the identification of producers. Um, and uh, obviously, um, uh, that is a, is a, can, can be, in the case of the wine industry process, uh, can be a, a task that can take some time. Um, uh, and in the case of the wine industry, as you'd probably be aware, uh, uh, wine uh, production uh, and those that produce wines, uh, of course, can be registered under various um, uh, various uh, entities, um, uh, and so um, the the um, department or, or the commission essentially uh, in, uh, seeks to ensure that uh, proper and appropriate identification is made uh, before that that entity is counted, if you like, as a um, as a producer. The member for Rowe. That's section uh, A. Now, just moving on to section B, where um, the Pro Producers Committee has proposed to have responsibility for um, in relation to a particular part of the state. So, um, let's say we have, you know, the um, West Katanning uh, Barley Growers Group, um, which I might, you know, be part of, and we decide that we think there's a particular variety that's suitable. We'd like to raise some money to look at uh, that variety. How, um, what boundaries or how does, uh, how do we ascertain who that group is, I guess? How do the, um, how does the commission interact? Yeah. The minister. I, I, I have been to Catanning and I think it's a great place. I haven't been to West Catanning uh, in detail, but uh, remember, ultimately, the, the, the spirit of the this, this, uh, of the establishment of of, um, of committees is based upon direct and ongoing influence by those that are interested in establishing one, uh, and so um, 
uh, there is a framework which, uh, uh, sets, which uh, sets down the provisions for the establishment of such a committee. And in the case of West Katanning, if, they, if there were growers that were specific, obviously in the case you've given, uh, then it would be um, uh, certainly up to those growers to, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, seek and garner uh, support for such a, um, uh, an entity to be created. And of course, there's a process with regard to, uh, in the case of poll provisions, et cetera, which I've highlighted, um, for, uh, that would lead ultimately to the establishment or not of such an entity. Um, this is very much, um, uh, you know, the whole framework of this, uh, both its history and its current and the current amendments, are very much framed upon choice. Um, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, uh, and a number of members in the second reading debate highlighted that uh, as being an important uh, component to um, to uh, to uh, that. And I would wish the uh, uh, West Katanning Grain Growers Committee of the future uh, all the very best if they, that was their endeavour. I believe it was the Barley Growers uh, Association, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the question is that Clause 21 stand is printed. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 22 stand is printed. The member for Rowe. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, section 22. Two, uh, one or two A and B really on on page 22. I, I guess this is really my last area of concern. Um, weighted voting, and I, I did see in the transcript of the other place where there was a reference, um, and I, I did make it in my second reading speech about my concerns over weighted voting, where you can have um, certain producers, whatever commodity it is, um, that will actually um, take, potentially take control or potentially exert a lot of influence over um, a certain type of industry. So we had a reference there, I think, from the minister um, that, you know, if there's uh, 20 wine growers and two, two or three growers grow 80 per cent of the, the, wi the wine grapes, then Therefore, you know they'll have um, control or vote weighting to that extent. Uh, that that really does worry me. Uh, that two or three growers can have that type of influence. It's not the fault of the smaller grower that they uh, don't grow as much, but quite often they would like an equal say. And I think it's no different in any industry. There's always big players, smaller players. And as I said in my example, where um, someone said, you know, you shouldn't, you should grow 20,000 tonne of grain, or you, um, you know, shouldn't be a director. Well, that that doesn't always count because sometimes people who are smaller growers might have good things to say and good things to contribute. So I, I guess I'd like an explanation. I I believe that's a, a dangerous, a dangerous um, precedent. To set. So, just any comments from you, Minister, in um, relation to the, that section 2B? The Minister. Um, uh, um, I'm advised that member that um, the West Australian Farmers Federation was one entity that uh, supported. Um, the concept of the introduction of a, of a, of a, of a weighted voting process. Um, uh, and uh, indeed, um, I'm advised that um, um, one of the criticisms of the Act by the WA Grains Group and the PGA was that weighted voting was not available for use in polls. And uh, they, um, uh, the premise of the criticism was that uh, um, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the premise of their criticism was that larger producers in industry will tend to pay the bulk of the charge, yet it may be the smaller, more numerous producers who constitute the majority who impose the charge on the whole industry, but who pay less of the charge. They referenced that as a reason why there was a need for a consideration of a, of a waiting process. Um, um, now, 
this scenario can currently occur in theory because each producer will only have one vote in each poll. Um, however, the opportunity for weighted voting is proposed to be provided by Clause 22, which we're uh, currently considering. Um, and weighted voting specifically addresses the concern outlined in uh, in the uh, scenario. Uh, um, look, I think. Um, um, uh, um, clause 22 introduces the concept of waiting, weighted voting which can be used when the Commission is satisfied according to some criteria. The first there, that there is sufficient industry data available uh, for use, uh, to use weighted voting. And secondly, that it is in fact in the best interest of the agricultural uh, region um, to do so. Um, and now, um, there are some issues and provisos around data, co data collection or data availability in that case. So um, in uh, wait, making a decision around the, vote, wo the weighted voting aspect, um, uh, currently it's my understanding that the Commission would require five years of data, so that is a, uh, an appropriate sample of data, if you like. Um, consolidated industry production levels, so um, uh, another co important consideration. Um, individual pr production levels of e each producer, um, and essentially consolidated data which would need to be industry verified or, or accepted verified data. So I think I understand where you can come in, come and vote. Waiting is a very interesting issue for many of us <laughs> in, uh, in this place and, and in other places. And I, I noted you. I noted you. Were, uh, you were alluded to a number of things during question time. But can I just say, I think um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the weighted voting option has been weighed up very carefully, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I uh, obviously uh, support uh, this um, this uh, uh, clause as has been proposed, um, uh, and uh, and uh, believe it should be supported. The question is that Clause 22 uh, stand as printed, the member for Rowe. Thanks, uh, thanks, Minister. I appreciate the explanation and I guess um, I just would comment that obviously, as you quoted, different people have different feelings on these things uh, in a variety of, of sections. My, I'm certainly focused on the um, producer groups and the like and I, I always find it, um, I think it's important to have a wide representation of the, the smaller grower the large grower, no dis different to the, um, you know, the voter in the mining and pastoral versus the voter in the north metropolitan area. So we, we need a, a wide range of people. But I, I believe um, that that's a really important perspective that, that um, the Ag Produce Commission needs to be careful on, I guess. So that, that's where I just wanted to make my comments noted, but otherwise um, appreciate your time, appreciate um, the advisor's time today. Thanks very much. The question is that clause 22 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses 23 to 31 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that this be the long title of the bill. All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes consideration in detail. Uh, acting Speaker. The Minister. Uh, uh, I seek leave to progress to the third reading of the bill. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Uh, I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those in favour say aye. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I, will oh, call, I will call the member for row. Uh, thank, thank you, um, Speaker.
Uh, if I could just make a very few brief comments, uh, Minister, and um, appreciate your answers there and consideration in detail. Um, I think I just wanted to point out a couple of things, I think, from the contributions we've had. Um, and I appreciate the contributions from uh, some of our regional members and also our peri-urban uh, members. I think your electorate was described as minister. Uh, I, I think probably the member for Geraldton is perhaps the only member really that is representing the broad acre industry to some extent. And I think that's where you, you, you saw the contributions of the member for Moore and myself that are uh, um, genuinely involved in the broad acre cropping and livestock industry. And we, we understand some of the heat uh, that, that comes on uh, as a result of a bill like this. I, I, I do believe the Ag Produce Commission in general terms is a, a good thing and it's great especially for those smaller type industries. Um, but it was interesting to me that generally during those contributions I didn't hear too much about the, uh, the levies or, uh, or the levies that, that Broadacre uh, people who either produce crops or livestock actually pay. And as I said in my second reading, um, can be up to 12 or 13 per cent of your gross income. So um, the, the, the concern in people's minds in the background, they listen to the Country Hour, they listen to these radio programs, people coming in with comments that may not always necessarily be true but um, sometimes scare tactics as well, and that's what uh, worries them. So they, they, just, they are concerned uh, that they will have uh, another levy slapped on them that they may not necessarily uh, receive any benefit from. So that, that's where that's coming from, and we just wanted to make sure that we put that on the record uh, on behalf of our broadacre producers. Um, as, as I've said previously, there, there have been concerns. I think largely they've been addressed now in the pastoral section. And I, um, my only concern now is the opt-out provisions or the opt-out regulations. And I, I, I believe in, um, in the other place that there was concerns over this raised from several angles. And the, con the concern is that We've got regulations somewhere in the distance that may or may not be produced and we don't know what they are while we're trying to uh, talk about the legislation. So that, that was the reasoning behind uh, Col de Grusser, the Honourable Colin de Grusser moving that amendment uh, because we would, we would have preferred the clarity and, and the WA Farmers Federation, um, despite quotes that have been thrown around here in the chamber, the WA Farmers Federation and several of the um, representations from there uh, have been that they would have preferred that in the legislation rather than in regulation. So uh, I don't think I need to go on too much longer, Minister. My concerns on the weighted voting, as you know, um, it's, it's really one of those where I think you do need a broad range of people from within an industry to actually represent uh, their thoughts on what's going on. So um, thanks for the clarity on the 60 per cent. I think that's important to have more, more than just the 50 per cent for sure. So um, otherwise, I think, uh, as, as you've said, and many of the speakers have said, this has been going on for a long time. So. Uh, I'm sure the Ag Produce Commission will get on with their work and do, do a good job, especially uh, in relation to those smaller industries. Um, just a final one from me, of course, talking about levies, and the member for Moore mentioned it, biosecurity levies are another one that seem to get uh, plonked into certain regions around the state. We can't quite understand why one area has it, another area doesn't. Um, the minister seems to come in there and, and um, prescribe the, the scenario in a certain area. I know it's sometimes a biosecurity group wants that levy there uh, and, and they use it um, for pest and weed control and the like, but quite often it's done without as much 
consultation as, as we would like. So as with everything, uh, community consultation, uh, grower consultation, really important. Uh, I think the in the Ag Produce Commission scenario, uh, the ability to actually consult and poll um, the producers is much better than some of these things like our biosecurity um, regions and the like. So um, thanks for your time, Minister. The Minister. Can I thank the member for more and other members who spoke during the debate of this bill. Congratulate the Minister for Agriculture in the passing of this bill from yeah. both houses. Can also thank again the advisers that assisted me, Angela Howie, Karen Barlow and Ingrid Burr. And uh, I'm very pleased that that bill has been passed from both houses of parliament. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Agriculture Produce Commission Act 1988. Members, I have received a message from the Honourable Kim Beasley, AC Governor of Western Australia. The message reads, The Governor has the honour to inform the Legislative Assembly of Western Australia that he has this day assented in the name and on behalf of the Queen to a bill for the undermentioned Act, Metropolitan Region Scheme Belia Wetlands Act 2021, number 8 of 2021, signed the Governor. The Leader of the House. Uh, I move that the House to now adjourn. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.